that they are, they said, this, this doesn't make any difference. What are you talking about? <laughs> who, who will speak first? And I think when you have something to say, your ego never gets in the way. Dr. Clark will be our first speaker. And Dr. Clark will be presenting uh, an aspect of the Garvey movement that <clears throat> I think is very significant and generally overlooked. Dr. Carl Clark will be addressing Marcus Garvey and the process of state formation. Marcus Garvey and the process of state formation. After Dr. Clark speaks, Dr. Ben will be presenting to us philosophical concepts of Garvey and his African nationalism. And Dr. Ben would like to emphasize his, the word his, in that topic. So Dr. Clark will speak first then Dr. Ben, and we will have a question and answer period after uh, the two brothers have spoke. So without any further ado, I'd like to bring to your attention Dr. John Hendrick Clark. Thank you very much. This is my third visit to Hostra. I'm very pleased to be here again. And I'm pleased to greet some of the same students again, and pleased that Dean Smith saw fit to invite me, and pleased that the president, with all the many things the president have to do, have taken time out to attend the lectures. Now, I'm talking about Marcus Garvey and the concept of state formation. I will begin by seemingly talking away from the subject. But I will be on the subject all of the time. And I will waste no time with trivia because the subject is bigger than the time allotted for it. What do we mean by state formation? There are some missing pieces in the history of African people that keep being missing because we do not look beyond what Professor Van Sertema calls the slavery curtain and the 500 year room when our history was locked into a room marked slavery and we did not move it beyond that room or look at it before that room we did not consider the fact that for most of the time African people have been on the earth, they have been free people determining their own destiny and they have not been slaves. In the period of slavery for the Africans was short in comparison to other periods of slavery in the world. In fact, Europeans enslaved other Europeans for a longer period. <clears throat> to talk about state formation in the restoration of state formation, we must speak at least briefly of independent states in Africa before the slave trade and how these independent states were lost. And with the loss of these independent states, the beginning of the slave trade in the 15th and the 16th century, the African was programmed into thinking that he had never ruled a state. And they were systematically read out of the respectful commentary of history. And so many times when the African, when the African away from home mentions slavery, the assumption is that is, is his total experience in history because no one dares to look and see what happened before slavery. No one dares to say that slavery is an evil that has touched every people on the face of the earth sometime or the other, some way or the other. While the slavery that happened to Africans is the most documented and the most remembered 
It might have been the most severe. It is not the only. Now, let us look at the certain basic things that happened in Africa before slavery. Now, with the decline of the 25th dynasty, the last of the dynasties that came out of southern Africa, the Kushite dynasty, often called the Ethiopian dynasty, sometimes called the Nubian dynasty, with the decline of this dynasty, you can stop counting great dynasties. Because from then on, the foreigners, the invaders, the bastardized children of bastards began to rule the Nile Valley. This ultimately led to other invasions. The Assyrians, 16666, then the Iranians again, then called Persians, 550. So brutal that the Africans cried out, Oh God, if you cannot send me a liberator, at least send me a conqueror that will show some mercy. So when a young Macedonian, known in history as Alexander the Great, knocked at the door, he didn't have to knock very hard. The African weary of brutal invaders was not harsh on Alexander who partly tried to keep the promise. He was an invader like all invader, a raper. He raped the granary of Africa to feed his soldiers because Africa was a, this part of Africa was a great agricultural country at the time. Now this fauna was followed by a more brutal form of European, the Romans. And when the Romans stopped killing Christians and tried to become Christians, their mismanagement of this church and the dissatisfied dissatisfaction around it opened the door for the rise of Islam. The rise of Islam, Arab armies and African armies pushed the European back into Europe where they went into the Middle Ages while the, the Africans, Arabs and Berbers took over Spain and the Mediterranean. After the Crusades, Europe discovered that it was still hungry, still had lost one third of its population, still <coughs> was looking for roots to the east, something they could, spices, something they could put on that gosh darn off of European food so they could eat it. <laughs> Europe was in a bad way. They lost all sentimental attachment to themselves and to other people. They learned again maritime skill, mostly taken from China, translated by the Africans, Arabs, and Berbers at the University of Salamanca in Spain. They began to learn map making again and charting again. And to learn the coast of Africa, they discovered something called the Captain Atlas and a couch of maps made by Jewish gold dealers who had been going into Africa dealing in gold in the western Sudan. These are the maps that fell into the hands of Henry, Prince Henry, called Henry the Navigator. Now, with Europe on the rise again, back at sea again, they wasn't looking for Africa at all. They were looking for a route to the east. Africa appeared en route and proved to be more beneficial to them. Now to justify slavery, they had to pretend that they were enslaving a people who had no history and who had no culture. 
And they forgot that there was another cluster of nations in inner Africa called the Western Sudan, nation that did not touch the sea, that had brought into being for over a thousand years nation states. I'm not talking about grass huts and mud huts. I'm talking about nation states with ambassadors, with roads, with schools. In the last state, Sangay, a great university, St. Kori, a great scholar exiled by the Moroccans. This state was literally destroyed by an invasion from Morocco, Muslim against Muslim, using European mercenaries. Now after this invasion and the wreck and ruin in the western Sudan, the slave trade could spread inland. Because it is difficult to enslave a historical people, the rationale now is that these people had no history and no culture. And they forgot that Africans were in charge and for many years of the two major universities of the world, Salamanca in Spain, Senkori at Timbuktu. Europe now had to forget the first African-European connection, the Roman grecian period. Now you can charge the Romans and the Greeks with many things, but generally they did not have color prejudice. They were snobs and they had a whole lot of things, but, and they had preferences, but there's a whole lot of difference between that and prejudice based solely on color. Now my point is, how did we lose the nation state? We began to lose the nation state when foreigners began to invade with weapons that we had never seen before, weapons that lacked humanity that we had never even entertained using before and would not have used if we had them. Anytime you want to find out the weakest thing of a people about a people, look at the flip side of the weakest thing about a people and you'll find potentially the strongest thing about a people. There was something in African humanity. It did not lean to the total destruction of other people similar to the Europe without sentiment of that day. Now, the traffic was not heavy between the beginning of the trade in the 1430s, 1438 to be exact, and 1492. You can't start a trade until you've got something for people to do. But the beginning of the trade the opening up of the so-called New World, Africans began to be brought to South America in the Caribbean islands. The focal point here is the Caribbean islands. In the peopling of the Caribbean islands by Africans after the destruction of the Indians would create small island nations under different colonial domination. Now to understand the background for Marcus Garvey in the, in the beginning of his concept of state formation, you got to look at Jamaica. You got to look at Jamaica's struggle against slavery and the fact that Jamaica fought harder than Haiti and did not achieve independence principally because they were destabilized in between battles. Haiti fought over a 20 year period and they could take impetus from one revolt to start another revolt. And another incident, uh, an item left out of history, is that Bookman, the Yoruba priest who solidified and organized the revolt in Haiti, was originally from Jamaica. When you look at the relationship of Jamaica in Haiti, in the transformation of the system of slave revolts, here two nations, two island nations, where the people remembering that they had not always been slaves, 
<coughs> making an attempt to regain the concept of the nation state. When the British came, they wanted help from the slaves against the Spaniards. Some went to the hills and said, I don't want either one of you. These runaways were called Maroons. Marcus Garvey was a descendant of the Maroons. Now the Maroons are a special kind of Jamaicans. They're black and proud. And some of them were exceptionally skillful. Marcus Garvey was a master printer. So therefore he was also a reader. He was revolutionary from the beginning with revolutionary ideas calling the first printer strike in Jamaica, visiting South America and Central America and causing trouble wherever he had went, organizing Caribbean workers in the Panama Canal area. So Marcus Garvey had a sense of the state and what had, he had to do to regain it early in life. Now he would go to England. He would read. He would hook up with Duz Muhammad Ali, a Sudanesian, an Egyptian of Sudanesian descent, in a newspaper called the African Times and Orient Review. He would read an editorial quoting, of all things, a black, a white black nationalist named Booth, who had gone through parts of East and Southeast Africa because he was dissatisfied with the missionaries. He began to preach against them all. And he began to tell the Africans that the white man cannot be trusted. And when the African finally said, that, well, you are white, can you be trusted? To his everlasting credit, he said, no. <laughs> Booth raised the, the first one to raise the choir, Africa for the Africans. Marcus Garvey read the editorial in Duz Muhammad Ali's paper and added Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. Marcus Garvey never took anything from a second raider. He read fast and he learned fast. Now he's in London at the time of the race conference. There's a world conference on race. He's got that literature to read. The great activist from Ghana, Kaisley Hayford, John Mensah Sabah, now publishing their books. First in London, then secondly in Africa. He's got that literature to read. So he's absorbing the literature of the state in the first version of a, of a book that was going to be published, an extensive version in, in 1929 toward nationhood in West Africa. He would read. He's absorbing the concept of the state and the idea of regaining the state. Now he would go back to Jamaica. And he would try to start the Universal African Improvement Association, Universal Negro Improvement Association. Why didn't he succeed in Jamaica? He didn't succeed in Jamaica then, and he wouldn't succeed in Jamaica now. The mentality was not there. Why didn't the Jamaicans buy the concept of the restoration of a state because they thought they already belonged to a state, the British Empire. And so his call for a state in Jamaica, his call for the return to Africa in Jamaica did not fall on listening ears. He heard about a man named Booker T. Washington and he wrote him. And Booker T. Washington invited him to the United States. He couldn't get the money ready by 1915, but when he arrived in 1916, Booker T. Washington was dead. Now, 
He would tour the United States in 1917. The riots beginning to start. 1919, the Red Summer. In East St. Louis, they made bonfires and burned black babies to death. Now, after the riot in Chicago, where Marcus Garvey would rally blacks to fight back, he could now say to them, let's get out of here. Let's get our own ships and sail back to Africa. Why did black America listen to the concept of the nation state and others did not listen? It had nothing to do with anybody having a better brain than the other. We were both under, under different oppressors. One oppressor gave you the illusion that you had a state. But the American oppressor did not even give us the illusion that we had one, ever would have one, or would be capable of having one, ruling one, if we did have one. Europe dumped its human garbage can into the Western world. The worst of that garbage can was dumped into the United States. No illusions. The British oppressor was not less of an oppressor. He was a more mature oppressor. He had style. <laughs> it's procedure. He would not cut your throat with a dirty knife, not because he cared anything about you or your throat, but it was poor style. <laughs> he liked form. It must be in good form, in good order. He was a mature oppressor. And you had a growing amateur oppressor in the United States, rather crude in comparison. So now, because Marcus Garvey had gotten across in this country something he couldn't get across in Jamaica, the American dream wasn't dreamed for you, the American promise wasn't made to you. I will dream for you a new dream make a new promise and lead you to a new land. The next year, he would call an international conference of African people, 30,000 people a day, and they turned away 30,000. Old Madison Square Garden. There have been two Madison Square Gardens since then. Now, he would propagate the concept not only of a nation state, but of Africa's return to a nation state. He would begin to prepare the mind to think of a time in the world, in your history, when you ruled a state all by yourself, collected all the taxes, headed the army, did everything the nation state need to do received ambassadors, sent ambassadors. It would also remind us that in collective unity, we were a very powerful people in the world we had been before and would be again. In spite of all of the forces arrayed against him, propaganda and otherwise, in spite of the fact that a good percentage of the people in his office was on the FBI payroll, the triumph of his movement was one of the great miracles, one of the great organizational miracles in the history of the United States. He now began to touch a people that had never been touched. He didn't have to steal them from the big church because it wasn't in the big church. He didn't have to steal them from the big organization. They were not in the big organization. He spoke a language that filtered down to the common man and woman, to the ordinary workaday man and woman. The membership in the Garvey movement rather reasonable, like 50 cents a week and 10 cents uh, burial. 
benefit for burial insurance. That's rather reasonable for that day. Well, considering the fact that people were making 10, 15, 20 dollars a week, it was still reasonable. Then he projected a dream that made people feel whole again. Imagine a black elevator operator, elevator starter, downtown New York. He was a hey George, call him everything. He was hey George down there, but in the evening, with garbage pair military organization, he was a major and a general, controlling his troops for an empire still to come. Our mind in America was so depressed, we, more than any other African people in the world, needed a Marcus Garvey. We needed him to save us from believing that we were not going to make it as a people for saving our sanity. Now, he began the collecting of funds for the ships the Black Star Line. This will lead to difficulty later, but the main thing is that the Black Star Line was part of the concept of nation. He discovered that the shipping lines were so costly and even transferring goods and services between African nations and African nations. He dreamed of a steamship line where Africans could connect with each other and trade with each other on terms. He prophesied the modern age. Now let's look at what could have happened just briefly. While we naively answer to the term minority, we were never a minority. We are ruled over by a numerical minority and don't even know it. Now if you count all the African people in the United States, 30 million or more, in the West Indies, those in South America, especially Brazil, that has 80 million. You got about 250, 200 million in the Western world. All the African people in the Pacific, Two Pacific nations at the United Nations right now. African nations in the Pacific with a slight Polynesian admixture like the Australian Aborigine. People in other areas of the Pacific. A man came to our conference in Egypt this summer. He was a Dravidian. He represents 10 million people of African descent. Now, he, he, he wants to hook up again with African people. There's a new book called Delhi, dealing with the black untouchables of India, said so there's upward of 100 million people of African descent in India. I know you met some brown races, but be that as it may, a whole lot of Indians are of African descent. Now these Indians of African descent want a connection with the rest of Africa. Now we and the Chinese might be the only people on the face of the earth who can count a billion people as part of our group. Or right, you want an economic system? Make shirts for a billion people. Make shoes for a billion people. Make cars for a billion people. Have the ships to transfer goods and services for a billion people. This is part of Marcus Garvey's dream. Nationness. And if you're going to have a nation, then you have to do everything people have to do in order to maintain a nation. His Liberia scheme consisted of sending men ahead of time who could 
manage brickyards, build bridges, lay railroads. He was thinking about the structure and the concept of nation. No one in the Western world, least of all the imperial powers, and America is an imperial power, wanted African people to emerge again in the world as the rulers of nations. You can bargain then. This is why all Africa is fragmented. This is no accident. Mostly fragmented by Western educated Africans. We have to think this over again. He kept telling us that the best education that we must have for nation would have to come from, from ourselves. He understood then what we do not understand now. Powerful people never educate powerless people in how to take that power away from them. Right. Education has but one honorable purpose. <laughs> one honorable purpose alone. Everything else is a waste of time. That is to train the student to be a responsible handler of power. Now, Marcus Garvey's venture with the ships led eventually to his arrest and imprisonment. And from his imprisonment, deported back to Jamaica. You might think the story ends right there. But during the Italian-Ethiopian War, a lot of Marcus Garvey's prophecy came to pass. He said, now look, see what happens? If you don't prepare yourself, any thug and his brother can come in and knock over your country, rape your women, kill off your educators. And he was hard on Haida Selassie for leaving Ethiopia. He kept reminding them then and had you managed this state differently, had you made a hookup with other African people in the world instead of trying to prove that you are Hamite or Semite, <laughs> you'd have you got more help. Italians from the United States had no problem in going back and fighting for Mussolini. Why do we have so much problem going back and fighting for Ethiopia? They wouldn't have permitted us to do it in any case. Because they did not want us to relate to the concept of nation state. Marcus Garvey was the inspiration for the basis of the African independence explosion. He was the stimulation behind Nkrumah, especially Nkrumah, the first Pan-Africanist president, Namdi Izigwik, Nigeria, John Stone Kenyatta, before he started calling himself Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, Marcus Garvey's inspiration to them from London where he had lived for a number of years helped to stimulate the concept of African freedom. And most of them, when they were willing to admit it, admitted that Marcus Garvey was the basic stimulation in their thrust for independence in Africa, in the restoration again of the independent state. Now the story is bigger than that. I have not dealt, dwelt with Garvey's second Jamaican years. <coughs> we went back to Jamaica. Once more the Jamaicans would not listen because Jamaica is the most stratified island, nation in the world along color and class lines. Still is. If Marcus Garvey were alive today, walking through the streets of Jamaica, some misguided Jamaican might stone him to death. There is no Garveyism in the Caribbean today. Very little Garveyism in the United States among black Americans today. 
Because if you think Garveyism, you don't think integration. Because if you you if you want to integrate in somebody else's house, if you think Garveyism, you want to build your own house. And that factor is missing. All right. How then, in conclusion, how then do we use Garveyism at the end of the 19th? as we face the 21st century. We use Garveyism to unify the African world across all religious and political lines and to bring to ourselves once more the stability of the nation state. Of course, all of us in the United States are not going back to Africa. Go psychologically if you can't go physically. But if there's one place in the world Africa can turn to and say, send me 10,000 nurses, it's the United States. Probably couldn't send 10,000 doctors, probably couldn't even afford that many, but we could manage 5,000. Because in the United States, you've got the best technical trained Africans in the world. Now, they are confused with that technical training. I'm not saying they're committed to Africa with it. <laughs> Kids study engineering, he'd rather go work for IBM or AT&T than to go to Africa. So long as you've got that kind of hang up, you're missing the point that I'm trying to get across. But I'm saying that with basic skills and road building and communication, building in general, managing school systems, managing hotels, the African in the United States might be the key or the lock to the Africa of the future. But if you think this is a betrayal of the United States and you're missing the point again, because there's nothing that you betray that the country didn't say it stands for. Not that it lives up to what it stands for, but it says it stands for. Then you have to do some reading in history I don't believe there's a capitalist solution to Africa's problems. I don't think there's a communist solution either. I don't think there's any solution that you do not control and control well in Africa's behalf. I think the individualism of the Western black might have spoiled most of them for service in Africa. Africa had a collective society not based on the needs of the individual, but based on the needs of the whole group. In many times, Africa had a classless society and a sharing society, not only before Karl Marx, but before the existence of Europe. An African king, Pharaoh, Akhenaten, preached the same concept from a throne 1,300 years before Christ. So if you want socialism, you can get some at home. <laughs> you don't have to go across and get it from Carl something or another. But if Carl something or another got anything that you can use for your benefit, use it. But don't forget to bend it to your benefit. Everything, every religion, every social organization has become an instrument of liberation or it must become nothing or you must discard it. You have to travel fast and with some light luggage. <laughs> and you can't have any excess baggage holding back this, uh, this matter. I think every true African, every true liberating person, every true person committed 
to the liberation and the unification of all African people have been saying one way or the other what Marcus Garvey said through his life and said repeatedly, up, up, you mighty raise, you can accomplish what you will. Before I introduce our next speaker, I'll provide one more opportunity if several people want to just come up in front and sit down on the floor, you can feel free to do that. I want to thank Dr. Clark very much for his very eloquent statements and as I said, at the conclusion we will provide time for questions and answers. As I earlier stated, Dr. Ben will be addressing philosophical aspects of Garvey and his African nationalism. Dr. Yosef Binyaki. that I can use your bulletin uh, to commence my presentation. It's quite appropriate for that. It says at the bottom of the front cover, history is the landmark by which we are directed into the true course of life. The history of a movement the history of a nation, the history of a race, is the guidepost of the movement's destiny. That nation's destiny, that race's destiny, what you do today that is worthwhile inspires others to act at some future time. Marcus Garvey. The statements of Garvey, though profound, in most universities, and particularly in his major writings, the most knowledgeable of them all being the compilation by his second wife, Amy Jacques Garvey. His first wife was Amy Ashwood Garvey. It seems that uh, Garvey like the Amy girls. <laughs> <laughs> but Garvey has been overlooked for a number of reasons. Were he not an African, his books, and particular the first book of the two volume work on Garvey would have been considered a masterpiece of philosophy. When examining Garvey's work as a young man, it was necessary for me to go through a number of papers. Many of you do not know probably that Garvey was a poet he wrote a number of short stories. Well, he was a literary great. But in his writings, Garvey mentioned something dealing with the, his philosophy and education. And for you here at the university, that makes it so important. One of the things in his philosophy of education, Garvey said, what is an education? He said, it's not always what you take in. Very often, it's what you got to put out. I think most of us, most of us, and I know 
that I uh, myself included at least one time, and probably there is some more house cleaning. I had to get rid of a lot of things that I had learned prior to reading Garvey and others. But when I look at the example of materials, when a cache of writings and different collections belonging to Garvey was uncovered some years ago, I got an opportunity to browse through some of them and notice that Garvey was an avid reader of his ancient history. For that reason, Garvey took sentimentally and attached philosophically what is known as the tricolors of Africa. Today, others are calling it the liberation color. Garvey never had anything called liberation color. He called it the tricolors of Africa. The red, the white, and the, I mean the red, black, and the green. You can go to Africa and particularly to Egypt and find in the temples those tricolor arranged in the same manner, red, black, and green in that order, and see where he adopted uh, his colors or symbols for his movement. Using Edward Burrell Ford, Garvey found it necessary to have an anthem, not the United States anthem, not the British anthem, but the African people's anthem, Ethiopia, land of our fathers, land where the gods love to be. Garvey found it more necessary also, he was a devout Christian, but he realized that none of the Christian denominations within the United States or Great Britain or France or any other, other European colonial powers was sufficient to meet the needs of the African people. Thus Garvey created within his organization the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which he changed quickly to the African Orthodox Church and set up an ex-Baptist minister, Terrell, to head that religion. Garvey knew it knowing that Christianity by itself, as many people would have said, was a European religion and people who say that do not know Christianity because Christianity, Garvey stated and knew, came out of Alexandria, Egypt with, from Pantheus and Bortius. That Christianity had been in uh, the continent of Africa, namely the nation of Tameri or Kemet, which the Greeks call Egypticus and the British call Egypt. Of course, the Hebrews called it Mizraim and the present Arab conquerors call it Mizraim and there are a number of other names. But Garvey knew that that religion, Christianity there, and of course it got its name Christianity from 212 of the common era at a place called Antioch. When the people start using the Greek word, the words Joshua Christus and C-R-Y-S-T-O-S which means to anoint. Joshua the anointed. Up until that conference, he was called the leader. That's all. Of course, Garvey, in reading about this, made notations that Christianity was nothing but a carryover of the worship of Heru, or Horus, the, the son of Aset and Asaru. Aset is commonly called by the Greeks Isis, as a rule equally by the Greeks Osiris. Garvey knew, and in his notation, he knew for some reason, although he had never been on the physical continent of Africa, that at the various temples primarily, because he noted them, the temple of Setaiwan 
at Abydos, and may I remind you, the temple of Setaiwan at Abydos was before anybody named Moses was born in Egypt according to the Torah. They again, Garvey knew that at Dendera, the temple of goddess Het Heru, which the Greeks called Hathor, there was a story and still is for anyone who wants to go and see it of the immaculate conception of Aset and the virgin birth of a child. Thus it is that Garvey established and re-established what was being worshipped in Ethiopia, the black Madonna and child, which was also worshipped in Europe, all over Europe, exclusively until Michelangelo in 1509 painted for, Ju painted for Pope Julius II the first white Madonna and child, Mary and Joseph. Of course, Garvey knew there was 16 such black and Madonna and child, Jesus being the last of the 16. Garvey understood the concept of the fundamental principle of a religion its moral laws and you uphold them and taught them to his followers of his movement the Universal Negro Association and African Communities League Garvey reminded his people his followers and they had to be African that it was impossible to live without a moral code and when others ask about adopting the Ten Commandments, Garvey said, no, he was not going to adopt any second-hand set of laws. Garvey knew that the Ten Commandments was a joke. That there was no Moses that gave to the world any Ten Commandments because we don't have Moses until the 18th dynasty and that Moses wasn't born before 1346 of before the common era and Garvey spoke of what was known as the 42 admonitions of Ma'at or commonly called the 42 negative confessions which we can find in the book of the coming forth by day which Budge the Englishman changed to book of the dead and if you want, you can find them in the Osirian drama of the Book of the Dead, the 42 laws, such as Hail Ma'at, I have not killed man nor woman. Hail Ma'at, I have not stolen. Hail Ma'at, I have not coveted another man's wife. Now, in the, in the Jewish folklore, that's a tribute to a man who just came yesterday. Right. And whereas in this book it is 4100 BC or 3000 years before Moses. And Garvey knew that if Moses was in fact a reality, that Moses is said to have been born in Africa at a place called Goshen in a state called Egypt. And the last time I saw Egypt to back Garvey was three weeks ago. And it's in Africa. <laughs> So the fundamental things about it, Garvey knew that he could move his people because his people was quite capable. He knew Garvey had in his collection a book in which dealt with the papyrus of Hunefer, H-U-N-E-F-E-R. In the papyrus of Hunefer states, quote, we came from the beginning of the Nile where God happy dwell at the foothill of the mountain of the moon unquote that is a paper of an egyptian writing kunefa the high priest where they came from the egyptians and by the way there is no greece yet there is no rome yet there is no israel yet there is no abraham yet there is no allah no muhammad ibn abdullah Yet, no Confucius, when whoever is writing this. These are a group of Africans in the world that is writing that. I mean, uh, Homer is not born yet, the first literary 
European. And Homer is not until 8.33. Homer is to write. You see, that's one thing about Garvey. And he had another man with him by the name of H. Hubert Harrison, who was his historian, who could bring him up to date, that reminded him that the first literary work in all of Europe was Homer, Iliad, and the Odyssey, which state in the Odyssey, Homer speaking about the Ethiopians. He said what? Even the god Zeus and Apollo, the first gods of Europe, came from Ethiopia. So Garvey knew and read these things. Upon these things and others, he was to base his philosophy. More so, Garvey knew that the African was a technical African. It is equivalent to these days, he would be a multi-genius equivalent to one of them by the name of I.M. Hotep or combined in Hotep. In Hotep was the man that designed the step pyramid of Saqqara out of solid stone, no brick made of any material, much less more, uh, 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 mud and straw. The step pyramid of Saqqara is in the third dynasty. Inhotep designed it and built it for the pharaoh Zuza, whom Herodotus later come and call Zuza. May I remind you that Abraham, the first of the Jews, wasn't born. You can't build a pyramid when you're not born. <laughs> and of the 72 pyramids in Egypt, all was born before Abraham, all was built before Abraham was born at the 13th dynasty in the city or outside of the city of Ur in Chaldea, which later became an Egyptian Ethiopian colony by the name of Elam. You see, these are some of the things that we need in our classrooms. Uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who started this with one week and got fired by a black college president at Howard University by the name of Mordecai Johnson. Poor Mordecai. Uh, well, we can't blame the poor, poor fellow. He had no knowledge of himself. Uh, Carter G, the pro community protests make him rehired Carter G, and then he taught his first course in African study, but he was not allowed to include it in the curriculum in a black university. There are other things, but we don't have time for that today. But Garvey, looking at all of these things, looking at medicine, and we were told that Hippocrates is the father of medicine. No. Well, that's not difficult because Benny Goodman is the king of swing. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, Garvey had looked at the number of medical writings or a medical papyri. Notably, let's take one of them right in the Brooklyn Museum. The Edward C. Smith Medical Papyrus for Surgery. And that's 1770 before the Common Era. Hippocrates wasn't born until 333. So this papyrus, this medical writing treatise is 1400 years before the father of medicine. Garvey looking at these things, citing them, and writing individually in the world, in the, the Negro world. He would write a column on all kinds of different things. On economics, law, medicine, cited all of these things as he continued. You see, we only know Garvey for back to Africa slogan. But we don't know the literary critic, the literary man Garvey. And that's the one we need to <coughs> deal with a little. Garvey examining this, dealt with medical writings like the Evers Papyrus, a papyrus that deals with, during the time of Queen Hatshepsut, the first woman who acted as both king and queen. The first woman that in, 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 uh, 
I think that uh, if she was around, AIDS wouldn't have been too popular among because she developed a suppository to, to insert it to the vagina to stop pregnancy in 1555 before the common era. With all this knowledge then, and added to that the knowledge of Thutmosis III, the son of the same Hatshepsut, who completed the expulsion of the first non-African people to have come into to, to Egypt. With all that knowledge, Garvey then turned to examine, not to, to establish not only the philosophical basis for his organization, but an economic concept that a man who amassed a fortune of more than $50,000, and you got to imagine the time in which he's speaking, in the 1920s, should not be add to that money, but should work from then on, and the, his, the, the money he make should go for the benefit of the, his people, that the $50,000 should be an invest, uh, 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 um, uh, a maximum he can hold in any bank account. So in order that others would eat, so he called it, he called it civilized capitalism. Uh, capitalism not in the sense of what another African by the name of Alexander Hamilton had instituted in this country. Oh, by the way, I know a lot of people got frightened when I said that, so I better stop a minute to clarify that. I'm talking about a fellow that Burr killed, and American history lied and said it was for politics. It was over that blue-eyed girl in Philadelphia. You see, uh, 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 Byrd know, knew that Hamilton was from Nevis, and he knew that Hamilton's father was an Englishman, and his mother was an African, and that he was raised up in St. Croix, in what is now the United States Virgin Islands, at the time of the Danish Virgin Islands, where such children were sent to be raised, because the fathers couldn't have them with their European wives. Of course, there were many fathers with African wives at those times, uh, since uh, uh, rape didn't start with black people doing it. Uh, I mean, the, the, the slave didn't raise, rape, rape the master's wife. Somebody got raped, but it wasn't the master's wife. Uh, uh, Agave knew that too. So, that's more than anybody else. He saw it constantly in Jamaica. Garvey running down, as these are stuff, it, God, it moved Garvey to ask the question when he wrote the, uh, his poem, Wake up, ye mighty race. Garvey again speaking said in his philosophical concept that the African must have one God. He must have one aim and he must have one destiny. After that, he brought forward the catchwords, the motto, by block. Garvey said that these things to many would sound as if it is racism. He said, but in these United States and in the 12 colonial powers of Europe, he was speaking specifically of those who had gone and established their control over the world in what was then called the Berlin Conference, a conference called by Otto von Bismarck and Wilhelm the Kaiser. In 1884, which discussed, adjudicated, and came up with a conference, the conclusion called the Berlin uh, Convention and Conference and Document of which the United States of America participated fully. The representative of the United States of America was Edwin H. Terrell, carrying the title <coughs> Minister Plenipotentiary and Ambassador Extraordinary. The subsequent conference to that was called the Brussels Conference. That is the conference that followed the, the Berlin Conference where Leopold was given the richest part of Africa as his personal estate, backed by the United States government, its Senate, and its uh, Congress, and of course, the Ulysses S. Grant, its president. You may find these documents in a, two, a 
three volume works called A Map of Africa by Treaty, as edited by the royal historian of uh, Queen Victoria, Sir, Frank, Sir, Sir Edward H. Hertzler. So that when they tell you in school that the United States had nothing to do with the, part, uh, the partition of Africa, somebody's lying. This is too well documented, and you could read the congressional records, and you will find to the contrary. At the Brussels conference, which was called later, after the European powers, England and others tried to rob from Leopold after the found had given him the richest part, the Brussels conference uh, brought was represent United States was represented by uh, Cassin. Uh, I forget at this moment Cassin's first name but with the same title as Edward, uh, Edwin Terrell. All of these matters Garvey had to, in which he to, to use to come up with his various uh, hypotheses and subsequent philosophy. In the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Messiah Garvey, the first book of the two volume book edited by his wife, the first, the first wife, the second wife, Amy Jacques Garvey, Garvey wrote extensively on all concept, all detail. The reason Garvey said it was necessary to have a paramilitary organization in the United States. He felt that it was impossible for a nation of people and Garvey saw the African in the United States, the Africans anywhere in Europe as a nation within a nation. Garvey said it was impossible to ingrate, integrate a slave with a master. And Garvey said whenever the slave accepts that he's the master, solely because the master have relieved him by removing the shackles of slavery, and that the slave did not force the master to remove the shackle. The reason the master could feel safe in removing the shackle is because he knows that the shackle is no longer on the physical property of the human being, but it has gone to his brain. <laughs> and we see it quite often when we look to, at the mirror. You take Michael Jackson, for example. <laughs> And, and and it seems that this singing sends them crazy because that's on the male side but we could take Diana Ass on the other side <laughs> since the African believe in the law of opposite it is necessary that we put male and female <laughs> so that no one hollow uh, sex discrimination. <laughs> in terms of Garvey again in the philosophy, let us try to look at the by black situation and to see if it had any aspect of racism. Garvey in saying by black he felt and as he did, where Garvey put his mouth, he equally put his dollars, or at least his people's dollars. Garvey built for them economic institution, the newspaper, the Black Star Line, the shipping company, bakeries, grocery stores, and he started to manufacture because Garvey said, if only we could sell one match to each Chinese per year, we would have an industry that would be able to occupy every African in the Western world. He said our problem isn't being invited to the Rockefellers for dinner. That is it, because we may not like the way they cook anyhow, because they don't use much seasoning. He says, and then we can't reciprocate. We would be at a total, total disadvantage. He said, wherever we are, we must control the economy in that spot. He said, no people begging for a dinner 
can have dignity or respect. No man who cannot support his wife can be respected, respectful of her. I rather repeat that one. Yeah. There's a big clamor about black men leaving, and God recited it. Black men leaving their family, and the society saying it is a racial trait in black men. Gavi asked, how come that trait doesn't work in Africa? It's only over here. How come it didn't work in slavery? Gavi said in slavery we fight like hell to establish marriage when the society didn't allow, allow us to marriage. We established our own rules. When they say we couldn't go to the church and get married, we then established our rule for marriages. Not only did we do that, but we understood that the, the significance of it, it was not a matter just for something called holiness. Because we know that isn't the reason people marry. It has nothing to do with heaven. It, it, oh, no. Because what God make put uh, together, men can't put the sender. So don't say the stupidness anyhow. The God said that the reason for marriage is a security for the woman and her family. It got nothing to do with the God. If God is so bad and want a marriage to stay together and then want somebody to break it, he killed the man who tried to break it. Or kill the woman who's trying to break it. So since God has nothing to do with it, let's deal with it. It's man. And you can't protect a marriage when you're broke. Because your wife can't eat love. She can't put it in the pot. God be said. God we maintain for the, for the African man to have dignity, he must control his economy. If he controls his economy, then he can give to his wife what other men do for their wives. But if he does not, he will forever be a man whose wife is subject to abuse and whom he can never protect. I mean, the, the God's philosophical thoughts were fundamental. And one thing Garvey said, particularly I should probably say from before, in endorsing what Dr. Wilmot Edmund Blyden had already said in accepting the presidency of the College of Liberia in 1883 uh, in context with the, uh, the previous statement that was made, Africa for the African, to which Garvey had already had uh, those at home and those abroad. Blyden is speaking about the beauty of the African woman had maintained that the African woman has no other woman to set an example for her beauty. That is something I wish the African woman here had heard God be speaking about. Let me repeat that. I mean, I think it's good. It, 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 it caught me to my funny bone. Brothers, what Garvey said. And I know most of the sisters do certain things because you aren't looking at her. And she's trying to look like a European because you like to look at Europeans. I remember a few years ago she wanted you to look at her in her African splendor. As Garvey said, at the uh, but a brat of the Garvey movement, the Grandiosa models, in the 60s, they wore the hair natural. You couldn't accept the natural African look. You made her put a name to it, Afro. <laughs> now, I don't know how you could spell Africa with an O in it. But then being in college, being in college, you get sophisticated. <laughs> so from now on, we spell Africa, A-F-R-O-C-A. Afroca. <laughs> <laughs> but God we maintain it just like the other day I heard Bo Derek gave us the cornrow. I don't know if Bo now I know I'm 69, I know I know Bo Derek isn't 69. Now I know I saw my mother when I was knee high to a grasshopper. <laughs> Conroing her own hair, conroing my sister hair, and she would have conroed my daddy hair, but he didn't go. He didn't go for no faggotry. He said no. <laughs> but God, he said, 
that the African woman's beauty is matched by no other woman because she has her own texture of hair, her own physical shape, and then Garvey went down to remind us why are we the way we are? And Garvey said, if we had narrow nose in all that heat in Africa, we suffocate <laughs> for the heat to get out the brain. <laughs> and it's a fact. If we had this thick lips, thin lips in Africa, we could not, in the, all that heat, kiss conveniently. <laughs> if the, you girls who have never been kissed by a thick lip, <laughs> You have never been kissed before. <laughs> I am speaking from experience, I have one. And Garvey spoke of the hair. Since man did not come here with hat on, and with the kind of sun we have in Africa, the hair, the kinky hair was made by nature to do as what the straight hair does in Europe. If, if the Europeans had started out with kinky hair, with all the ice and the snow, it would have done the opposite of what the wooden hair, or so on and so on. The light skin in, in the icy places is better for the European than the dark skin, whereas the dark skin would be better for the African for the month of sun, the sun ray. So nature wasn't crazy when it did for its people what it had to do. We are the crazy one who thought that nature was crazy and start to try to look like everybody else than ourselves. And Garvey, in examining all of that, most of us thought that all Garvey think, thought of was his nationalism. Yes, he was an African nationalist to the core. He lived it, he slept it, and he died for it. But Marcus, then winding down, Marcus Messiah Garvey was especially conscious of, what, conscious of one thing. The African man and his African woman. It is something we need to read a little more, if not Garvey, somebody else. Garvey's devotion to a wife. Certainly some people made a lot of dissension with the first wife and caused Garvey to lose his cool, being human, and divorce her. His subsequent or second wife, <coughs> he treated his sons, the two sons, he had no daughters, Julius and Marcus Julia, whom, both of whom I saw today at the Board of Education in Brooklyn. But he supported them to the best of his ability. So much so that he set a guide. Marcus Jr. is an engineer, and Marcus, uh, young Marcus, the younger of the two brothers, Julius, is a medical doctor and psychiatrist. One thing Marcus Garvey reminded us, he said, show me a black man who mistreats his woman and I show you a black man without any pride. God will remind us, God will remind us that our women are the first heaven we have. God will remind us that we are looking up in the air for heaven when it sleeps in bed with us. <laughs> God will remind us that each and every one of us came out of heaven. That's right, the abysmal deep that they are speaking about in the Bible is the placenta, the 
the abysmal deep dark abysmal if you think back of the woman placenta you can't see anything inside of it there is fluid in it and that's where we stay for 10 months normally not nine by the way and but God will remind us of the various statues we see in Egypt for example God Mim the God of fertility who's always seen an erected penis hanging out straight straight horizontal perpendicular to the earth surface and remind us as the Egyptians show the penis coming from the navel the umbilical cord an extension of life God we said to us if we would remember that our first experience of heaven is our mother's womb then we those of us who think and call ourselves an African nationalist must first think must first honor must first realize show me the way you treat your woman and I'll show you the condition of your race A young man uh, who read a poem a couple of days ago I spoke to um, from the very beginning I don't know if he's still here or and I have to admit that I, I forgot <laughs> about him is he still here let me have him come up for one quick moment <laughs> This is Brother Ayen, and he has a very uh, special tribute for us all, but particularly to to one individual. And I'd just like for all of us to, to pay particular attention to this young brother and, and, and listen to his poem. Brother Ayen. Today, we are celebrating Black History Month, and I ask myself, who are we? Are we Negroes? Are we niggers? Are we mulattoes? Are we coloreds? Or are we blacks? Again I ask, is there any place on earth called Negro Land? Is there any place called Nigger Land? Is there a place called Mulatto Land? Is there a place called Colored Land? Or is there any place on this earth called Black Land? But I know there is a vast beautiful and rich continent from where my ancestors came. I also know that this continent is the birthplace of modern man, Homo sapien sapien. And I do know that this continent is the cradle of civilization, Africa, Africa, Africa. Yes, this I know. I am a proud African, but I am also an American. I am a proud I am therefore a proud African American celebrating African American History Month and I shall continue to learn all I can about the history and culture of my people. Now I ask myself, who are these people? Are they kings? Are they queens? Are they heroes? Or are they heroines? Yes, it is true. They are the Mensa Mooses, the Shakas, the Aussie Tutus, they are the Nzingas, they are the Frederick Douglasses, the Richard Allens, the Marcus Martins. They are the Sojourner Truths, the Harriet Tubmans, the Mary McLeod Bethunes. And they are the Kwame Nkrumahs, the Jomo Kenyattas, the Nelson Dendia, the, the Nelson Mandelas. They are the Annie Bites, the Winnie Mandelas. They are the Malcolm X's, the Whitney Young's, the Martin Luther King's, and they are the Rosa Parks, Shirley Chisholm's, and Barbara Jordan's. So
Certainly, they are the kings and queens of Africa. They are the hero and heroines of the Americas. They are the fathers and mothers, sons and daughters. They are the descendants of the motherland, Africa. And this I know for sure. I am a proud African. I am a proud American. I am a proud African American with the same blood of Mother Africa. The same blood given to these kings and queens, heroes and heroines, running through my veins. For I am a proud African American celebrating African American History Month. to thank Brother Ayan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a question and answer, question and answer period. And in having that question and answer period, I will, if you have a question, <coughs> I will call upon you. And if you would just indicate who you are directing the question to, either Dr. Ben or Dr. Clark, or to the, the two brothers. Before, I'm just trying to give Dr. Ben uh, an opportunity an opportunity just to, to, to rest for a moment, but I do want to say this once again that on, on Thursday, February 11th, we will have uh, Dr. Adlai Sanford and Dr. Donald Smith, and at the present time, we will be meeting in this room, but if there are changes uh, from that, we'll certainly post it on the door and directing you where, where you are to go. And I also like to, I neglected at the, you know, when you start mentioning names, you always get into, you always get into trouble. But I certainly want to, to thank the members of the NOAA staff for all that they've done to, to make this Black History Month possible and for, for just, just re really being there because it's very difficult putting these kinds of things together. I want to thank the students in the NOAA program who helped send the, the black history announcements through the mail. Most of you have received something in the mail and it took someone putting that in the envelope and getting it to you. And I also want to, to, to thank our brothers John Matthews and brothers Terry and Fudge for all they've done to make this Black History Month possible here at Hofstra University. Without any further ado, we'll have your questions and their answers. Any questions? Uh, the gentleman standing in the back. Okay, you'll have to speak just a little bit louder. Uh, brother, you alluded to uh, some of the causes of uh, white supremacy. And, uh, just the other day I saw on the Donald show, uh, and Dr. Uh, Frank Sharp was well. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with her work. She was also saying that uh, part, part of the reason for white supremacy is because uh, white people know, or the Europeans know, that we that the black male has the capability in, in the sperm to annihilate their whole race because their genes are excessive. So that white supremacy is also partially based on that. And I wanted to know, you know, what was your opinion of the that, that theory, the press theory about uh, white supremacy? Well, I'm familiar with uh, Dr. <coughs> Wellman's uh, theory, or crest theory. It is part of the answer. The other part of the answer is really in the rise of Europe and the insecurity of Europe in the face of the vast number of people in the world that are not European. Nature plays weird tricks. Most of the resources that's needed to turn capital over and to turn the wheels of Western industry. Most of the resources are in the lands of non-European people. And for the Europeans to continue to take these resources free of charge, continue to rape these lands, or to continue to get it cheap, they have to go through a motion of assuming that the people have no ability to develop this to themselves, although the Japanese have proved them wrong on this point because 200 years ago the Japanese didn't even have a good wheelbarrow. Look at them now. 
It also has to deal with the maintenance of a concept of color prejudice that started in the 15th and the 16th century, the assumption that there was something special about color. And the European has made a virtue out of a physical defect, the absence of color. <laughs> Young lady standing in, in front. Um, okay, my, my question is addressed to Dr. Clark also. Um, I'm listening to your speech, and um, it's very, I mean, I enjoyed it very much. I'm in Jamaican. I've been living here in the United States for uh, exactly a year, seven months, two weeks. And I couldn't help but wonder why you seem to almost write Jamaica off as a lost cause in the sense that if Marcus Garvey was to come to Jamaica at this point in time, he would probably be stoned. There are no synthesizers for Marcus Garvey in Jamaica. I am, as I would like to describe myself, a budding Pan-Africanist. Teaching which I've learned back home. Marcus Garvey is a national hero back home. Um, Muta Baruka, the dub port, is a Pan-Africanist. Um, many of our musicians, um, Young, young people. I mean, there is a change in faith in Jamaica, which I felt you omitted by just referring to probably a traditionalist, a strong traditionalist back home, as opposed to a younger generation and a change in faith. I can understand you taking exception. I've lived in Jamaica, and I was in Jamaica only a few weeks ago at a conference on Marcus Garvey. I still think Jamaica is the most stratified of all the Caribbean nations along color and class lines. The powerful, entrenched, class, color, class conscious and color conscious Jamaica who stopped Marcus Garvey the first time is more powerful now than, than ever. Marcus Garvey is a national hero and yet you cannot read books about Marcus Garvey. It's not in the Jamaican public libraries. He, there's no course on Marcus Garvey in a single college in Jamaica. There's no primer on the life of Marcus Garvey. What kind of national hero is this? And what kind of nation with black consciousness would elect the white man from Boston as prime minister? <laughs> I read that uh, the younger Elijah Muhammad was a lieutenant under Marcus Garvey's uh, 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 time. That's true. You tell me? Yeah. Either one of those. That is that is correct. Uh, uh, before, when he was still uh, a minister of the Baptist Church, he was a lieutenant in Garvey's movement. When he became in in his own movement when he was calling himself Mutt Mutt at the time at, at 128th Street. He was still in the movement. He left the movement when he became, when he went to the Morris Science. And after Morris Science, then he established uh, his, uh, his version of um, Islam. Uh, second question. Um, would you say that he carried on the same thing? That's no, he carried some aspect, the economic aspect was uh, basically an uh, idea from Garvey. I would say other than that, it was a rugged departure. Thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. In uh, Harold Cruz's latest book, he talks about the development of the black political convention movement of the 1970s. What do you see as the potentials of a black political party in the U.S., and what do you think are some of the problems? Either one. Look, I'm familiar with Hal Cruz. We grew up together intellectually after the war. Hal Cruz is 
an uncanny genius in choosing good titles for books and writing full books behind the titles. <laughs> Both of his books are misleading. This one is called Plural But Equal. Interesting title. But we were not brought to America to be equal. It is a plural society. I'm not in favor of All whites are not equal. Let's get something straight about this country. This country was found as a haven for free white Protestant males, middle class and up, those who agreed with the prevailing political status quo and who owned property. Everybody else in the country is second. Catholic Jews, everybody. Second to that, women too. Women got to vote day before yesterday. <laughs> No, uh, the convention movement really started in the in the 19th century. Right, I'm familiar with that, but I'm talking about in terms of the 70s. Uh, do you think there's potential for a black political party? What do you think that potential is, and what do you think would be the problems involved? I haven't decided whether it's even a necessity. I think a black political force the unity of blacks on a political purpose, blacks knowing what they want from the political structure and unifying to get it is far more important than a separate black political party. A separate party, if you think, will do any good, but a political force is essential to all time. Do you think the Black Caucus is um, what you're talking about when you say that? Well, the Black Caucus is a minimal thing. It's not big enough to be considered on the same level. Okay. Yeah. There was a... I, a I, feel, I feel slighted in this book. <laughs> <laughs> He's always accustomed to give John I, and, and myself hell in all his books. <laughs> and he isn't cursing us in this book I wonder, John, if in his old days he's getting reformed. <laughs> uh, I guess no, no one knew me until Harold Cruz mixed me up with the voice and John and others and thought, of course, Harold have never had a new idea. He has other people's idea and criticize it. And he's done the same in this book. But a convention, just take reality. Let us say America went real crazy and voted for Jesse Jackson. I mean, we all went mad. Black, white, Technicolor, and rainbow. Who is going to be the head of the army? Who is going to run Wall Street? Who is going to be the Secretary of State, etc., etc.? It won't make a damn difference if Jesse's grandmother was the president. You're still going to have capitalism, rugged and all kind of it. And if Jesse lived to pass the electoral college, you mean you see, you you forget that Americans don't vote for a president. They go through an exercise of futility. Because it's going to be the electoral college that decide who's going to be the president. Three times or just four times, America popular vote was reversed. Don't think that America will kill John F. Kennedy, Roosevelt, Lincoln, and others, and won't kill Jesse. <laughs> I think Jesse know that he's going to win. He's just making a position. He wants to go to the convention with his strength. He wants to be able to negotiate for a few ambassadors, a few, uh, you know, let's face it, and get a few dollars for himself. And I'm, I'm, I'm with him. Get some money, Jesse. You got a family to support. <laughs> practical and impractical dreamer on the situation. I want Jesse to get so many votes 
they have to throw it in the house. Right. Then when they throw it in the house, I know they're going to steal it from him. <laughs> and the nature of the stealing will be a political lesson for all of us. Yeah. There was a lady in the back who, who had a question. Okay, well, let me go to the back and then I'll go over there. White images, starting with the Bible. White Jesus, starting up, gave us a disrespect for the black father in the home. Missionary concepts of color, propaganda, cause us to lose faith in ourselves. I've seen people in Africa, black and proud and beautiful, in the Sudan and I see some blue black people. Most beautiful blackness I've ever seen in my life. Velvety looking blue. No apologies. When Nkrumah came to power, I was head of a culture unit of the anti-poverty program. I got the film and I got the tape and I showed it to my students. I said, look, he's addressing the world. He's speaking to the United Nations. He had, he had even combed his hair. He no bleaching green. He's black and he's like it that way. In the last public speech of Ma uh, James Baldwin at Cornell, a white student asked, a white male student, after all the years and you're famous now with money, aren't you tired of people discriminating against you because of your blackness? Isn't it a problem to you? He said, no, no problem to me, but I'm worried because it's still a problem to you. <laughs> and he said, I like it the way it is. I wear it well. I dig it. But if you can't understand it, then that's your problem. <laughs> I, I think in the Tanzania Gazette, there's a nice thing. When Tanzania got independent, there was one British woman who was in the Tanzania legislature during the British administration for quite some time, and she couldn't stand the idea to see her beloved Tanzania go to the natives. And so the Tanganyika Gazette did a little a comic strip. Uh, they show a missionary man come with his British hat, his short pants and his high socks and boots coming up on the shore. And then the little missionary boy running in on the shore. An African woman in the her house peeping through the window and a little African boy playing with the missionary son. And the caption said, Ngulu, I tell you never to play with your dinner. Uh, it, was, it, it was to show the, the, the attitude of Europeans of how they thought about Africans. But the thought remained the same, but the African was st has still regained his land. Another caption is, uh, and I'm finished here, but we like to use Bro and Nancy's stories before they became Uncurimus stories. A missionary arrived because this is one of our worst problems. I said, it, they said that the Africans uh, ate the missionaries and we didn't eat them, and that was our biggest mistake. <laughs> But it's not too late to start eating them. 
But this missionary came and he tried to convert everything he could see. And he didn't get any Africans because Africans by now had started to get uh, back on the track. But there was a lion coming up who had been wounded. And you know, a wounded lion in his far can't catch anything. And so the lion was coming up like this and the missionary started to pray, Oh Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do because I promise you I'll come here to civilize these people and to bring them to your faith. And so just then the lion came, watched the missionary and stood down with his paws up in the place and start, Ooh, and then missionary said, oh Lord, I want to change something. I didn't ch get a human being here, but I got a lion who is praying to you. And the lion stopped and watched the missionary and said, I don't know what you're asking the Lord for, but I'm thanking the Lord for my first dinner. <laughs> Someone on the side here had, had a question? Yes, sir. Excuse me, Dr. Ben, I'd like to ask you a question related to education. Uh, I think everyone in the room, if not them, and their children go to schools in New York State. And I believe New York State Department of Education mandates or dictates the curriculum to be taught in the various schools throughout the state. And my question to you is, is there any formal course or courses given with regard to Afro-American studies in the uh, social studies of our schools? In some school, there's still, you could still have, but it dependent, it's dependent upon the teacher. And, you know, even at the college level, there is such a thing as a curriculum committee. A co committee. That's the fellows that chop up your course or said can't go through. But nobody can stop me from teaching what I want under any title. I mean, I could, uh, I could t uh, teach a course called Restrictions Not to Say African and teach Africa in it because I use one of the other names for Africa. And I will speak about it. It's like, uh, it, it all, you see, excuses are out of mood after the 60s at least, 69 and so forth, when the youngsters went to the street, when the youngsters in Cornell took up guns against the New York State uh, uh, policemen, uh, when youngsters all over, uh, when they burned the, the universities, and they got, get, have to get back to that. Uh, you know, I got to say, I probably wouldn't be here. I, I probably wouldn't be here at Hofstra. Sitting down today, want if if young black people didn't burn the place. I mean, let's face it. I mean, we are brilliant. John is a brilliant brother, and I, I'm no slouch. <laughs> but we, we wouldn't have been here. We were we were, we were there before 1969. We had to pay people. We were paying at 310 Lennox Avenue with Richard Moore. We used to pay people 25 cents to come upstairs to hear the lecture. And that was a lot of money. 25 cents to so get a three-course dinner for the divine. <laughs> <laughs> and we had such people as Langston Hughes, uh, John, Richard Moore, and I could go on and go on. And for entertainment, we had Philippa Schuyler, then she was a child genius before she went out of mind. <laughs> and then all, all those different things. And, and no one, people didn't want to come. We had to literally kidnap people and carry them upstairs to listen to their own history. So it was never a time we had Dr. Seifert and his institute. There were a number of academies, even J.A. Rogers writing in the Pittsburgh Courier and other people. There was never a time when we were short of telling our people our history. Of course, you know, Marcus Garvey was loaded with, when, uh, do you, if we ever tell you, J. Philip Randolph, uh, all those fellows were with Garvey. Randolph was with Garvey. And a number of fellows who, who turned the other side became uh, uh, Norman Rockwell, socialists, uh, Marxists, and all kind of things like that, were with Garvey. It doesn't say that they didn't know. If those men stayed with Garvey, you see, they didn't, they went to look for a better bread. Like most of us with our PhDs. Uh, I remember when John was teaching in 
uh, how you act. Literally, and in little housing project uh, in the little room there, I was lecturing in front of chap full of nuts and 125th Street and 7th Avenue with a ladder and Thursday, Friday and Saturday and Sunday afternoon coming from teachers college as a professor teaching on the corner my members of my own family won't speak to me <laughs> John Patel, a member of his family won't speak to his wife, his first wife won't speak to him we were crazy so I'm saying if we put our mind to it and I know, if, let's face it, we don't run New York City Public School. And people don't think for others as they think for themselves. It's a reality. Uh, don't expect that other people are going to leave their personal interests for yours. <clears throat> Just a very short comment because there are a lot of folks who question. Okay, well, don't you be equally as long winded because we came to hear him. Okay. Very specifically, Dr. Ben, when I was a child, they call us social studies geography. And as a youngster, studying geography, Africa was known to be far removed in a very negative state. My point is that as a youngster, I had to fantasize about geography because all they taught was white history. Now today, and I think that if everybody here has any inkling as to what the New York State Board of Education is supposed to be doing, and they have representatives called regents, I think the communities, if they're concerned and interested in having a curriculum instituted or implemented in their respective schools, then the regents' people are the people to write to. Yeah, but if you have gone and seen a regent meeting, uh, I guess you remember a fellow named Clark, not Dr. John Henry. I'm talking about the other Clark. The Kenneth Clark. That's another Clark, another era. But he told you the Board of Regents had meetings to which he didn't know and which he couldn't attend because the places they had it is for whites only. I, I don't think they could do it too easily with Alice Sanford, but they got techniques. Uh, the, the reality, again, we got to re-emphasize. We're in a system that is not for our benefit, as John said in the beginning. This system is an extension of Europe, and it's Judeo-Christian in background, what they call Judeo-Christian. And it functions for that. It's Judeo-Christian, Greco-Romano, and nothing that uh, anything that doesn't fit in that going to have to fight and fight and constantly fight. And as John was starting, Europeans are not racist against Africans alone. They are racist against Europeans. French people don't like to live. I mean, you, you, if you Italian, you move in a French neighborhood. It is hell. If you German, you move in. And then remember, let's pay the back. When you said Jewish, what are you talking about? They're black Jews and they're brown Jews and yellow Jews. But when you say white Jews, white Jews are white. In white good society. You doubt it? Move in a white Jewish neighborhood, or a white Italian neighborhood, or a white Greek neighborhood, and see if all whites don't move. That's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben. Yes, sir. Speak just a little louder, please. When would the recorded on the education of Africa? And could you explain to me why was the sign of peace, what is not only Swatch, but why that change to the law opposite that you have? Nobody, no one knows when was the first day of education in the continent of Africa because you're talking about 11.3 million square miles. But the oldest record of the Nile Valley, Egypt, and Egypt wasn't the first, by the way, is Puanit, now called Somalia, Kenya, and Uganda used to be the old nation of Puanit, which later the Jews called Punt in the allegorical story. Uh, our records, we have uh, archaeological records of hieroglyphs 
which shows a writing that goes back to about 25,000 writings that we could decipher now. If you go back to the Grimaldis and others, you have other writings there, the picture writings. If you go into the uh, Tassili Mountains with the fresco there, yeah. you have uh, writing, uh, the symbolic writing. It goes 450,000 years ago. That made Adam and Eve look sick. Uh, so then, we don't know uh, when education started. We know, though, that the Grand Lodge of uh, uh, Saqqara, and Saqqara is the, started with it, at least the third dynasty with Inhotep and Zuza, that at that place they had what they call a lodge, the Grand Lodge, the temple, where education, but remember, education must have been way, way before that because since a man had to stay 40 years in school after entering school at age 7, being circumcised and then started, at 40 years later you get your priesthood a designation. Instead of a case you get the name of priest. And you know all the subjects they were. So it was, I could say, education in Africa started before Adam and Eve. <laughs> there was no Adam and Eve mentioned any place when education, because Adam and Eve started with is a, is a Jewish, uh, a Hebrew, uh, 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 a concept coming out of the Sanhedrin. And you don't have no Hebrew before Abraham, and you don't have no Sanhedrin until 700 BC. So even before the concept of Adam and Eve, Africans had writing and education. Okay, why was the, the Brahmin, which, which, uh, Hitler oh, the, the Grammadan? Why is that change to, why is that change? Uh, Hitler moved it to a swastika. If you go to the museum, the uh, Metropolitan, no. The Museum of Natural History at uh, 79 to 81st Street on 8th Avenue or Central Park West, and the second floor section called the Hall of Men in Africa, you will see the Togolese clothing. You see Grammadans all over it. And the, what is called an eagle, which they now call a German eagle. Saint Maurice, Maurice of Aragon, that became the patron saint of Germany, this African from Togo, who went to Rome and then was sent from Rome to be bishop of, of Germany and then uh, murdered, wore the Togolese uh, eagle and the, the Grammadan. And they are Grammadan at the feet of Buddha, they are Grammadan all over. Grammadan is as old as 40,000 years. The difference is that Hitler turned the legs around. That's all. But what they call a swastika is Hitler's copy because Germany under Kaiser Wilhelm had colonized Togo and brought, and the Togolese brought that symbol there. That's where the, the Germans got what they call the swastika. Okay. Question all the way in the back, Mr. Poe. Speak loud, loud, Mr. Poe. And I was wondering, it seems to me that Marcus Garvey and Julius Nairi had similar beliefs of self-sufficiency in Africa for Africa. I was wondering, how can we as um, Africans, people of African descent in America, make these efforts manifest here? I got to disagree with you both, buddy. <laughs> Not Judas Nairi. Judas Nairi does believe in integration. Marcus Messiah Garvey will have died rather than integrate with anyone other than an African woman. It was inconsistent with Garvey to think of cross-mating. You could call it racist or not. He believed that the survival of his people, if you're going to do that, do it at a later date. But he said, you first have to consolidate your forces before you could start talking about integration. Neary barred me from coming to the, what is that, seven pack they call it? Six pack. The six pack in Tanzania. Because my speech was a speech supporting Garvey. By the way, I was barred from uh, uh, Guinea by Secretary for the same speech as supporting Marcus Garvey. Both of those men said that they did not stand for any such uh, philosophy 
are of race. So I don't, not, they, not Judas Mary, who's, who kneels down in front of Pope and kissed the ring. Judas Mary, then look at the cabinet, look at the role of the Indians in Tanzania. Look and see if in, if in Tanzania, if you go up to, to the post office, if an Indian can still walk in front of you and get served. Okay, we're going to take about two additional questions. Gentlemen sitting in the front. Yes, I'd like to address this to both Dr. Ben and Dr. Warner. I was just wondering when looking at Isis and Osiris and Horus, the story of Isis and Osiris and Horus, and looking at Bible as it is now, you see some similarities, but there are also some inconsistencies in the current Bible. I was just wondering, could you point out some of the inconsistencies and also give us a point of reference which we could look at as far as the periodicals are concerned? This is solely Dr. Ben's uh, answer. This is, this is his particular area of research. <laughs> One of the major inconsistencies with the Mary, Mary and Jesus and Joseph take off of Isis, I'm using the Western usage of the name, Isis or Horus and Osiris, is number one. The West has used the word Virgo to mean hymen. And in the ancient, uh, uh, the ancient Africans of Egypt and elsewhere, when they spoke of the Immaculate Conception, uh, they didn't mean that a woman who had no sexual intercourse and that her hymen was not broken. The immaculate conception was a clean thought, a clean person. For example, a woman who got pregnant never touched another man but, but the man that made her pregnant and up to the delivery never touched another man but the man that made her pregnant had an immaculate conception. And she gave birth to a virgin child. It has nothing to do if she had 30 children before. As a matter of fact, they clean it up a little in the book. It said, Jesus and his brothers and sisters. You can't be up to the human uh, phallus and the woman vagina. That we have to be ashamed of it. We can't even talk about it. And this, this, the, the, in those days, it, you go in all the temples and you see God is smooth naked. You see God mim naked, the God of fertility. You see God, goddess uh, Mut given birth even to the sun from her vagina and the sun come out in the morning and going back. The Western concept of the Romanized concept of this is even to deny Jesus the act of manhood, 33 years old. And he don't know what sex is in a in a polygamous country. Uh, could you give us a periodical which you could use as a point of reference? Oh, oh yes, there a lot of. Uh, uh, I think you could read Anacalypsis, a two-volume work Anacalypsis, A N A C A L Y. P.S.S.I.S. Uh, by Sir Godfrey Higgins, two volumes. Uh, Man, and, Man and His Gods by Homer W. Smith. Uh, the Sixteen Crucified Saviors by Kirsty Graves. Bible Myths and Their Parallels in Other Religions by Thomas Downs. Christian, uh, uh, Christianity Before Jesus by John Jackson, also uh, by Annie Besant, there's uh, equally two people who wrote that, I mean two different books by t the same name, uh, take out the 13 volume works by Sir James Fraser called The Golden Bow, and read the proceeding of the Nicene Conference of Bishops. Because it is at the proceedings of the Nicene Conference of Bishops in 325, ordered by Constantine the Roman Emperor, that Christianity was denuded of its sexuality. 
and given a Roman connotation of, but you got to remember the background. When these things are written, what was Greece at the time? The Greek soldiers went to the battlefield and lived there. And Greek men would bet, the generals bet, married 35 years and they would bet that the wife still was untouched. Why they need a wife for and they had a boy on the field. You got to remember the background, what the Romans were thinking of. Look at Michelangelo's painting. Michelangelo, look at painting of men, any man in here is small. Our dean here has got a good build, and he will be miniature. Michelangelo got these big men and penis about a half inch. <laughs> Look, go, go to the Sistine, go to the Sistine Chapel, and see the mind of Michelangelo, and then you get an idea. These are the men that projected the pictures, the image. Look at the life of Ju Pope Julius, his romantic life with his boyfriends. Young lady in the front. I'd like to direct my uh, question to Dr. Ben. Um, you had spoken previously on the economy of uh, black Afro-Americans. We do realize that there are flaws in the economy, and I'd like for you to elaborate on what you feel we can do to rectify those flaws. <coughs> You can't do a thing in American economy to rectify it. Uh, I can't, and I know no practice anybody in this room. Even Busky can't, and he dropped nine million one day. There's a fellow dropped fifty million one day in Florida and went and shot everybody he could. <laughs> We we'll get to the uh, to the lesson because we're into something we we need to uh, go deeper into because um, Last time, we discussed what was happening after 1600. Now the prize, the economic prize of the Europeans, the Caribbean Islands, North and South America, is beginning to yield enough economic gains to start competition among the European powers for space in the new world. Remember, all of the North American continent is not the United States. So there's competition among European powers, not only for space on the North American continent, there's competition among some European powers for space in what is now the United States. In the, the United States wasn't settled solely by English. Spanish settlement in Florida, they were pushed out 
in the French settlement that we talk about the consequences of later on in this competition for space in the lucrative Caribbean islands between England in this competition in Africa itself for who will control what part and the British having the biggest amount of muscle is beginning to push the lesser powers around, especially the Scandinavians who are a long way from home and that whose supply line is so thin and so far away from home, they're in a poor position to defend themselves. But a comparatively little people, little in numerically, but true in the colonial game and one of the most ruthless slave traders in the business are the Dutch. These wooden shoe wearing people, these two lip blowing people, these people whose homes are so clean they were named a cleanser after them was one of the great spillers of blood in the slave trade. And if you want to read a book that is an absolute revelation in the conduct of the slave trade and under different colonial powers, read Sahara Johnson's The Negro in the New World and read his chapter on the Africans under the Dutch. Read the whole book. Read the whole book because the whole book is worth reading. See, one thing and that has caused a lot of students to rob themselves of a lot of information. Now, they would just slap the name colonial vigor on Sahara Johnson. See, he was a white supremacist in the colonial period. And factually, they would be right. But if you miss reading Sahara Johnson, you have missed some major information. This white supremacist and this colonial bigger was a master researcher and he could write well. His analysis, or almost a catalog of what slaves were brought to the New World, what slaves it was advisable not to have brought at all, the fighting tribes, the tribes who came pretended peacefulness until they kind of got the lay of the land and fought later. Those you had to watch. See, you watch those Europeans, you know, they hang around for years until they see an opening. And they, they don't never fight at once. That being the, the candle bomb, and sometimes he'd hit you right away. But the Europeans would pretend meekness until he catch you on guard. He, would, he, he outlined the fighting spirit of different ones at different places. And different ones, it was advisable not to have war at all. Orlando Patterson, Jamaican sociologist, known Harvard, went over some of the same material, drawing different conclusions in his book, The Sociology of Slavery, and may have attempted to bring this up to date in his last book, 
the social death of slavery. But Sahara Johnson, supposed to have been that Englishman who knew more about Africans than any man alive. Now while that wasn't so, it's an exaggeration and an overstatement of his talent. The one thing that he did know, he cataloged, he knew how to catalog the categories of Africans brought into the Americas and in the Caribbean Islands in such a way that you can study the temperament, almost the temperature of that culture by Sahara Johnson. But he also wrote another work that you would deprive yourself of a whole lot of information by not reading. The Colonization of Africa by Alien Races. By Alien Races. Now, but the book, the main book, which I have expected a lot of information, which deals with what I'm talking about tonight, is really his The Negro and the New World and the impact of Africans in the economic making of the New World and different colonial powers trying to deal with these different temperaments of Africans in these different plantation systems and the plantation system as a separate cultural way of life, a non-cultural way of life, but as a separate way of life that Gilberto Fara, the, the Portuguese, the uh, Brazilian historian has said, called a separate civilization. In his work, masterpieces except for his concept of the Nile slave trade. See, if you can live through his concept of the Nile slave trade and read the masters and the slaves and the shanties and the mansions and other works about Gilbert of Friday, but if you can live through that, the fact that there was no such thing as a Nile slave, slave trade, he assumes that there was. He assumes that the mulatto woman in Brazil was as close, got as close to heaven as women got on earth because many times the Mulatto women in Brazil, after the arrival of the white woman, were treated even better. That means he don't know what better consists of. She was the prize as the concubine and the mistress. But nobody married. All the rich planters had one. It was the style of the day to have one, and to have one in a house with, sometimes with servants. She had a carriage, but she had, she had no legal status. She couldn't make any demands on anyone. And if her master died, she couldn't demand any portion of his property, but his legal wife, who tolerated him, his relationship with her, when he died, she got the plantation. But the mistress got nothing, except what he had given her in his, in his lifetime. But Gilberto Fryer is of the opinion that this woman rose higher in the societies of Brazil and might well have been the maker of Brazilian society and the epitome of Brazilian society. Because many times these planters would come to the ball and introduce their mistresses before they introduce their wives. They did the same thing in New Orleans. Even had balls, Creole and opera room balls 
where they would dress and parade their concubine mistresses, mixed breeds, even sent to Paris with special dress for them. There's a whole octoroon society. This is the origin of the, of the Louisiana Creole. A subject not worth a great deal here and now, but it was a separate society, so separate from blacks that it was a long time, even up to the present, men and women go to school with blacks and couldn't go to school with whites. It presented a, an educational dilemma for the school system. Now, what we are dealing with now, not only the competition, between these colonial powers, we're dealing with the making of the new world structurally, the remaking of a people psychologically and physically. And when you talk about slavery and the Africans in the new world, no one talks about the, the fact that here is an African people that in order to manage them, they had not only to break the will of so many of them, they had to bastardize them in large numbers and turn the bastards against certain factions and create fear and suspicion one against the other in order to weaken the concept of revolutions and use one to spy on the other. Now this was effective in the West Indies and effective in parts of South America. This same system was not effective in the United States. Because in the United States, the crude slave master, who's still crude in the same way, put all the color gradations in one bag, shook them up, and put one name on the back. You know what the name is, so I need not repeat it. So the lightest of the lights, the almost whites, if they were poor, stood next door to the blackest of the blacks. But in the United States. But in other places, they got the same privileges. I'm not saying they didn't get privileges in the United States, but they got a different kind of privilege. They got privileges in college, and they got privileges in the fraternities, and the sororities, and the local societies. But such privileges that they got in Brazil, and such privileges they got in Jamaica, almost a separate society, separate neighborhood, separate job categories, privileges they got to ruin Haiti to this very day. They didn't get that kind of privilege in the United States. And yet, when the United States occupied Haiti, the United States played on that scenario left by the French to rule Haiti the period of American colonialism in Haiti. You probably forgot that America occupied Haiti by 1915, it didn't leave to 1934. And that America ruled the country for putting these graduations of color once again, one against the other, far more ruthlessly than they've ever done here in the United States. But in the United States, America has not cared too much about putting color out. They have not mentioned that they just since some of the light skinned one is they meant to black one. So long as one declared, declared one. Now, we're talking about the making and the remaking of the people, but the main thing we're talking about is economic competition between European powers for space that will yield them the profit
to rebuild and strengthen the economy of Europe and lay the foundation for the modern world. And that the plantation system could not have been built in Europe because Europe hadn't got the land. And if Europe had the labor, the labor could not have been used quite that way. Because the labor used in the feudal system of Europe was not as productive as the labor used in the plantation system of the New World. And the Europeans did try to enslave Europeans and did bring Europeans to the New World in large numbers and work them without any appreciable success. But in the United States, they had more success with a variation of work because of a variation of climate. Now I'm coming to 1619 because we're dealing with the 1600s in the aftermath. Because 1619, when Africans arrived in the United States, brought to the United States, they found that the larger number of indentured servants were white and some were Indian. And the whites were mostly Irish, some Central European, but mostly Irish. <laughs> Poor Europeans, some Scandinavians, who, had, who did not have the price of paying their way to the U.S. and who <coughs> got on boats and who, for the price of passage, the captain had the option of auctioning their labor off. And so the people who were purchasing their labor literally had to pay the passage. They had to work for that person for a number of years to pay off the passage. These were indentured servants as against chattel slaves. And that when they arrived and the Africans began to commingle with them and had, there was no objection to relationships one to the other, which tells us something which a whole lot of bigots in this country would like to forget that the whole concept of prejudice and separation based on color had a hard time getting started in this country because it didn't make sense to people of the same class in the same predicament who had the same enemy in the same oppressor. So it didn't make sense for them to fight against each other or separate themselves from each other, having the same common oppressor and the same common enemy. Now, in the West Indies, a similar thing happened then in, in Barbados, that some descendants of the poor Irish called Johnny Redlegs, still in Barbados. And why they didn't make much out of themselves, I'll never know. But if you ever saw a 
a group of white people that you wanted to kind of sympathize with. Well, I don't know why they didn't. You wonder why they didn't put themselves up by their bootstraps and who stole their boots? <laughs> I think that probably didn't have to get boots. But the Johnny Red Legs and Bob Bay was about the most pathetic. <laughs> you've never seen it all in your life. <laughs> you feel like making a contribution to his <laughs> to his call. <laughs> and, uh, and a few times that Bob Hayes and Lady married Johnny Red Day, they tell her to shake your head, take the head and say, well, poor girl, she couldn't do no better. <laughs> you know, a lot of people hit it. Because these were poor whites who didn't work their way up to nothing. And whose descendants in Barbados to this day are still depressed and still poor. While in America, the poor whites did work their way out of it, did work their way up to up to something. The many of the Irish became slave drivers and managers of uh, petty something or another. Anyway, they did work their way out of their predicament. But in the West Indies, a lot of the poor English, a lot of the poor English overused that privilege, drank too much, gambled too much, now with excess to more women than they ever had in their life, not in a position to resist. Some of them partook of that temptation too much. Someone could have told them, you might as well try to drink all the water in the sea. They didn't know that. And the passing, the passing of that group of petty craftsmen from England brought over to fix things on the plantation, basic mechanics. The passing of that group brought into being some skilled slave laborers, blacksmiths, wagon masters, people who were fix the machinery on the sugar plantation. This is the origin of the Caribbean free man. Because the black American free man would come into being about the same time and about the same way, but not exactly for the same reasons. The slaves in New England were not used the year round. The winters were long. There wasn't enough for him to do the year round, so he became an industrial slave. Those who weren't working in industry, worked at carpentry, developed a, a, a paying skill. The master generally rented them out. If a slave was a good carpenter, he could make, he could make $4 a day. So the master would bring him out. He would take three. Let him have one of them. So a slave sometimes could make enough money to buy his own freedom in, in a year. And if he saved his dollar, you know, a few dollars, he, 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 then and he could purchase his freedom. And because of the pressure of the Quaker, because the Quakers were propagating against slavery anyway. And so that moral pressure made it a little easier to purchase. And sometimes the Quakers gave him the additional money he would need to purchase his freedom. So now you've got Caribbean free men, black American free men, in South America, you've got free men, the relatives of the black woman who married the Portuguese in the church of greed, that once she married the Portuguese, she is free. And some of her relatives became free, used as laborers in the hinterlands of Brazil, and some of them escaped. 
for free by virtue of this gate. Now, you've got a class of Africans in South America, in the West Indies, and the U.S. We're going to have to deal with later on because they're going to be thinkers. In Brazil, out of this class, will come two emperors, Pedro I, Pedro II. Mixed breed rulers of Brazil. Out of it will also come the father of Brazilian literature, Emmanuel Diaz. And from Peru, another part of South Africa, becomes the first, maybe the only saint of African descent canonized in the New World, Father Martin de Porres. So now you see the results of, now I'm not praising the mixing, I'm not judging the mixing. I'm not saying it was good or bad. I'm saying that out of it came certain personalities who would play a role in changing the status of Africans in the new world. All of this was happening, which meant nothing of a consequence to the colonial powers fighting for space, competing with each other for space in Africa and in the Caribbean Islands. The greatest producer of net economic gain other than Africa. Africa's production of net economic gain would be the slave itself. The Caribbean producer of net economic gain would be the products from the plantation system that is now beginning to feed Europe and begin to profit, you will begin to profit from it. Now, sugar is beginning to be a marketable product. The leather from the cows, etc. The mahogany, Jamaica once had a large mahogany forest. It's been mutilated to the point now, but Jamaica has a law against cutting, cutting mahogany. And, and, and the law will stay intact for 20 years to give the trees a chance to grow back. But Brazil had a, still had a large mahogany forest. We won't have it long because the Americans are there now cutting like food, not planting nothing. Haiti once had a large mahogany forest. With the diversity of wood that Europeans needed for furniture. And the British brought, brought over a lot of furniture from England and the uh, Termites in the New World just used that, ate that furniture for dessert. The wood was so soft, you know, they just smacked their lips on that. And so the Africans had to take local wood and reproduce that furniture because the termites just having a holiday eating up that, <laughs> eating up that soft wood. And if you go to Jamaica today, you will see some of the furniture that they made replicas of the British furniture that came over. And I've gone to a home in Jamaica. Someone pointed to a bed and said, my great-grandfather was born on that bed. My father was born on that bed. I was born in that bed. And you could put a truck on that bed. It was so strong. Good mahogany. Mahogany the leg, mahogany the side. Mahogany, everything. But well, Jamaica had plenty of good mahogany at the time. It's before they cut it down so fast until today you, you can't even cut mahogany at all. 
in, in Jamaica. We're talking about African craftsmen now working and reproducing, I mean, producing replicas of British furniture. We're not talking about raw labor. We're talking about skilled craftsmen. And many of these Africans were skilled craftsmen and wood, wood workers before they were captured as slaves. A fact that too many people overlook. They think this is brought some raw people grunting words nobody could understand. To the new world came a whole lot of skillful people, including iron workers who revolutionized the, the iron works. A lot of youth iron work in New Orleans, most of the time, most of the wood work, the fences, and you know, the fine iron work on the porches in New Orleans. A lot of it's being taken down, some of it being preserved for museums. Now all of this is happening outside of Africa. So within Africa itself, there is resistance and the continuation of slavery. Africa is still being drained of slaves. The Portuguese have them fought in Zinga. And in Zinga, having fought and lost, they have taken, they've taken over Angola. <laughs> Remember now, you've got two Portuguese slave trades. One takes care of Lisbon, right in the Portuguese. The other slave trade is taking care of the needs of Brazil, where you have a group of Portuguese who pulled away from the mother country and who needs slaves for the Brazilian market as against the general Portuguese market. Now the Portuguese who's taken slaves from the East Coast in partnership with the Arabs, they are selling and reselling. They are dumping some of their slaves into the British market, a lot to the Arab markets going to the east. Now, if you understand the early Arab slave trade, starting in the 600s, but you've got to go even further back, if you understand that Hatshepsut started a relationship between Asia, China, India, then I think called Kamei, 1500 BC, and this is all documented with information on the items that the Chinese took out of Africa in the infant and information on what the African bought from the Chinese. And <laughs> that is a little book on the last phase of this trade called the Paracas of the Algerian Sea, written by a Greek gazetteer. And this tells you what was for sale all down the coast of East Africa in the Red Sea ports of the Chinese all along this coast. Now, when you go to a book like Anacalypsis and read about African-looking, dark-skinned emperors on the throne of China, now it will make a little sense. Now, how they got there, I don't know. Began to be taken to China and India during that period. So now, but that's not what I'm really talking about. I'm trying to get to after 1600 and the competition between European and European that's going to lead to a change 
in the method of training that's going to be really a preface to another form of slavery that we have to deal with. And that's going to be colonialism. Because chattel slavery itself is going to be going to become top heavy. And the change is going to come not because anybody loves anybody. It's going to come because it's going to reach a saturation point. It's going to reach a point where everybody's going to have one who wanted one, uh, could afford one. And then the village will start the campaign to get rid of the traffic at sea. Then the British abolitionists, Wilberforce, Granville Shaw, who get quick reputation, fighting the end of slave trade. The people would think they're humanitarians, and they're not, because neither one of them fought against child labor in England. Neither one of them fought against the abuse of women in England. And neither one of them fought against the fact that women were in England picked up off the street and then they brought to America to be optioned off to the men in America who, because of an oversupply of men and a shortage of women. And in the Westwood movement, mostly men, when there was an extreme shortage of women, they were brought the early training moving to, to the West when we just brought for that purpose to be the wives or the mates of, of those men at the end of the train, train drive and at the end of the trails, the, the cattle drive trails. And literally auction off, just like you auction off how much in a bit. Once the story of, of the United States is told, once the story of servitude is told, and once the story of what happened to the female in America, black, white, and otherwise, I think you're going to have a women's little movement it might make a whole lot of people run for cover. Because her deal has been rather, rather sad. But be that as it may, what we're trying to get to is that competition between these slave holders and we look at slavery as a labor system is now making them reconsider the structure of the system. And the rebellions are costing so much that to a great extent it is not worth it. Brazil generally left out of the history of rebellions, Brazil, more than Haiti, gave the greatest example of African self-assertion and state building in the new world and in bringing into being the Colombos, the African independent communities in the new world after and in and around the Republic of Palmares. Almost a hundred years before the American Revolution. Bahia would not last as long in its fight 
though he wrote it, would not be as he wrote it. But that too came before the American Revolution. But at the tip end of South America, another series of revolts that what Higgins called the Bush Negro Revolts. And the, and the best known, the longest fall of these revolts coming again before the American Revolution is the Burbish Revolt, the Dunbar River, in what is now Guyana, formerly British Guyana. Here you have a slave revolt when a house slave, Kofi, saw his wife, a field slave, beaten to death and held his position, held his peace. And this act so affected him that he saw the true tragic nature of slavery and set a revolt in motion along with another field servant named Uncle. He is the first time you see a slave revolt where a field servant and a house servant is working hand to hand, although they argued a lot, they did work together. And Kofi would set this revolt in motion and almost in a show of vengeance against what he let happen to his wife, he married again an escaped slave from one of the plantations, a woman who was a field slave who escaped. They wrote her master and say, come and get her and prepare to spill blood because I will not yield. And each time he wrote his former master who kept asking him to yield and to give up the land that he had taken, he would write them back stating he would not but sign all of his letters, never again to be a slave. This revolt was against the Dutch, and it lasted so long the Dutch could get communications to Holland. And the whites, the local whites, had yielded and begged for mercy. And he wasn't defeated until communications came, heavy ammunition and soldiers. The revolt lasted for oh, almost three years. Finally, defeat, but when you think of the time of this revolt and, and the success that he had, in spite of the lack of modern ammunition, modern equipment of any kind, and that people would write the history of revolution and would leave this aspect completely out, out of history. Now, while this revolt at the tip end of South America, the revolt in Suriname, known as the Bush Negro Revolt. And the revolt in Guyana, or the Barbice Revolt, would be the best known. But not the only ones in, in South America. The revolts in uh, Venezuela, mm -hmm. other parts of uh, South America. In fact, there's a whole book on the uh, Venezuelan abolitionist movement. 
done this excellent research on the Brazilian abolitionist movement. But if you think that even this plastic, this uh, cosmetic change, and I'm going to tell you now that what you call emancipation was a cosmetic change in the slave system before converting it into colonialism. But if you think even this cosmetic change came about out of the goodness of anyone's heart, then you're misreading history. That change came about because African men, African women, stood up and opposed that system for over a hundred years physically and in some cases destroyed it and threatened the entire plantation system which was the very economy of Europe outside of Europe they had built an economy feeding and contributing to the re recovery of Europe, all of this was threatened by the self-assertion of these Africans. And they had to make a move. And they went through the motions of liberation with a fakery called emancipation. But they would convey this into another form of slavery called colonialism that was more manageable. So the change after 1600 would be only a cosmetic change to tone down revolts. It toned down revolts, but it did not stop revolts. But that would write the preface to, to today's revolts. These and the larger and the more meaningful and more political revolts that would come in the 19th century. But there's some more work to be done in explaining the 18th century and the personalities, black, white, and otherwise, that led up and that participated in the 18th century, because the 18th century was the century of monumental black abolitionists, some true white abolitionists, and when a reading and writing class had emerged in the West Indies, in the United States, and in Africa itself. I'm now a little freer and I'm now making more demands, demands that that mothers and them in that position is also a part of Western social thought. All of these things now will come together in the 18th, which will lead to the 19th, which I have a good sense the fighting century for African people all over the world. And I have often called the greatest century of African people outside of Africa, the century that we have to live again in order to understand the 20th and make the 21st. Because until we understand that 19, we will not understand that in the 20th century, we actually slowed down. And we're going to make the 21st. We're going to really have to go back and study the men and the women of the 19. And over the last week, I've been focusing and on it. Spending how you want to look at them, how you want to take them, what time and whether you understand 
the environment and the condition that shaped each one and made each one the way he was, given the circumstances and the time that their life unfolded. And remember, Du Bois lived almost a century himself, and he straddled so many ages, and he rode the tide of those ages. He rode it exceptionally well, making changes with it, like a man riding a tiger, keeping his original strength, and reaching out for the wisdom of age all at the same time. He was the intellectual master. And we have to go back to that well and drink the pure water of intelligence and understand that. But don't ever put one over the other. Don't ever prefer one to the other. But take each one based on his individual contribution. And remember that each one of those men was saying the same thing but using different words based on how environment and condition shaped them to do and say what they did. But we will get to the 19th because maybe the greatest thing the 19th did was to be the antecedents of those men in the 20th century. Everything relates to everything. And all history is connected one way, one way or the other. That's going a little too far ahead because we just finished the 16th going into the 17th because the 17th century and the 18th century might have been the most tragic and difficult century for the slave trade and the slave and the slaves. Because out of it would produce a caliber of research that will make the slave traders reassess and reconsider their position. And this reconsideration would lead to the fakery called emancipation. And this paper, in turn, will lead to another managerial system which they call colonialism. And we haven't finished with colonialism to this day. And that the European is always searching for a managerial system that will make it possible for him to extract labor, goods and services, from a large number of people to keep grits constantly feeding into his mills at a reasonable or at a very cheap cost. When he has to pay reasonable prices for all of this, he will have to readjust his, his, his economic system altogether. This he don't intend to do. So now if I keep on talking, you will understand the stubbornness to yield South Africa. But maybe the people of Bolivia want to know why Western dominance of the tin mines. The Mexican might bring up the question of the oil again. And this is going to lead to an international question once South Africa goes. Because the best developed method of extracting and using the mineral wealth of Africa has been developed in South Africa. And most of these, these methods, most of these methods goes into Western industry. And without them, Western industry would have to change its whole method, and if they ever have to pay for it, pay top price for it, other than to get it from the cheap price that they're now getting, they will have to make a drastic economic change. 
So Western nations in general, left or right, do not really want South Africa to fall. This might surprise you. This might also include socialist nations. Europe is Europe. And do not think racism stops at the door of communism and socialism. Unless you've got illusions. Racism is racism. Europe is Europe. They are clear about it. If there's any confusion, it's your confusion. Any illusion, it's your illusion. They are clear about what they want. They want to dominate the world forever. You've got confusion about partnership and, and unite and, you know, humanity. You've got that dream of Christian brotherhood and Martin Luther King. Judo Christian ethic, he said it so beautiful. You didn't even think he believed it. But you got to, you got to lose it. Ain't nobody, who else do you see propagating it? Anybody other than King propagating it? Jesse uh, Jackson. Well, no, no, I mean, other than us and company. <laughs> Judo Christian ethic. With the dual Christian ethics that got us into the slave trade. <laughs> Those are the ones who went over there and captured us. All right, Pete. That's enough. Um, we, we should have some discussion about it now. But, oh, God, I'll use up the time anyway. Thank you, Aaron. We got five minutes. All right, then let's use five minutes. I have a question. When uh, black. Uh, free men from the Caribbean entered the stage of uh, becoming uh, blacksmiths, etc. Were they able at times to escape if they wanted to do that at all towards the United States? But they not only did, but they came in some numbers, came to the United States and settled. Some started organizations. One opened, one edited a newspaper. One started a lodge, the Black Masonic Order. The, he called the African Lodge at Prince Hall, of Barbados. Lebron Bennett's book, Pioneers uh, of Protest, it's a very good portrait of Prince Hall. There's a new book on it by Charles Wesley, but it's hard to get. And some of my academic friends visit my house, and they, I don't know what kind of pockets they got, but the book left with one of them. I told Charles Wesley's wife, who just had a daughter photo, who happened to be a very good friend of mine, has gotten a second copy. I just hid that one. So when they come, that one's under something. <laughs> but there's a, there is a good book on, on there's a Peter Ogden from Antigua who started the Odd Fellows. I mean, a lot of them came to the U.S. The Caribbean miners had his, some of his finest flowers away from home and in the United States. One of the great unsung heroes of the Caribbean. Most Caribbeans don't even know about is is our uh, Hubert Harrison. Barely finished high school, so brilliant he taught at Columbia University and Henry George School. And Columbia University didn't want to admit that it, an unlettered street speaker from Harlem was teaching, so they put him down as handyman and paid him as a handyman. But he was teaching in Columbia economics and all kinds of subjects. 
yourself, house yourself, and close yourself, and sustain yourself. And Du Bois' concept was to protect yourself politically, and that an education is supposed to make you aspire to be anything from a good street speaker to the president. And Garvey's concept was the reclamation of Africa, and the unification of African people, and the redemption of Africa throughout the whole world. And his, all of them thought of nation management and preparation for nation management. They were all dreamers along different lines. And they were all saying the same thing. Only God would put it in more graphic words at the end of a large number of his speeches. Up, up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. And he was a great one at building confidence. And he understood something which so many people do not understand to this day. That to oppress a people, you must first destroy their self-confidence and historical memory. And they forget what they have been. They're confused about what they are, and they're not too clear about what they still have to be. Then you don't have to build any prisons for them, really, because you've got them in one, psychologically. More binding than any walls can possibly hold them. Isn't that the concept of, uh, isn't that the theory behind colonialism? Uh, that is the theory of oh. Yeah. Not only behind the colonialism, it is the theory of colonialism. Make you think you're nothing but a nothing. The first thing to make you laugh at your, they laugh at your gods. The next achievement is to make you laugh at your gods. Then you change gods, take their gods, their dress, their food taste, Then what else do they need from you? Um, you are totally trapped. You got their gods, their image, the sipping tea at four. You never taste tea in your damn life, don't even like tea. <laughs> yeah, because they sip it at four, you sip it at four. <laughs> they don't, build, don't need to build any prisons after that. I've seen Africans in, in, in all that climate with tweed on. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody going around in Africa with tweed and a tie? <laughs> or going to school with frock tail coat and a wing collar just because the English did that in England? <laughs> Who needs a prison after that? You got your mind. John Dubey, a great South African, that was his relative who had the problem in Stony Brook. A lot of people quite forget that that was the relative of the great John Dubey who really built the ANC originally. Still, we don't study enough history. That was the grand nephew of John Dubey. They didn't grant his tenure. Huh? They didn't grant his tenure. 
Mm. And he didn't do much. He just said his eyes. Mm. Was he lying? No. No. I think. No. Did the um, um, English speaking world um, have parliamentary democracy prior to embarking on colonialism, or was it a hand in hand? The, the English. Well, the, the parliamentary system in England and France. That evolved, that was in place prior to uh, the big years of the slave trade, wasn't it? Well, they were concurrent. It came into being concurrent with what that mean? Having parliamentary democracy at home and behaving in a different way away from home is no contradiction for them because the people away from home are not considered human beings anyway. Well, I mean, was that, is that the sole rationale, the subhumanity of the others? Well, it's not the sole rationale, but it, it is. It is the fact that they have not, in their mentality, elevated the people to the point of thinking that the people deserve equal consideration with them on a human level, or that the people are capable of handling the so parliamentary system. It's the greed that justifies the labeling of subhuman, the, the yeah. desire to exploit yeah. is rationalized by yeah. the label of subhuman. Yeah. It's not backed up by Christian theology. been 
non Roman Empire. For a thousand years, one way or the other, one form of Eastern power and African power has either frustrated or stayed the hand of Europe. The Crusades are over. The famines and the plagues of Europe are over, but the scars are still there. The conflict within the church is still there, but a method of dealing with the conflict is intact. Feudalism has been modified, but feudalism is still intact in Russia and in other parts of Europe. But it is obvious that feudalism will have to give way to something a little more humane than what the young lords conceded to the few, to the serfs during the Crusades, which was the right of first night. Now briefly, as we've explained before, during the absence of the old laws during the Crusades, and the old law had established literally the right for someone married on their land, the right of sleeping with the bride the first night, a right that the lords had. The young lords had given up that right without their permission during their absence. Now, this sounds so totally insignificant. And it sounds true that they would have assumed this right in the first place. But what you have to understand that the European dehumanization of the rest of the world had started with the European dehumanization of the Europeans. And that the mentality, literally the rehearsal of the European taking over vast areas of the world and treating people as less than human, had started in Europe with Europeans treating Europeans as less than human and denying them their basic rights. And when the European, including many who came to the United States, crying about persecution. It was an argument, a class argument, between certain European classes and religious groups, arguing about a clash of differences between religious groups, William Penn and his group and his, the Quakers and all these people escaping England, coming to America, escape persecution, none of them had voiced a vested interest in child labor in England, in the real persecution in England. They were talking about the Church of England being against these various groups that had left the Church of England and established a religion in variation and sometimes contrary to that of, of, of the Church of England. They said persecution, it was a difference of opinion between classes of people, sometimes the same class but of a different religion. And we keep forgetting that sometimes people are not talking about working class people at all. 
Because in this country, and this is still true, all the whole lot of people find it difficult to get it through their blanket and yes. This country was fashioned originally for free white Protestant males, middle class and up, those who agree with the prevailing political status quo and who own property. That's what America was originally designed for. And that's who still is the privileged class in the United States. And we, they said, look at the injustice for all. That was the all. And we quite forget that the white woman got the vote day before yesterday. And that the white woman suffered, including the leading one, Susan B. Anthony, when she and the sufferers had tried everything to get the vote. But finally, they got the vote. She said, and this struck home, in a nation, well, no white women can vote. Some black men can vote. Then they considered giving the vote. A class struggle unfolded in Europe over and above the class struggle outlined by Karl Marx and one in unfolded in the United States over and above the one outlined by Karl Marx. So what is at issue now, and what was at issue in the 1600s, was not a fight for anybody's freedom at all, but the freedom of a given class to exercise its authority over the lower classes. This is why you are confused with Russia and the United States me. The assumption is that one of the giants <coughs> is on the side of the working class. I have no compunction in admitting that the work of Cuba, China, and the Soviet Union is far better off than he was before the revolutionary change in that country and would be worse off under capitalist U.S. That's no big admission. But when the United States and Russia, when the leaders meet, they are not discussing that. They are discussing power. And when they talk about us, if they talk about us at all, meaning African people, if they discuss African people at all, the discussion is who will rule over them. Now, in the 1600s, the question of Slavery is settled. It is a foregone conclusion that all Europeans are for it. But the question <coughs> is which one of them will have what part of the power? 
Now, Portugal and Spain had led in the business because the Portuguese had been more skillful at papal politics, the politics of the Catholic Church because the Portuguese are a small nation lacking in manpower but not lacking in the skillful use of such manpower as is God. The Portuguese had extended themselves beyond their capacity to govern. They had already established such enclaves in Asia. Even on the shores of India. And the Portuguese seeing the Spaniards getting a large hunk and feeling themselves out of things, a little too much out of it, and not too clear about the lines of demarcation laid down by the Pope when he had said, you take the East and you take the West and you two good Catholic nations start fighting among yourselves. Not too clear about who took the East and who was going to take the West. Now you have to understand what I'm talking about. The Pope divided up the world. He told the Pope, you take one, piece, one half and the Spanish, you take the other half. I know it taxes the imagination, but this is what happened. And they didn't, they knew it was ambiguous, ambiguous. So nobody goes up, go back to it and say, Your Grace, what side am I supposed to take? <laughs> so the assumption was that the Spaniards would take the West, or the would take the East. Instead of asking the Pope to clarify the whole thing, <coughs> they can argue among themselves. So then the Portuguese start feeling the sharp change. That was the Treaty of Tartasellas. And the Treaty of Tartasellas gave Portugal Brazil. Now, Portugal has so much territory. It has more territory than it can handle. Brazil is a subcontinent. Portugal hasn't even got the manpower to walk over Brazil, <coughs> let alone rule it. Now, Portugal has to scrape the bottom of its own battle, manpower-wise. <coughs> Now, Portugal brings in to Brazil because they need white faces now with guns. They bring some Portuguese who hadn't been treated too well at home and who were very low class. And these Portuguese, they get their CDs out from slaves and flush, flush women, Indian women. They have beauty all the former and all the vegetation, beautiful birds and land and forests and riches as far as the eye can see. So someone said, behold, all of this is for the mother country. Mother country hadn't done much for me. <laughs> this is mine. Now you have two Portuguese. You 
have a Portugal in Brazil, you have a Portugal in Lisbon. You have something else, you have two Portuguese slave trades. You got a slave trade catering to Brazil, you got a slave trade catering to Lisbon. Literally, you've got two Portuguese colonialism. Now, because, as I've emphasized before, <coughs> for the first 150 years, very few white women were brought to the new world. The Portuguese didn't abstain. He wasn't selling. So he asked permission of the Catholic Church to marry the African woman. And not just to shack up or have concubinage, although there was a lot of that. Legal marriage took place. The African woman insisted not only on legal status, but once married to the Portuguese man, she would be automatically free. And she began to maneuver for the freedom of her relatives or members of her respective tribe. Now, a group of free Africans began to develop. And when they moved into the hinterland, she <coughs> convinced large numbers of Portuguese that there was no way of containing these Africans. So therefore, some of them had to be free. So now you have an early, basically free population, then a large number of Africans <coughs> landing in Brazil, bypassed the auction block, went straight to the forest and hills, and whenever slaves. Now you see the origin of the Colombo, the free African community, in Brazil, the Africans who insisted on not becoming slaves. Later, these Africans would escape slaves. Paris would last 110 years. And it would be democratic. In fact, this is the key to his downfall. It was democratic to white people and did not know that they were spies. set up for a government is to be minded to study the structure of Palmeiras. <coughs> is to study the imagination and the durability of the African away from home, pitting his mind against terrible circumstances. The movie Colombo is merely a Kind of for the truth. The character Zumbe was a real character, real life. Wasn't a fictional character. He lived. He built a state. He was a man who never read a book, wore a stove on shoe. So, modern city built a state that lasted 110 years and left this revolutionary stamp on Brazil to today when you think of honor and dignity among the African people of Brazil, when you think of manhood. They think of something. In this hemisphere, in the hemisphere, that hemisphere, may be greater than the Haitian achievement, is the achievement of the Independent Republic of Panama before the American Revolution. Long 
before the American Revolution. Almost a hundred years before the American Revolution. America the first republic? No. America's the first republic. In the 1600s. But these are the things that's unfolded, the drama after 1600s. All right. Not all of them good. 1600s in the Caribbean Islands, another drama unfolded. The greatest economic exploitation is in Haiti and in Jamaica. Principally because these countries are the area where you have the most developed plantation systems in the whole of the new world. And their return and one third of the economy that goes one third of the goods service and the financial return to go to Europe is coming out of Haiti and Jamaica. Now, because these are the most exploited colonies, and among the Spanish colonies, Cuba is about a third. Now, you can understand with the absentee land laws demanding more and more profit of the slaves here are more exploited. Now, the period of Haiti is over. It's, it was, it's now called Haiti. It was originally called Hispaniola. The Hispaniola period is over. Father de las Casas has lived and died now. Father de las Casas came over on the third ship of Christopher Columbus. When Christopher Columbus discovered two diseases and exploitation. <coughs> Brooding. The Indians were dying in such wholesale manner that they had even killed our labor supply. He went to Father Julius Cassis and proposed the enslavement, decrease the enslavement of the African in order to save the souls of the Indians. Father de las Casas agreed and went to the Pope to get permission for the increase. Remember now, the Pope was the arbitrator of everything. Now, we'll explain the British entry, because once the British entry, this is going to interfere with this whole thing. The Pope agreed and sent a commission to look into the disappearance of the Indian. Rapidly disappearing. And many times when he went to St. Islands, there wasn't one Indian left, so-called Indian. <coughs> now we know that that's not their proper name, but that's for the sake of conversation. Now, my main point in focusing here is that if there were anything in doubt after 1600, the doubt was over. Africa was in the tragic trap of slavery. It wasn't going to get out for the next 300 years. Europe was coming out of the Middle Ages and it was going to come out using slavery as the economic means of coming out. They were going to use Christianity, but that was going to be a bogus rationale. But they were going to practice no, none of it. In fact, some of the slave captains would profess devout Christianity. And some would even write hymns. The famous hymn, How Sweet the <coughs> Sound of the Name of Jesus Sound, was written by a slave, captain of a slave.
leadership, waiting off the coast of West Africa for the tide, for high tide, so we can sail away with this ship full of slaves. Now I know it's a contradiction, we ain't all contradiction, but it's a fact also. Now, 1600, all of this is now a fact of history, and nobody's dealing with sentiment. And the church has been modified, at least the teachings have been modified to justify this criminal act. See, you're going to have to study again the life of Henry VIII. And what this man was about. <clears throat> he laid the foundation for the Church of England. And the Church of England pulling away from Catholicism freed England's hand, freed England from going to the Pope and asking the permission. And now, once England's hand is free, England would ask, show me the clause in Adam's will that says I'm not entitled to my share of the black gold in the back. In France, Francis of France would ask, uh, who gave the Pope the right to give away people in kingdoms that didn't belong to him in the first place? Why well, France, a Catholic nation, is at odds with the Catholic state, the faithful. For some reason, which I'm not too clear on, but it was not until the period of Cardinal Russian that France had a rationale to go into the slave trade. And we need to study this old bullet rascal again. And the role of the church in furnishing a rationale for the trade. Now, France is in the business. England is in the business. The Scandinavians are in the business. And we've forgotten them. The Swedes are in the business. The Portuguese have built the great, the most awesome and the largest of the slave fortress, Elmina. The French had built Gore, first built by the Portuguese. They're building permanent fortifications along the coast to hold the slaves until the ships come by. They're calling these places factories. They're luxurious quarters on top of these factories where these slave buyers and captains live in luxury. Even a separate secret, separate corridor what the women, they want to violate that night, parade in the courtyard and they pick out the one they want for the night when she comes to the separate corridor of the the trap door. I've even gone to and see all the trap the, the trap doors and you know and, and, and when she's pregnant sometimes instead of sitting on the next load, she's kept there and there was a little village in and around the fort. In and around near the every fort. And some of them 
these offsprings ended up engaging in the business themselves of being clerks and collaborators in the local business. Now, in Ghana, there was a slight exception. These families grew up and nearly all became loyal by the end pledge allegiance to, uh, to Ghana, their the descendants. And when the German missionaries came, the Randolphs, and the Lutheran missionaries came first to Ghana, while at home. And the Lutheran missionaries nearly always married into the bastardized African families. And yet, all of them, not a single one, ever turned against the African side of their family in favor of the European side of the family. Sierra Leone is a much different situation where you have a distinct class, Creole class, it holds itself aloof and separate from the African. To this day, while in Ghana, they mingled, they mixed. And many of them became some of the best servants and the patriarchs Ghana ever had. In fact, the father of present day Ghana, Ghanaian politics in the 20th century, was one of them, Case the Hayford. And all of the men of that group, almost to me, without any exception, married uh, dark complexion African women. Ghana is the rare exception. There was very little of this in Nigeria. Uh, quite, you know, uh, quite a lot of people. City of the city the dumping ground for the British slaves. We'll get, we'll get to that a little later. It was also the dumping ground for a whole lot of uh, unwanted blacks in the United States after the American Revolution. A large number of blacks that went to Nova Scotia. But we'll, that's, that's some other discussion or some other time. But we're trying to get to is the aftermath of 1600 and what 1600 would set in motion that would be federated to this very to this very day patterns of slavery that will become patterns of colonialism that will become patterns of stratification <coughs> that, that today affects Jamaica, Sirion, Barbados, other nations in the Caribbean. These patterns were set up then and wasn't, wasn't broken. All right, now, the British entry into the business really started in Linus, with Henry VIII's only child, he might have had some that didn't survive. <coughs> Remember the lady whose head he cut off? Annie Bellin? Yeah. She did give him one child. Why he cut her head off? I don't know the others that did not. She was accused of being unfaithful. I know why, I know, I know that part. But at least she delivered a child. The other one didn't deliver a child. Well, he, he had an earlier version of simplest, what the British call it God. How they get God out of that, I don't know. But that's, that's, but, um, we don't have time to discuss the fact that Sibyl started in the royal family. <laughs> it was once called the royal 
disease. <laughs> and, and some of the women discovered this. There was no cure at that time. They began to refuse you know, cohabitation based on that suspicion. I would thought he might, in his rage, you know, cut one of their, those heads off instead of the one who had given him the child. It was Elizabeth, the so called virgin queen, who uh, being told of the slave trade, rejected it at first, and finally someone showed a legend for the profit that could be made that she invested some of her personal money in the trade, in the ship. The good ship Jesus. That was the name of the ship. And the coat of arms of the ship was two Africans bound back to back and Captain Hawkins headed the ship and she led England into the business of slavery and England entered the business with the vengeance now where was England all this time remember the business was 150 years old before England got into it. And England had been running errands for the Portuguese and the Spaniards, literally delivering slaves to different ports for them. In the meantime, England had been studying the ships, studying the routes, doing what she wanted to do, and extracting the information she needed. But when England discovered something, drove the Portuguese out of West Africa, Portuguese now on the gold in the Congo, subsequently, and gold up, and subsequently into East, East Africa concurrent with being the last phase in the Congo. Now you have competition between the various powers. The Scandinavians along the coast become middlemen, except the Dutch became middlemen too. Gun sales won them and end the life. But if you look at a map of Europe, you can understand why the Scandinavians didn't last in the business. All of the Swedes had built Christenberg and others had built Fort along the coast. But when they have to go home for supplies, they got to go way up the top of Europe. When the Spaniards and the Portuguese go home, they go right up the side of West Africa and, and they're home. So they can get supplies and soldiers quicker the other nations so they can facilitate that business because they're in a direct line to what the business is, is, is occurring. And at first, now we're talking about two businesses now. We're talking about the development of the slave trade along the coast of West Africa. <coughs> we're talking about the opening up of the new world by the Spanish conquest of Jordan, from an expropriation. Now we try to explain the fact that there were large numbers of Africans with the Spanish conquest of Jordan. And these were not raw laboring Africans. And most of them did not come from Africa. Now we have to explain why so many skillful Africans were with the Spanish conquistadors. 
Where did they come from? They didn't come from Africa. Now, the wheat farmer with cartels, what did he do? He had to be skillful, literally introduced wheat farming in, in the hemisphere. Well, where was he planting wheat before he got here? What planting it in Africa? Not that wheat was unknown to Africa, but he wasn't the no wheat farmer in Africa. And yet he was wheat farming someplace and he had some, he, because he had to the skill. The first Africans enslaved, not so much enslaved, but recruited for labor with the Spanish conquistadors came from the Mediterranean Africans who had gone there with the Africans in the Arab conquerors of Spain and the Mediterranean. So now the European turning on these Africans first. Once the Europeans got power, the first African he saw was the African on his side. Not the African in Africa, but the African who's been there all along. The Moors. So there was an African army with the Pizarro in Peru. I mean, this man was an expert ammunition repair. He wasn't working in that. There was Alonzo Mino, who Christopher Columbus is a lead chip for power. He wasn't a part of the African ships. He had experience, otherwise he wouldn't have had that job. I checked Spanish records and he was a Christian African who had stayed on in, in Spain after the Africans lost their power. His family stayed on because they didn't have to be told to convert to Catholicism or die because they had given up Islam and already converted to Catholicism long before the Inquisition, long before they were threatened with death. They didn't have to be threatened with death. But they were Christians already. By the time this occurred, many Muslims were converted to Christians and stayed on in Spain after the Africans and the Arabs lost Spain. So if you keep on, you're going to explain Othello. Most people they say they can't explain Othello because they can't explain an African general, head of a European army. They can't they say, this is fantasy, no fantasy. There were African generals head of European armies because the Africans had that would have been 800 years. European economy was depressed, the military was depressed. That was the African gentleman that defeated El Cid. We can have a hard time imagining, well, how can you, you imagine the African gentleman defeated El Cid, then, then look at African slavery? Then how then can you imagine an African empire inside of Africa that lasted 200 years after the slave trade had started? But it happened, <coughs> it's a fact, it happened. The documents are there. You have to look at the totality of things. But once you look at the totality of things, you go into contradictions. And the idea is that if you've got an African independent state with armies and ambassadors and communication inside Africa, and a few hundred miles away, you got the slave trade started, question, why didn't he help? He go and help the other. One go and help the other. I want to go drive the slave traders into the sea. It's an interesting question to ask. Then you have to know something about what kind of communication existed between that one and the other one. Then you enter a modern African, a medieval African tragedy that parallel modern African tragedy. Sometimes today's communication is 
between the African states who are made of Genesis 5. Now, as you get into the, into, further into the 1600s, the drama is getting worse because as you move into the 1600s, the slave trade is getting worse. The 17th is going to be the worst single center of the business. And the inkling of life is going to appear in the 18th, in the 1800s. But yet in the midst of all of this, Africa is going to produce some valid men, heroic men. And women too. And Zinga will be fighting the last of her wars against the Portuguese in the 1600s. Just a little after the 1600s. About 1663. She will be fighting the last of these monumental wars. And she will either win or lose, pitting her army now against Portuguese might and Dutch guns. This last of the great female warriors of that period who go down to defeat. After fighting the Portuguese, 51 of her 80, 52 of her 81 years. Since the beginning of the trade, there was no period when there was some form of mounted resistance in some parts, in several parts of Africa and in the Caribbean. Now, while all of this drama, is unfolding in Africa, in the Caribbean, and in South America. The first generation of Africans in the United States, in a formal sense, in a formal sense, the first generation is just about the end date. Because the blacks in the United States were late in when they arrived, but they did not arrive until 1619. One year before the Mayflower. So now, from now that we're after 1600. We see the drama and unfold. We also see some traps being set that the African is not going to get out of. He is not totally out of to this very day. In the next session, we will move into a period where his resistance would be more successful than when slavery would reach a saturation point, meaning that everybody could want one but have one. Everybody could afford one but have one. Then the system would become unwieldy. And then the unwieldy nature of the system the British would begin to get a cheap reputation for abolitionism that they do not deserve. And a whole lot of people have not examined the fact that most British abolitionists were famous. And some Americans too. Most people who would accept them 
Bishop Wilberforce and Randall Shaw would not examine the black abolitionists at all, who in most cases were sincere, had to be still sincere, because no fakery at all could possibly be been accepted from them. But so much has been left out of history because the truth sometimes don't catch on in history. And the fakery is intriguing. That's unfortunate. I had an encounter like this in Detroit yesterday with the Egyptian African, the um, uh, you know, uh, the African, the African, African, out the African, the African, the out of this thing. So we don't, we left them out because sometimes they're, they're Arabized Africans. So when you come under the influence of Africa, take a whole lot of culture and techniques from Africans to the point you become Africanized and you still call your achievement Africa. Identify the achievement you took from Africa as Africa. Achieve something in relationship to you. Could the reason that 
they do not help those people who are being enslaved be the difference in the concept of slavery that they held as opposed to uh, the type of slavery that Europeans were imposing on the Africans? Yes, yes, the difference between this concept. Now, when we get a little later, we will talk about Madame Tannaboo because Madame Tannaboo was in the business and she was selling slaves. And after a while, she asked, when will some of them come back? <laughs> because she thought she was recruiting people to go and labor. And once the labor was over, they would come back. And she discovered these people are not coming back. <laughs> and then she turned on the business and fought to destroy the entire business all along the coast of Liberia, Nigeria. And, to, and, and she would war on anybody else in the business, including the kings. And I last talked with the king of Abakuda. And her husband had died, and she, uh, there was a man pursuing her hand. And she said that uh, I have a uh, man's work to do, and I have no time play around with these female traits. When I finish man's work, I will consider being a woman. Now she threw, after she forced this king off the throne, then she turned to, to the man to swing her hand, considered it, married him, settled down it place in Nigeria called Joe's. Why Joe's out there, you know. <laughs> I'm saying this, that's, this is personal, mainly because <clears throat> Joe's is so hot. <laughs> There's a special sun that shines and hits <laughs> my Thank you very much. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about that period which shaped the United States and made it what it is. One of the reasons you don't understand nations, you don't understand the intention in the foundation of the nation and who the nation was made for and how it was shaped. I'm going to deal with the period 1776, the American Revolution and aftermath. I'm going to end on the eve of the Civil War. This is the period when the intention of the nation was shaped to be what it is today. You have a lot of assumptions about this nation because you have not understood how it was shaped and who shaped it and what they shaped it Fall. All right, let's look at the American Revolution and see what the American Revolution was about. It was not about the liberation of anybody. 
It was a family dispute between a younger branch of English-speaking people and an older branch of English-speaking people. And the younger branch seemed to have had enough energy to win the war after almost losing the war. Now, how did the American Revolution come about? England was so involved in wars, wars at sea, internal religious wars. England had just become a Protestant country that had not settled down. England was in turmoil and could not hold all of its outer flank colonies intact. Now, while there had already been a revolt in its black colonies, Jamaica, and in the outer colonies of the Caribbean, they did not have the military support to bring off a complete revolt that will free them from British domination. And besides, not being white, they did not have access to ammunition from, from Europe, other European nations, and did not have sympathy from other European nations, themselves slaveholders. Remember now, during the American Revolution, Lafayette came from France. Laflamme, the French architect, came later to design the city of Washington, left in a huff and a brilliant black mathematician who was looking over his shoulders, Benjamin Banneker, remembered the plans, put them together, and really Benjamin Banneker, not LaFlante, is responsible for the design of Washington, D.C., one of the few American cities original design for some kind of traffic. If you look at Washington, the center of Washington, you can see the streets can take traffic. The smaller streets in these outer areas, that wasn't in the original plan. So now in the shaping of the United States, let's look, the British colony that is going to become the United States. You had a series of colonies, 13 different colonies with 13 different flags, all approving of slavery. Now, in the lower south, where the worst of the scum of England was dumped, out of prisoners, out of work houses, ladies of the evening and the night too, <laughs> slavery was forbidden for a while. These were debtors and prisoners and, and the like. What you cannot understand is that Europe dumped its human garbage can into the so-called New World. The worst of that garbage can came to the United States. We inherited the worst of Europe. Not that, in, that there were flowers other places. Now, in the New England state, some of the English came to escape persecution. Some of them were people of means, mostly in the southern states, people trying to better their condition. Large number of them were indentures. All right, I'm getting to the point, and the point is, where did we fit into all of this? What had happened 
to the Africans in the United States between 1619 and 1776. Let's focus on 1776 because during that period on the eve of the revolution there had been contact between the Caribbean free man and the black free man of New England. And if you look at the biography, Ruswam, Jamaica, Prince Hall, Barbados, Robert Campbell, Jamaica again, Peter Ogden, Antigua, if you look at the biography of all of these Caribbean people, not one called themselves a West Indian. Everyone thought of himself as an African person away from Africa and saw the plight of one African person identical with that of other African people. All right, now the revolution comes. The alleged hero, I'm using the word advisedly, the alleged first man to give his life in the American Revolution was Christopher, Christopher Adams. All right, I would not take a black hero out of history unless I got ten to replace him. I'm going to put him in proper perspective. Christopher Adams, drinking with his Irish cut buddies, hanging out, everybody boasting about what they're going to do to the British. And he just stumbled out of the bar ahead of the rest of them <laughs> and caught a bullet and got into his <laughs> world's great accidental hero. All right. Because white people say so many bad things about us, it's not true. When they say something good, it's not true. So we might as well let it ride. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Christmas Addicts, <laughs> of course, was one of the early casualties to the preface to the American Revolution, but as a matter of historical fact, the revolution hadn't started when he was killed. So to say that he was the first to die in the American Revolution is stretching a point. He did die, all right, let's give him all the honor due, do him. But he didn't die in the American Revolution because there was no revolution at the time. Okay, there were other black heroes in the American Revolution, and I wouldn't take him out unless I was going to put them in. There were genuine heroes in the American Revolution. So at first, Washington didn't accept black Americans in the American Revolution. But there were several families, the Brazilla Lou family, the descendants still alive, some in Chicago and some around Boston. I've actually talked to someone on the telephone and uh, greeted those in Chicago. Because they were light complected, Washington couldn't tell where they belong. So they fought right straight through the American Revolution. But now, the second brutal winter, Washington turned to a black friend, James Fotan. James Fortan was a tent maker and might be the first black uh, middle class uh, person of considerable wealth. And he told Fortan of the difficulty of the last winter and he looked at some of the heavy wax matter tent cloth and he said the tent cloth you are using is much better than the cloth in our britches. Now, Jim, suppose you make some britches out of that cloth 
And the breaches made by James Fortan helped to save Washington's army during the second and the third, the last winters of the American Revolution. Peter Salem saved his life at one point near the end of the revolution. There was an attempt to poison Washington and Francis Tavern. Francis, who, Samuel Francis, who owned the tavern, tavern still exists, down around Wall Street area, was of Caribbean descent, a Caribbean free man. And his daughter, Phoebe, noticed the, um, the attempt to poison Washington because that's where Washington went to eat. And she told Washington's intelligence, and that saved Washington's life. Okay, Washington took a liking to Francis. Francis, after Washington became president, and he became steward to Washington. And Francis, being a good cook and restaurant man, began to invite people to the White House to have special food on Washington's birthday. This is the origin of Washington's birthday. By this Caribbean restaurant man. Now, because he was light-complected, the assumption is that he was white. There is no proof that he was white. His daughter, Phoebe, seemed to have taken more from her mother's side. And it was much question that she belonged to us. Well, she saved Washington's life and when some major tried to play up to her romantically to cover up the secret of the attempt to poison Washington, she wouldn't buy that angle. All right. Now, the second year of the war, Washington began to accept blacks in the army. And they began to distinguish themselves in a number of the battles in the American Revolution. A woman, Deborah Gannett, disguised as a man and fought in the American Revolution, a black woman, nine months. And when they discovered, discovered her and discharged her, with a pension, all this is recorded, <laughs> they gave her a certificate of virtue. I'm saying that that was the worst thing they could have done for her because her virtue wasn't even being questioned. <laughs> and she didn't need the certificate. No one had thought about that one way or the other. She, she had to have same quarters with men and same bathing facilities with men and for that nine months they said that she behaved like a lady and kept herself in a manner befitting the best of ladies i don't know why they had to say that they had to left it alone nobody would have thought about it but be that as it may be that as it may this was an outstanding black woman in the american revolution also of mixed parentage. Now we have to do something which we haven't done. We haven't made an assessment of Africans of mixed parentage who were great patriarchs for our cause and who went on the other side with their light complexion and brought back secrets that damn near saved us in many occasions. We have been dealing with the cop-outs so much, we haven't even dealt with those who endanger their very lives 
in behalf of the black side of the family. Now, there were a number of others in the American Revolution, and my main point is that we fought in this war, and having fought in the war, we got nothing out of that either. When Washington proposed to some of these families that they send someone to fight in the war, when some of these aristocratic families did not want to send one of their sons, they sent a slave instead. And they sent the slave with the promise that after the war, the slave would be free. Now, while we know so much about this, there is an almost classical book with a title that offends me a little bit called The Negro in Colonial New England by Lorenzo Turner. Now, and yet it's the best documentation on the subject, the most scholarly documentation could be Benjamin Quarles, The Negro in the American Revolution. But here you have case histories of blacks who fought in the American Revolution. It is from one of these case histories that I get the story of Manny's Sam. This black New Englander fought in the American Revolution. His master, he was a slave, his master was probably named Manny, and Sam is the only name they gave him. So he fought in the American Revolution. No doubt he endeared himself to his white comrades who taught him how to read and write while he was in the army. When he came out and they tried to re-enslave him, he took it to court. And all of the veterans who had fought with him came from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and all the states around to be moral support during the trial. All he needed was moral support. But with his rough-hued language that they had taught him, now he could read and write. He petitioned the Massachusetts court for his citizenship and his right to be a free man. And his petition is a great piece of American literature that could be printed separate and distinct from the trial and read as a piece of literature. Along the same line was the work of Amos Fortune, whose life started in the American Revolution, but who um, continued and was a vestiment in a white church after the American Revolution. All right, we have been the people who made the first overtures to get along with other people. Now let's see what went wrong and how it went wrong. The making of the Constitution. It is now the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. Now, who made the Constitution? Who were they talking about? What were their intentions in the making of the Constitution? Now, because we dream so much we do not understand that the American dream was never dreamed for us. The American promise was never made to us. And if you face this reality, you might understand what you have to do. Now, they're making a constitution. <laughs> 52 days of deliberation in Philadelphia. They produce a two or three page document. 
Jefferson wants to bring up the problem of slavery. Benjamin Franklin tells him, don't open this can of peas. Jefferson, a double-dealing liar, he writes so eloquently about liberty in the Constitution, he's had liaisons with several black women and had several children by black women, Sally Hamas being the most consistent one. I think he had seven children by her. And if you go to Monticello, the Jefferson home, I talked about this so much they close, they close off that stairway. There's a, sta <laughs> there's a stairway leading from his bedroom to her bedroom. And yet, Jefferson talks so much about liberty and justice and democracy, he never freed Sally Hamas, the slave woman who bore him seven children. See, democracy for us was tainted from the beginning. Now, in the making of the Constitution, the southern makers of the Constitution had a large non-voting constituency. Now, the southerners were elected based on that constituency. They would not give the southerner full credit for the slave, so they declared the slave to be three-fifths of a man. There is nothing in American literature, there is nothing in the amendments to the American Constitution that ever said you are a whole human being. Every black man, including me, who ever paid taxes is paying taxes under false pretenses. We should never have paid any taxes because it was taxation without representation, and still is. Now, in the whole concept of three-fifths of a man, many Southerners came to office based on the fact they had so many slaves in that constituency, though non-voting. So we see now, the nation is shaping itself. Now in essence, who was the nation shaped for? And remember this, and I'll repeat it if you don't understand it. This nation was made for originally free white Protestant males, middle class and up, those who agree with the prevailing political status quo and who own property. And when they say in this country, liberty and justice for all, that is the all they are talking about. And they are not talking about women, they're not talking about Catholics, and they are not talking about Jews. Now you can play behind and be a servant to the power of the white male Protestant, but he will always be the dominant power in the country until he acknowledge and put in law in action that this country was meant for someone else other than himself. When someone asks, recently whether the Constitution still prevails, Robert Harris, a professor at Cornell, asked, I hope, say, I hope not. I hope it don't still prevail. I hope there have been some changes. <laughs> All these amendments, they still mean what they said originally. 
The president means what they said originally. This debate over this judge is what they said originally. But there are non-Protestants, whites, or pseudo-whites, who many times get a leverage by supporting the Gentile establishment and by rendering a service managing us. And they endear themselves to the Gentile establishment to the extent they keep us in line. Now you see where it started. Now you can see what other ethnic groups come in and manage your community, manage your stores, while the government even give them money to assist them in doing it. And while you are not the resident entrepreneurs in your own community. Now I believe you can take back all of this community, any community, once you're organized to do so, and once you understand the global importance of African people in the world, you could actually do it. But you're so mesmerized by other people, you assume there's something magic about running a store, <laughs> marketing food, and turning wheels in clocks and mechanics. And you forget that you did it first before they had shoes or lived in houses that had windows. What people make you forget, especially what you was, and your historical memory generally controls you right now. Okay. The revolution is over. Where are we? In the South, still slaves. There are some free blacks in the South, terribly restricted. No vote, no public accommodation. There are some free blacks in New England, really, where the voice of the free blacks got heard. But among those heard the most, Prince Hall and his African Lodge, the first black Masonic order. Now blacks are beginning to organize. They're beginning to express themselves in poetry. They're beginning to express themselves in the slave narrative. They're beginning to question whether they to go to the side door or the balcony of churches. Soon, Richard Allen, James Varick would challenge the white church and they would find the AME. Now the independent black church is on the way. You've got independent thinkers now. And we are approaching the 1800s, and as we approach the 1800s, we have the semblance of a church organization, the semblance of literary organization, the semblance of a protest movement. Now, as we came into the 1800s, let's look at that first half of the 19th century. Because this, in my opinion, was the most dynamic period in the history of black America. It was the most dynamic period because these blacks were clear about what they wanted to do and what they had to do than you are right now. They didn't have a whole lot of hang-up illusions that you've got right now. They weren't thinking about integration. 
They were thinking about surviving as a people. In the late 90s, 1790s, a sea captain began to take blacks back to Africa using his own ships. Now can you imagine now a sea captain with three ships doing trade on the sea of the world in the 1790s and today we don't even own a decent rowboat? A master sailor with other sailors at his disposal. Now as we came into the 1800s, more slaves escaping from the South, the birth of the slave narrative, a special kind of American literature, finally the Douglas School, Frederick Douglass, we began publications, but 1800 itself, the first massive slave revolt, Gabriel Prosser in the Carolinas. Now you're beginning to see organization, along with this kind of organization will be a different organization in the North. People are coming together. Martin Delaney, Frederick Douglass, the great minister Henry Highland Garnett. Poets are coming together, especially the great woman poet, Elaine Wilkins Harper, Phyllis Whitley's period, and I don't dwell on that because I'm not a great Phyllis Whitley. Fan. I thought she misread history itself, but be that as it may. The importance of Phyllis Whitley is that she wrote. Women wasn't writing much poetry during that period, good or bad. The fact that she wrote fair poetry. And there are some atrocious lines in some of them. One that turned me off is that I'm glad God took me from my pagan land, taught my pagan heart to understand. She didn't come from no pagan land. Africa was no pagan land. In her tribute to George Washington and to some lord. Well, the fact that I'm not a Felix Whitley fan is established, so I can go on. <laughs> But during this period, a slave on Long Island produced the first cynical poem. And the poem went, my old master promised me when he died, he let me, set me free. Lived so long his head got bald, got out of notion of dying at all. <laughs> So this is the beginning of cynicalism in black poetry. <laughs> so I didn't believe it. <laughs> I, just, I don't believe the thing. All right, now, the black founding fathers, as against the white founding fathers, that Lerone Bennett writes about so beautifully in his work before the Mayflower, and the thing about Lerone Bennett as against John Hope Franklin, John Hope Franklin packs in a lot of historical information. But John's writing is so dull, I didn't say it's incorrect. <laughs> it turns you off. Lerone Bennett is not as scholarly as John Hope Franklin, but Lerone Bennett makes the language sing. And he don't turn you off a bit. You read all it. Pick up his book. You read the whole thing. John Hope, you go to, go to sleep with you know, all these facts so 
packed on, you know, without, without interesting explanation. But I think in, um, in Lerone Bennett's work, before the Mayflower, in, in another work called The Shaping of Black America, the first two chapters, White Servitude, in the second chapter, First Generation, dealing with the first blacks to be brought to the United States. All right, now, let's look at the early period of Douglas. Let's look at the black giants, the people that Lerone Bennett called the black founding fathers. Better men, stronger men, true to democratic promise than the white founding fathers. Douglas Allen, who found the independent black church along with James Barrick, the founders of our large organization, Prince Hall, the role of then of the Caribbean free men who came to the, the United States, the nationalist writings of Martin Delaney, sometimes referred to as the father of black nationalism, he said that to Douglas, I'm glad God made me a black man. And Douglas, who was part white, said, I'm just glad God made me a man. All right. Now we're into the period where we found it, we're finding our voices. We're into the period when Douglas would write his famous narrative. Other slave narratives would be written. Now there's another famous slave revolt, this time in Virginia. Denmark Vesey, a black free man who had known languages. An unfortunate circumstance would literally hold up the revolt. When you study slave revolts in this country, this was the best planned slave revolt. Everything worked against it. The horses that were supposed to be in one place stampeded and wasn't in the place to take the men to another place. Rain and the bridge got washed out, and they couldn't contact the people on the other side. The circumstances tend to work against him. His secret keepers, while they kept the secret, they themselves couldn't connect. Yet when they caught him and tried to force a confession out of him, he told them nothing. And from his silence came the spiritual. He never said a mumbling word. In other words, he didn't give nobody's name away. Now, black expression is taking a new turn. It would take a dramatic turn, 1829. Here we need to pause a little bit because this is a neglected aspect of our history. David Walker, an escaped slave, who owned a second-hand clothing store and a pawn shop, began to write an appeal to the colored people of the world. Now, David Walker could well be the first pan-Africanist in literature not to the colored people of the United States, to the colored people of the world. And if you listen to the record 
that Malcolm X made last, one of them, called Message to the Grassroots, and read David Walker's appeal. David Walker was the forerunner of a Malcolm X. David Walker appealed to all blacks to take up arms against that slave master and to take your chances because continuing in slavery was a more difficult chance than gambling with your life with the hope of freedom. Now, David Walker's appeal enhanced some people and frightened some other people. Douglas did not associate himself with the appeal, though Douglas wanted freedom and thought there were less violent means to obtain it. David Walker, owning a secondhand clothing store where many of the sailors would come and pawn their winter clothes in the fall, uh, in the spring, and pick them up in the fall. When he wrote his appeal, he would put a copy in the pockets of these sailors. And this is how the appeal got to England. Someone opened a copy and took it to an Englishman who published it. Now the appeal is becoming worldwide. And David Walker would mysteriously die soon after. Remember something that I've said repeatedly. Any time a black man shows his people the real face of power and what to do about it in this country, he's either driven into exile, driven to suicide, or assassinated. And there is no exception. You can trace it from the death, the mysterious death of Dave, David Walker to the death of Martin Luther King. There were some lesser known ones who died, who got killed, that didn't come to public notice. But one of three things are going to happen to you in this country if you show your people the real face of power and what to do about it. Now, so long as King was advocating nonviolence and sticking to that, he was comparatively safe. But when he engaged in sympathy for a garbage strike and began to advocate a poor people's march on Washington uniting blacks and whites, this is the basis of political power. You're now challenging this nation in its direction. And we should have put a guard around him 24 hours a day, all sharpshooters, and somebody to watch the guards. <laughs> we are people lacking in suspicion, overly trusting, nearly always the wrong people. Well, we treated them as guests at first. In this trait we still have, many times we are kinder to the outsider than we are to the members of the family. This is a good trait properly use. When you want to find the strongest thing about a people, which is their concept of humanity, and that's one of the strongest things about us, the flip side of the strongest thing is also the weakest thing about you. You didn't watch who you were entertaining. You didn't watch who, was the, who you were inviting to dinner. All right, the next revolt 
to frighten the slaveholders would be the Nat Turner Revolt, Hamilton Rose, Virginia. Also a well-planned revolt. In the Nat Turner Revolt, his secret keepers were spread across four, na four, four states. And one of the secret keepers was his wife. This is why I took exception to the book, Confessions of Nat Turner, because it made Nat Turner really a weakling lusting after a white woman. And there was nothing in history to prove that that was true. The scene was, the scene was a violation of history. All right. Nat Turner's revolt probably caused more fear in slave owners than any other revolt. And what Nat Turner's revolt was inspired by in part was the revolt in Haiti. Finally, black sailors going between the United States and the Caribbean islands heard that somewhere on an island slaves had revolted and set up a free nation. When that information got back to the United States, some blacks thought they could do the same thing. It was a different lay of land, and given the circumstances, they could not have done the same thing. The fact that they thought they could do the same thing was an act of bravery and an act of courage. In Haiti, you had a black majority. You had Haiti's everlasting hills. And if you go to Haiti and Jamaica, you would wonder how anybody stayed a slave any time. Because you can go up in those hills and you can look down, you can see what's coming up at you, but what's coming up at you can't see you. And some good rocks properly <laughs> tipple down will discourage them. <laughs> and there's plenty of rocks on those he in those hills. And throw down enough big rocks, they'll change their mind. <coughs> because those hills are fortresses and great fortresses. We didn't have that. We didn't have running space. We were on level ground too many times. We didn't have access to the forest. We couldn't get to the hills, although we were in a part of the country that had no appreciable hills. But the Nat Turner Revolt had said something to this nation about the ability of the slave to sustain a long revolt. Finally, when they captured Nat Turner, tried him, the most unique thing Nat Turner did was this bogus confession. In this confession, he told about every member of his group that he knew was dead. And he was absolutely sure he was dead, he would tell it, he'd talk about it. But if he escaped and still alive someplace, he didn't have nothing to say. When this white man who took down the confession, who hated his guts, kept, uh, pumping him for more information, asking him, are you sorry about all of this? You know how many people got killed? He kept emphasizing they were white people. <laughs> and he let, him, let it be known that the consequences of a revolt, some people get killed black and white. And the man persisted and he and Nat Turner in rags, blood dripping all over him with whites tried to beat him to death before he could get the gallows out while they're building the gallows. Finally they took him to the gallows and had the rope around his neck 
and this white man is still pushing him for questions. Don't you think, aren't you sorry about what you did? Do you understand that you're going to die? Nat Turner bravely tilted his head and looked at the fool and said, didn't Christ die? <laughs> that was the end. <laughs> he just went on like a man. No weeping, no crying, no begging, nobody to spare his life at all. He said, didn't Christ die? Then they hung him. <laughs> But he ain't hung no crying man. He ain't hung no man begging for his life. He gave it up for a cause. He understood that before he started, that he would have to give it up. Now, the Nat Turner Revolt brought into being large numbers of laws black codes, all kinds of codes. Douglas's voice is stronger now. A period in black America often forgotten is emerging now. The convention period. What is called the Negro Convention Movement. We have always been and still are the meanest people in this country. <laughs> we began before slavery to call meetings. And those free blacks were calling meetings, debating things. They created a literature, they created a church. Now, they created a convention movement. Let's have a convention. Let's eat and talk. <laughs> and this is what they began to do. Part of the talk was about whether we would stay here or go back to Africa. Out of this talk, would come black association with the American colonization movement. The American colonization movement stretching e even into the South, mostly financed by whites. Frederick Douglass peeped their hand and said, if you whites want to give blacks free trips back to Africa, why don't you free some slaves and give them the trip? I think they would enjoy it more. <laughs> Frederick Douglass saw that they were trying to get the free black out of America, especially the agitators. So Frederick Douglass while not against people going back to Africa, was against the white control colonization movement. If you understand the colonization movement and how it was organized by liberal whites and some hypocritical whites who merely wanted to use the organization as a listening post to feel the pulse of black America, if you understand that, you'll understand the NACP right now. A lot of people think the NACP started out as a black organization. Then you haven't read the history. Started off as a liberal white organization and they invited blacks in on that terms. And they're still mixed up based on the fact that people haven't studied foundation. When you understand what is at the foundation of something, then you can understand its intent. All right. Frederick Douglass would contact John B. Ruswam, the first alleged first graduate from an American college. It was later proven that 
There was another black American who graduated from a college a few months earlier. This is not an important item, which one graduated first or last. But well, anyway, I'm willing to let Russell have the job because he did such a good job in editing Freedom's Journal. And he, the other one didn't do, any, didn't do much for us, and he got lost in the shuffle, and we never know what happened to him anyway. <laughs> Russ Wam made a major contribution to the literature of the argument for freedom. And his place in literature, his place in our literature of liberation is secure. When he stopped editing Freedom's Journal, and decided to go to Liberia as the governor of Cape Palmas province, he established a newspaper, the Liberian Harrow, Harrow, that is still in existence. And his answer to Douglas is that, while I agree with you, that this is a white-run organization and he was sponsored by the Virginia branch of the Colonization Society. At least we have the opportunity to show whites that we can control a nation. Now here is where some mistakes began to be made in relationship to the Western black and Africans, the mistakes still being made. Many of the Christian blacks went to Africa with the attitude they're going to civilize their heathen brothers. Not knowing that the people of Liberia were Mende speaking people people who had brought into being the old empire of Ghana, Mali, and the last of the great African nation states, Sangay. Literally the most civilized Africans on the face of the earth at that time. And here these bunch of fools that a white man's version of Christianity going back to Africa to civilize their heathen brothers who wasn't heathens in the first place, were more civilized than they are in the second place. Now, the American Liberian and the Caribbean Liberian, because they went from, from the Caribbeans and from the United States, mostly church-oriented, and up until the emergence of Sergeant Doe, who's probably a CIA agent, Liberian, as against descendant of America or Caribbean Liberian. Liberia was run poorly by church members. People in the Congress were deacons and the ministers were presiding elders, many that were all church people misunderstanding the African concept of, of spirituality as against the European rehash of African spirituality that he called Christianity. That he began to remake in Europe at the conference at Nicaea. Now this is not what the lecture is about. But we have to understand Africans had a spirituality before Judaism, Christianity, or Islam were interpreted by outsiders. And what we are talking about is out of this great body of spirituality in Africa came Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I'm saying that Africans had the original copy, and they made carbon copies. 
This is why I'm still willing to refer to it as carbon copies of the original spirituality. Because in African religions, it wasn't departmentalized. It wasn't a Sunday thing. It was a thing that ran through the totality of your life and determined everything in your life, including your diet, your wife, and your, your child, your village, where you stayed. It, you didn't go to church on Sunday. You, your religion was a part of your life. Your spirituality was a part of your life all of the time. And in this, Africans respected all living things. Everything with life got respect, including the cockroach, including the tree, including what running water. You go to Egypt today, they had a god of the Nile called Happy. The Catholic Church would later break this down into saints. The African had an overall spiritual force and that God had many helpers. All the Catholic Church did just to call them saints. It's like happy was the God taking care of the now. The woman was the goddess, Newt, taking care of the son. Her job was to take in the sun in the evening, put it in her body, and let it out in the morning. They assigned something to everybody. But that didn't mean that they did not believe in the oneness of the spirituality that men would later call God, then create denominations that would fight among themselves. There wasn't but one, one overall spirituality taking care of everything. Before someone broke it down into religions and denominations. That was probably man's highest hour of spirituality and purity on this earth. Everything had a soul, including the dog or the pig was the highest hour of respect for humanity, too. All right, now let's get back to the end of this first half of the 19th century. What do we have now in motion? We have the embryo of American industry. You have the beginning of the experimentation that's going to be the cotton gin. Ideas taken from blacks. You have cotton in demand in Europe, but Europe is not getting it fast enough. You do not have enough work for the slave to do in the South. The cotton gin is going to change the whole nature of slavery. It's going to make cotton king. Now, by the time the cotton gin was invented, the abolitionists, mostly New Englanders, black and white, had started the campaign for the liberation of the slaves. Now the South would answer them, truthfully, a truth that we're still not willing to deal with. They would tell the New Englander, you sold us to slave, and now you northern abolitionists who took our money for the slave are now telling us to liberate the slave. You, you, now you're showing the slave how to escape you a bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> now on face they were right. The North was a bunch of hypocrites then, a bunch of hypocrites now. <laughs> the, the North could eliminate, could have put enough pressure on the South to eliminate Jim Crow without any fighting, without any civil rights movement. 
and they didn't do it. The North, the industry of the North, the money of the North, was gaining more and more control over the South. Literally a stranglehold on the South. Now the South is beginning to demand a greater share of the wealth of the country. But the way they arranged it, the New Englanders who had produced the industry would refine the raw material, mostly coming from the South. They wanted to keep the South agrarian in farms. They wanted the woods from the South, the hides from the South. But the South partly willing with the agreement that you leave my labor supply alone. That without slaves, I can't even send you the raw material with the same degree of profit that I've been sending it to you. Now the argument is between two branches of English-speaking people. Now if you think white people fought a war for four years, cutting each other apart, for you than it wasn't water you was drinking this morning. <laughs> you just picked up the wrong glass. <laughs> they not only didn't do it, they would not have done it. Slavery was now becoming an emotional issue, an issue for debate between two men who did not believe and said publicly, repeatedly, they did not believe that the slave would ever be the social equal of other people, that he would ever fit into the society. And the person who said it best and said it more often was Abraham Lincoln. Now, on the eve of this catastrophe, some smart Missouri lawyers decided to put to task the escape slave law and the assumption that if a slave went into so-called free territory, he would automatically be free. So they used a slave who had previously put the law to a test without success and who for quite some time was trying to buy his own freedom and had bought the freedom of some other members of his family but had not accumulated sufficient money to buy his own. What looked to be a mild Uncle Tommy's slave called Dred Scott. Dred Scott was an activist against slavery before. Whether those who chose him to make the test case knew it or not is something History hasn't revealed to us. But Dred Scott was no mild, inactive slave, peaceful in slavery. So they went through the trial. The trial got the attention of the whole nation because the way the trial went would determine the condition of slavery in the United States. Finally, the trial is over, and the decision comes from uh, the Chief Justice, Tanny. Who is Tanny? You've got to understand this. Tanny is a second-generation Irish. 
His own family had been indentures, white slaves. Now he is rendering a decision against a black slave. And that decision he rendered in 1857 still holds for this nation. And you'd better remember it. He said, no black man has any rights that a white man is bound to respect. <coughs> that is the global approach between black men and white men this very day. No matter what the law is, you only have those rights he chooses to respect and none he feels bound to respect. That's what Howard Beach was about. That's what the debate with this judge is about. That's what our life in this country is out of kelter with the rest of the lives of people and we are a nation within a nation searching for a nationality. <coughs> no people can free themselves unless they have a nationality, an identity. An Italian would say Italian American, German said German American. He's putting a nationality onto his citizenship. So long as you say American, you're out. I'm a Caribbean person, I'm a Britisher. <laughs> Bridge by way of what? Who made you a Britisher? You wasn't no Britisher when they brought you out of Africa. <laughs> and we were no Americans when they brought us out of Africa. The name of a people must always relate them to land, history, and culture. And any time a people give you their name, if the name fails to respect reflect a relationship to land, history, and culture, you have called them out of their name and they are confused about the role of a people in the world. No people can establish themselves in the world until they relate to land, history, and culture. Over and above that, their slave master chose for them. And so long as they choose a name out of their slave master's culture, they are a slave to their slave master. All right, now, we are approaching the Civil War. The black abolitionist has done great service many times greater than the whites. John Brown has approached Frederick Douglass to join him. Frederick Douglass has refused, not only because it is violent, but he's, he's assuming that if blacks joined him, it would give America an excuse literally to commit genocide against all the blacks. And he could well have been right. John Brown pursues his course that leads to Harper's Ferry and his death. John Brown may well have been the only white person who paid full dues in our club. The rest of them are associate members. John Brown might be a full member. And the only way to be a full member, you got to lay it on the line, and if, if necessary, give it up. 
All right, now we are approaching a period in history when America is made facing a catastrophous civil war that will remake the country. We would, of course, fight in that civil war in large numbers, and we would distinguish ourselves. After the Civil War, we would put down old troubles and pick up some new troubles. And the new troubles are still with us and stayed with us through the end of the second half of the 19th century. That's what the next lecture is going to be about. Thank you very much. Good evening, Dr. John Henry Carr. Let's give him a warm, warm round of applause. Thank you very much. Um, it's been quite some time since I've been here, and I've been all over the country and lecturing at different schools and on what is called Black History Month. And I've decided to call it Africana History Month because one thing about the word black, it tells you how you look, but it don't tell you who you are. And I've said before that the name of a people must relate to land, history, and culture. And the word Africa is embedded in the word Africana. So that means all African people, Caribbean Africans, African Americans, Africans in Africa, and the Africans in the, in the Pacific. One of the reasons why I have missed not being here is because I have been doing a lot of work on spirituality in the last year or so, more than in recent years. And more than in recent years, I've come to believe that our assault on our enemy is going to have to be cultural, spiritual, and physical. It's going to be, have to be physical too, but it's going to have to be cultural and spiritual. And when we speak of spiritual, I'm speaking of the kind of spirituality we had before Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I am not talking about when we had no religion, because we have always had religion. I'm talking about that period of spirituality before someone broke it down into denominations and began to dis start dissensions between people based on who belonged to which one. All right, now, my subject for 
tonight, and this is the ninth in a ten lecture series, just one more lecture to go in, in this ten part series, then I will take some time off to systematically plan the African American series of, of lectures. And it deals with African resistance movement, and my focal point is the 19th century. My focal point is the 19th century because we have to look at the 19th century again, not just in Africa. We have to look at the 19th century again all over the world because the 19th century was the greatest century that we have lived outside of Africa. This was the foundation century. It was the century of the building of the black church. It was the century of the agitation for independence, for uh, uh, agitation against slavery. The first half was the century of agitation against slavery. The first half was also the century when Haiti agitation met Napoleon and drained the French treasury to a point where he had to sell the Louisiana territory when three black men, Toussaint L. Overture, Jesse Lane, Christophe, stood up against this fascist Frenchman and did not yield and, and drained the French treasure to the point he had to sell Louisiana and that territory in order to recoup his money to continue his stupid wars in Europe. Now, Napoleon might be a hero to you, he's an idiot to me. But now, and yet, this country would not be the same except for these three black men who dared to stand up to him and wouldn't let him take Haiti, wouldn't let him re-enslave Haiti. That's the first half of the 19th century. Also the first half of the 19th century in the United States, that was the, that was the century of Frederick Douglass. That was the century of the building of the black church, the rise of the AME church, Central of Babrick and uh, Richard Allen, the century of the Freedom Journal, the first uh, black newspaper, Frederick Douglass's uh, North Star, Douglass's Monthly, the first half of the 19th century in this country, the century of the dynamic black preacher in this country. The sense of a great preacher like Henry Highland Garnett, whose motto he said is resistance, resistance, resistance. I'm saying that while my focal point this evening is on Africa, I could have a focal point any place in the world where there were African people and show you that we were internationally revolutionary during that century. And this was our golden century. And I'm saying that our movements today are weaker because we don't seem to know about it. We have not built successfully on that 19th century all over the world. <laughs> The early part of the 19th century. Now let's see, let's see with the early part of it, and, and, and generally, then I'm going to come back to Africa. I'm dealing with the part outside of Africa, just briefly, to let you know that there's a panoramic sweep of activity all over the world of African people, active. It was the century of the settlement of Liberia. It was the century of the so-called Negro Convention Movement. It was the century when Caribbean activists joined African-American activists and they did not separate.
separate themselves based on who came from what island, or who came from what state, or whose hair had such gradation, or whose father, or whose mother slept with what white man. They didn't separate on no basis, no stupidity like that at, at that time. They were all African people with the same problem and the same oppressor. And that's the way they dealt with the situation. They were clear. And they started a Back to Africa movement 100 years before the birth of Marcus Garvey. That was basically successful. It was also the center for Mark Delaney went to Africa with a Jamaican Robert Campbell to search for a place for the settlement. And each one wrote a report. Mondelaney wrote a good, well documented, well written report because he's a Harvard man, so Harvard men write good reports. Robert Campbell, a man with a limited education, wrote the best report. He wasn't a Harvard man, but he was a man with a great deal of feeling. And his report reads like poetry, called Pilgrimage to My Motherland. And while his report did not have all the polish of a scholar, it had feeling, it had humanity, it had insight into a man going back to Africa and celebrating the fact that this was his birthplace and his birthright. Robert Campbell's work could be reread today, and you can take it out of context and read it as poetry. It is so beautifully done. Now, if you're half flown and you're worried about whether your adjectives and your adverbs are popular plays, don't read Robert Campbell. But if you want to know a man with human feelings toward his motherland, Robert Campbell's Pilgrimage to My Motherland is a classic little piece of work you need to read. All right, now, the first half of the 19th century in the Caribbean island, because the first half of the 19th century here is a century of the massive slave revolt, Gabriel Presser revolt, Denmark Vigil revolt, Nat Turner revolt. And this led to the agitation by the black abolitionists that subsequently led to the ag agitation that ultimately led to emancipation in this country. Now, let's go to the first half of the 19th century in the Caribbean Islands itself. In the Caribbean Islands itself, the Haitian Revolt has set panic in motion in the planter system. But the longest series of votes really was in Jamaica. Jamaica had fought longer and harder than Haiti. And yet, because of a certain event in history, the British could put forces in or infiltrate in such a way and divide the people in such a way they could not bring off a unified state. And they fought over a hundred year period for the Haitian fought generally over a twenty year period. And was just they, the fortunate circumstance of catching the French so completely off guard and fighting the French at a time when when the French finally could send top level troops in to, to try to retake Haiti, it was too late and the Haitians were too stubborn and just kept on fighting and fighting with the land and fighting with the hills and the valleys and malaria too, a general that helped them a great deal. Then the African drum driving these French dark, raving mad that helped a lot. All right, now, as you look at, see now, because the British 
had emancipated or said something about emancipation before this period, as early as the 1830s. But when it came to the 1850s, the Caribbean people understood the fakery of their emancipation and started their revolts again. In Jamaica, this led to the confrontation at Moret Bay. But, but Barbados, a moral colony, then and now, is still a colony, in mentality. Because, because they wanted to make it a moral colony, they gave it a certain kind of, certain kind of treatment. But I remember, on a few summers ago, stating that Jamaica was physically bastardized, Barbados was mentally bastardized. One they dealt with the mind, the other one they dealt with the body. Then they split them in the, in the division. All right, now, that's the first half of the 19th century. But the second half of the 19th century in this country, the second half of the 19th century was the century after emancipation when the abolitionists, all the white liberals that we thought were our friends, began to pull away from us, permitted the South to come back to power, and subsequently started the Ku Klux Klan and other, other organizations, and we were back in the same trouble again. Now, while you had a basis of constitutional law in the Caribbean, you had some structure, but you had something in the Caribbean we didn't have. You had a majority population. And while you have a majority, though you are under colonial rule, you have a different psychosis. You have a different mentality. And this different mentality, brought on by virtue that they could maintain some African culture continuity, and many times they were away from the oppressor and could develop certain basic cultural traits based on their togetherness near the end of the 19th century. It was practically all gone by virtue of one form of oppression, one form of cohesion than the other. And what the British did not win with weaponry, they began to win with a form of brainwashing it's still prevalent. To the point, this year, the 100th year, 100th anniversary of the birth of Marcus Garvey, and we need to reconsider Marcus Garvey, in spite of the fact that his 100th year anniversary of his birth, there's not a single island in the Caribbean for he could function, for he could function in peace right now. If he was in Jamaica right now, he couldn't get elected to public office. If he was in Grenada, they'd kill him. It's easy to lie about a dead man, you ain't got to deal with it. <coughs> if he's here in bed beside him, he'd get elected to anything. He'd make congressman out of it. But in Kingsman, Kingsman, it's no big sad. Right now. <laughs> he had no problem with that title. <laughs> he didn't like the anything he wanted to get elected like over here. <laughs> he might make him a tenant job. <laughs> with or without a law degree. <laughs> so he 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 be all he'd be all right over here. He wouldn't be all right in Kingston. Because <laughs> the atmosphere that would sustain a mark of God does not exist in Jamaica of today. Does not exist on a single Caribbean island right now. In most parts of the United States, it does not exist. It does not exist in Washington, D.C. That color conscious class, conscious bunch of blacks in Washington, D.C., they chase them out of the town. <laughs> 
Better not go to Atlanta, go to Atlanta either. There's a crowd there. So let us be frank about where Marcus Garvey could exist in America right now. Where he could exist in Cabin. I don't know a single island where he could exist in Cabin. He couldn't exist in Cabin at all. You go down to Cabin and hear people boasting about participating in the invasion of Grenada and, 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 and rationalizing on, on the murder of Maurice Bishop. Now, what would they do to Marcus Garvey? All right, now let's get to work. We got a little job here on African resistance movement focused on the 19th century. But my main point to let you know while I'm talking about 19th century Africa, our resistance movements were international. And all of us in the 19th century were very conscious of the fact that we had a world struggle, and we engaged in that world struggle. And we were more together then than we are now. We were less divided into little silly pockets based on islands, and based on countries, based on sororities and fraternities, and a whole lot of other nonsense. We, we didn't have all that we were not worried about that then as we are now. See, we did not know then, as I tell some of my students, that, all right, you're talking about who, where you're from, who you are, can you pass the taxi cab test? Will a cab downtown pick you up? They don't care whether you're from Africa, whether you're from the Caribbean Island, or whether you're from Georgia. Your face is black. If it's kind of late at night, you ain't going to get no cab. You're all the same. You fail the taxi cab test. <laughs> all, all one. <laughs> all one people. So in a negative way, this bigger than cab driver is a better Pan-Africanist than you are. In a negative way, of course. All right, now, let's start with Africa in the 19th century. Because... In the 19th century, slavery had reached a saturation point. All right. Saturation point means everybody who wanted one had one. And they could breed one if they needed one. Therefore, more slaves for the market wasn't really much of a problem. They had shifted so many slaves out of Africa. They had depopulated large areas of Africa. Now, the United States had produced a fast ship that could outrun the British ship at sea. Therefore, the United States that once bought most of its slaves from the British and the Portuguese market was now going directly to Africa and getting its own slaves, still using more and more slaves because the invention of the cotton gin and the rise in the price of cotton being king economically, America had more demands for slaves than the other. So with the Yankee Clipper type of ship, mostly out of New England, America was going, bypassing the British market, bypassing the British blockade, and picking up our slaves directly from Africa. This is why the British began to get a fake reputation for benevolence by starting the British abolitionist movement with a faker called Wilberforce and Grand Bouchard. Most of the British abolitionists were fakers. Most of them did not support any decent legislation in England improving the lot of the British people, especially 
legislation against child labor and the abuse and, and the use of women. So therefore, when they were crying crocodile tears over the slaves, they had no tears and no sympathy for the common people in England. And Wilberforce, so-called Christian, when he met Equiato, the African, the most brilliant of the African slave narrators and writers who had traveled a great deal, good and educated man, educated more than some of the whites he met. Wilberforce could not shake his hand and said so, I could not bring myself to put my hand in his hand and call him a brother, though he was a Christian, the same as I am. So Wilberforce's religion did not prepare him to accept another African as a Christian. All right, now, the African slaves in England itself had been emancipated slowly, not out of benevolence, but because the British working class, with its large unemployment problem, seeing these Africans with these nice jobs, nice, they interpreted nice, footmen, coachmen, said that they wanted those jobs, and that agitation eventually led to emancipation of the African slaves, and the British began to dump them at Sierra Leone. Now, the British, with that customary sense of humor, once they dumped the African slaves at Sierra Leone, they found two shiploads of British women, ladies of the evening and ladies of the night and ladies of whatever, <laughs> ladies with no visible means of support except the use of their charm. We call it charm for the one of the better names. <laughs> they dumped those people, those ladies, into Sierra England was very good at getting rid of its scum. Europe dumped its human garbage can into the New World. The worst of the lot came to the United States. One thing the Caribbean people and the African people never appreciated is that the black Americans had to deal with absolutely the worst white people ever. <laughs> they had to deal with the worst, the worst that Europe, had, that Europe could offer, the, the leftovers, the discards of Europe, and we're still dealing with the discards. These people just don't think, they don't make no kind of sense. What they're doing, me don't make no kind of, me don't, me, you can't figure them out no kind of way. <laughs> they even against each other. <laughs> All right. Now, as we face, the, as Africa faced the beginning of this century, let's take it from the top. Let's look at North Africa. In North Africa, what do you have? You have Egypt under the control of foreigners, Maluk, um, Armenians, Turks, while the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, have retreated, they've left behind administrators and people holding on to power. They even have a, a combination Armenian and Turkish royal family on the throne of Egypt. King Farouk, that a fat degenerate, <laughs> was an Armenian in combination, Armenian and Turk. And he had all kinds of women and men that he performed all kind of relations with. But the Arabs, who are Puritans, uh, uh, pretend to be Puritans in sexual matters, uh, came to him and said that uh, you can uh, treat these foreign women any way you want to. We have no control of that. But if ever you be, be, be misbehave this way with, with a gentleman, Arab woman, 
we're going to kill you no matter how much it takes. And ultimately, they did drive him off the throne, but these were, let's deal with his, his descendants first, because Muhammad Ali was one of his descendants. Now, Muhammad Ali, the prize fighter who really is not brilliant, I met him changing trains in Miami, and I told him, if you wanted an African name, why do you consult somebody who could give you a genuine African name? This is the name of an Arab slave trader. That's, you know, the name that was approved for him. He submitted the name to Elijah Muhammad, and, and that's the name they approved. They didn't know much about it anyway. And, but anybody could have told him that Muhammad Ali really was not a stable guy. He tried to turn Egypt toward the West and try to whiten up Egypt. All right. The main thing I'm trying to get at is that foreign control of Egypt and North Africa. <coughs> was intact at the beginning of the century. The English wanted a peace, so she had to try to drive out the Turks. And the French wanted a peace and had to drive out part of the Turks. So the French got Morocco. The English took part control over Egypt. Then, when the Egyptians got in trouble trying to take over the Sudan, the British rescued them. Then the British took over the Sudan, ostensibly in partnership with the Egyptians, but they were never in partnership. The British were controlling it all along. But all over Africa, there were revolts. There were revolts against colonial rule because colonialism was now gradually, I mean slavery, was now gradually turning to a more sophisticated form of slavery called colonialism. And the African who thought he was getting rid of one form of slavery was only inheriting another form of slavery, and he was beginning to catch on to this form of slavery. In North Africa, again, the French began to use the foreign legion to try to hold on to its holding. Now, the foreign legion and all the romance about it were nothing but a bunch of thugs recruited from all the waste matter of Europe, royal cut-ups and social misfits and a whole lot of people who escaped, and some of them escaped criminals and wanted to hide their identity. But there was a whole lot of Hollywood romance and B-movies about them, but really uh, they were nothing but well-dressed gangsters sometime on a horse. Now, the French, with the Foreign Legion, held their part. The British, who recruited African troops to hold their part, but the, the Egyptians tried to control the Sudan. And when the Egyptians tried to control the, the Arabs of Egypt, that's the, probably the best way to put it because the Arab is not an Egyptian. When the Arabs of Egypt tried to control the Sudan and got hell beat out of them, they had to call for the British to rescue them. And in rescuing them, the British gained control both of Egypt and the Sudan. Now, this would provoke wars later on. Now you see the foundation of what is going to ultimately be the wars led by the Mahdi, the holy man who would free the Sudan 
from British rule, but later on, but now not, but not now. All right, now. Now, you see, the war is spreading down the coast of East Africa. And the Arabs had moved down the coast of East Africa. He had moved down the coast of East Africa surreptitiously, doing favors for certain families, marrying into the families, and playing the same kind of game he had played almost a thousand years along that coast, marrying into African families and subsequently using this family, using in the slave trade and in his commodity trade along the coast. All right. He is a unique oppressor in as much as he recruits people in a physical way. This is a form of sexual conquest because the Arab is a big womanizer and a big conveyor of the woman in her family as servants and his trade, be it ever so illicit. This is the way he gained control of the East African slave trade and maintained this trade until the fakery of the British would bring him um, um, kind of frontally to bear with, um, with, with the fact that the African Muslim was really an oppressor. Not that the British was any different, it's just that the British had the kind of weaponry that could dislodge the, Ar the Arabs from the East African slave trade. Now, the resistance in East Africa continued. And the resistance continued until East Africa and the Sudan. A young man whose people were very religious called Fakers, F-A-K-K-E-R-S. These were religious Muslims, high religious Muslims, named Muhammad um, uh, um, Ahmed. Now, this young man had rose to some prominence as a student because his family were puritanical Muslims and he took on his teacher for permitting the students to frolic and laugh during one of the holy days. And they thought that because he did this, he must be some kind of future prophet. Uh, this is the, the character that you saw in the picture cartoon, so poorly portrayed and so inaccurately portrayed in the picture cartoon. Well, what did happen is that he went into a period of training in the Upper Nile. And when he was about 19, he asked that a wife be chosen for him. And this wife that they left out of the movie, he asked that she be the prettiest and the blackest woman in all the Sudan. And so they found a person who had had one year of college training and a tremendously beautiful woman. And she was the number one wife and remained so until a few years later he began to take on additional wives and he, she had to approve of all the additional ones. And she converted all of this into a spy system that used um, against the British. All right, now, this one individual planning his walls against the British literally drove the British out of the Sudan and started a movement using Islam as the rallying cry. What you have to understand now is there are two Islams in Africa. 
This is what Adam Azaroy did not tell you in the series on the Africa. There are two Islams in Africa. One Africa, one Arab. The African side of Islam has used Islam as a rallying cry for reform. And so the Mahdi, that means after he became the holy man, that is what he's called. He began to use Islam as a rallying cry, but he united all of the Sudan, Muslim and non-Muslim. And some of his most effective fighters were those people, non-Muslim, called Fuzzy Wuzzy. They decided that they wasn't going to get a haircut or a shave until the British were driven out. They were magnificent warriors and great camouflage artists. They must have been some of the finest physically trained people ever because they could sit, stand, or fall right in front of a horse. And their knowledge of the movement of the horse was so good, they knew that at all times, Two of those feet are off the ground. And they would lean that body in such a way that the horse could pass right over them without hurting them. And then they would leap with that knife, they would leap and cut the throat on the rider behind. And before he fall, his knife is in the throat of another rider. This is what Rabbiad Kipling said in his A ye fuzzy wuzzy, ye break the British square. That's what he was talking about. That British square attack, they would come in, in, in squares and around and come on the, you know, come from all sides. That's all the fuzzy wuzzy wanted. <laughs> all he wanted. You come up on him that way. <laughs> you never dream again. <laughs> Some of the finest hand fighters in the world. Now, with the fuzzy wuzzy, that's, that's not his really name now. But the Mahdi got the upper hand in the Sudan. Then they sent in a, 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 a colonial fighter who had distinguished himself in the box of war in China. Chinese gold. One of those one-dimensional British military men who, uh, well, we can't get into military men with gender problems, but he, he was one. So he had no concentration when you rule out, rule women out of your life and rule all the other things out of your life and just concentrate on the military, you know, you can concentrate real well, but that, that's a whole lot of time you freed up with <laughs> a whole lot of energy too. <laughs> but he was one of those that kitchen there, kitchen there. Um, so, Gordon, a Christian, had been there before, and he had some converts, but Gordon couldn't free the Sudan from the Mahdi's grip, and eventually was killed by one of the Mahdi's people, the Dongolas. Now the Sudan became free of British rule, and after the uh, death of the Mahdi, the uh, the Sudan came under the control of a man of the Mahdi's choosing, Khalifa Abdul Hayya. Khalifa, Khalifa Abdul Hayya was an illiterate, stony literate, but a master on a horse with a weapon in his hand, he mastered the Sudan. He was so unlearned about people, he saw a Frenchman, he said that, uh, what tribe, why do these white tribes belong to? What part of Africa do they live in? What, what? 
He's no such thing. France didn't mean nothing to him. That's the white tribe. Must live someplace in Africa. <laughs> but that man, he's left out of history. There's so many great heroes left out of African history. Khalifa Abdul Hamid. Ain't no question about who he is. I got there's enough pictures of him. Like the Mahadi, he's from the Dongola group, and the Dongola was the blackest people in the Sudan. Now, the British sent in another one dimensional general, Kitchen. And he retook the British, retook the Sudan. This war is reported by young British reporter Winston Churchill in one of the great classics of war reporting called the River War. I'm not saying it's for you now. See, Churchill was a racist, he was unashamed of it. Churchill boasted of the fact that they killed 50,000 Africans in one evening. But it was great graphic reporting. I said it's one of the finest jobs of war reporting since Caesar came home from the war with the Gauls. But don't look for it being for you. It wasn't for you at all. It was for them. So sometimes if you're going to deal with them, you've got to understand how they report on each other. Now the next war in East Africa was by a man named Mohammed bin Abdullah Hassan. The British called him the Mad Mula of Somaliland. He was a great poet, a devout Muslim, and he had fought the British near the end of the century, and he had gone to Mecca and Medina. He had gone to preach in a city called Barbara, still in existence, and seven years after it, he had failed at Barbara. He came to the edge of the city and said that Allah had told him to push the sea, push the city into the sea with his feet. And he had come to do just that. But then he said that he do not want to harm innocent people. And if the British would turn over so much ammunition to him, so much this and so many arms to him, he might consent to spare the city. The British gave him enough ammunition to fight them three more years. <laughs> they never laid eyes on him. He fought until the 20s, so after the First World War, Winston Churchill suggested that we put some airplanes on some ships and bombed his inland fortresses. And they bombed his inland fortresses. He retreated into Ethiopia and he tried to proposition Haile Selassie's alleged father, Ras McCorn. And I won't get into the lineage of Haile Selassie. He was just as true as many other people sit on the throne, although there's some question about his parentage. He wasn't a Bacona. Because, well, I've seen him so that's a close up three times. And I've seen the Makona close up more than three times. There was no Makona eye, there was not a Makona nose, there was not a Makona lip. I'm a specialist in studying facial features and family lineages as reflected in the physical makeup. Whoever Ava Selassie came out of, he didn't come out of the McConan family. But that's a matter of no great importance right now. But Ras McConan failed to recognize the Mahdi and to give him shelter. And he, not the Mahdi, but the, uh, the, the Mula. He came back into Somali where he died and his followers heard that buried him 
So no Englishman ever saw his face. All right, now, but the major wars in Southern Africa at the end of the 19th century, uh, beginning, in, beginning early in the 19th century, were the Zulu Wars. Now, you have to look at South, South Africa several ways. That was the Kaffa Wars, the wars of the people called the Bushmen and the Hottentots. That's not their name now. These are the Coastal people and the Sand people. These wars against the Boers to keep them from taking their land and their cattle and their women. The Eleven Wars. Now, after that, there was the Zulu Wars of Consolidation. People misunderstand these wars. They think Chaka fought white people. Chaka didn't fight the white people. Chaka fought other blacks trying to consolidate Southern Africa so that Southern Africa could be saved for African people. He fought to keep, he was trying to build up a military force of blacks to keep whites out. And he almost succeeded. All right, now, after the death of Chaka, his half brother and assassin, Ding Dong, took over. And it was Ding Dong that started the fight to keep the whites out of the hinterland, that stopped their wagon trails and burned their caravans. Three times. Now the British saw, this is the 1830s, the British saw that if any whites were defeated, they may be next. And though they hated the guts of the Boers then and now, the British came to the rescue of the Boers, met Ding Dong on the Vell River, or the Fish River, or the Orange River, but so many butchered bodies flowed down that river during this battle. After the battle, it was called the Blood River. The Battle of the Blood River, one of the decisive battles for the control of Southern Africa. And I think October 16, 1838. And it is celebrated in South Africa in secret as Ding Dong Day. The assumption is that when South Africans rise, it's going to be on Ding Dong Day. They double the police on that day, in South, to this day, in South Africa. In the memory of Ding Dong, there's going to be a great uprising. 1840, they had driven him into exile and he passed. Now, the Zulus came under the control of a puppet named Mpande. Mpande ruled or misruled the Zulus for 32 years. He was so ignorant and misguided, the British, just for the fun of it, wrote out his own death warrant and handed it to him and he signed it. <laughs> he was a fat slob. Beer drinking, slob. The Zulus raised special women to be married only to the king. He didn't marry any of those. He married common women, and he discarded them almost quickly, he discarded his clothes. He was a nobody, he was a disgrace to Zulu manhood. He let the Zulu armies deteriorate. But out of this man came a strong son. And this strong son became a favorite among the Zulu people. And he began to raise up the Zulu army one more time. And by 1870, he had driven his father from the throne. And he, had, he was king of the Zulu. His name, Ketchewayo. Ketchewayo now planned to rebuild the Zulu manhood, started the drilling over again. He began to beat up Zulus who were too fat, because you're too fat for war, you're no good for the Zulus. 
He brought back the old general to train the Zulu. Now he started his own campaign for the attack. It took um, nine years to really train. He looked among the different scattered groups, and when he could not find the adequate generalship among the regular Zulu, he looked among people uh, scattered and attached to the Zulu. For his general command, he found a general among a people called the Borolong. They had attached themselves to the Zulus for protection in the absence of a great leader. This man, Mamboza, and his picture is in a book called Chaka Zulu. He was 74 at that time, not a gray hair in his head, not a wrinkle on his skin. He could be 34 or 24. He had lived out in the open, exercised, ate good natural food. He was all a man. And he took command of the Zulu. And he began to whip that army into shape. Now, if you see a picture late at night called Zulu, it's been coming and going and coming and going for 10 years. The picture's in error. And they point to an old man on the hill commanding the troops. Well, that's not historically true, because Mamboza said one of his conditions for retraining the Zulu is that they give his son the command of this small, the troop. All right, now, in this battle, the scheme was to attack the missionary station to provoke the British for demeaning, for reducing his father to a puppet, using missionaries. So this place, Rock is Dry, that was the minor battle. That was the rehearsal battle for the main battle at San Helena. One of the classic battles in Zulu history. All right, now, and they will fight in a three regimental formation. White Shield Regiment, these were the recruits. Brown Shield Regiment, a regular arm. Black Shield Regiment, that the Zulu elite guard. Now, the, brown, the white shield regiment just hit the enemy, let him know the battle has started. Get out, they get out of the way. The brown shield regiment gets in and tries to win. But if they can't win, they send in the black shield regiment. And that regiment wins or dies. It never leaves the battlefield. That's the elite guard. Those are the only Zulus permitted to match. Those the only Zulu war, war Zulus permitted to marry. Special beer was brooded for them. Special women were raised to marry them. And the wish of the soldiers is to work for one regiment and to be a part of the elite guard. Striving. <laughs> During the period of Shaka's reign, he kept the on the evil battle, he kept, he deliberately kept the men away from the women. He said, you need all the passion you got in war. War is nothing but a dispensational passion. You dispense it in one place, you can't dispense it in another. So after the battle, yes. Before the battle, got to save it for the battle. This man, one of the great natural warriors, now as close to Chaka as possible, has come Ketchewayo, the one inheritor of Chaka. Now, he's faced the British and wrote his draft. All he's trying to do is to lure them into his trap, the place called Asan Helvina. Now remember, this is one of the great perfect battles of human history, and when Lippincott and company began commission certain writers to write on the greatest military battles in history, the first book was about at San Helvina. And this is the battle we're talking about. For he boxed the British in, 
put the sea at thy back, two mountains at each side, and the mouth of the mountain stood, catch away your on a hall, just looking at it. And for three days, he just stood there. And so finally he waved his hand, and the battle started. The British regiment literally destroyed. Churchill wrote about this one also in a book called A Roving Commissioner. Jerome Napoleon was killed in this battle. <coughs> the Royal Historian of England has written a book on it. The Reginald Copeland called A San Helena Battle Peace, A San Helena. It's been written about in many books. Then another uh, Copeland wrote another general book called The Negro as a Soldier, a compliment to the men who fought at, 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 at to the caliber of Africans who failed at, 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 at San Helena. Now, Ketuayo would make a mistake. Same mistake many African heads of state make. He goes to England to see the Queen. Why? I don't know. Queen Victoria didn't know what, what was happening, didn't know what was up or down. She sees it, writes a letter telling her minister to leave this man alone after all, you know. But they don't pay any attention to her. When he gets back, they split his country into 13 pieces and divided his people against him in such a way he's no longer a ruler. Had he stayed home, he might have been able to hold it together. After they drove him into exile, the British breathed easier and said, at last the Zulu has been broken. They had spoken prematurely. There was another man they had to deal with. His name was Logan Gala. He inherited the second Zulu Empire in a place called Mashonoland and Matibele Land. And he had built up a sizable empire in this area and some kind of peace until a consumptive Englishman came into the area named Cecil John Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes wanted to control this part of Africa, and he began to instigate in ways of doing it. He began to put one African against the other, and when one African get, stood against the other, then he began to ask the British to punish one set of Africans for being against the other. He began to claim everything under the ground, above the ground, and everything anybody else happened to forget. He wanted mining concessions, and eventually he fought the war he wanted to fight. He bought off the emissaries of Lobengala, and he sent um, the three sets of emissaries. He got one set drunk. Some of them got thrown overboard. But his letter never reached Queen Victoria until after he was dead. Finally, he drove Lobengala into exile. And Lobengala was followed by a small band of people who remained loyal. And then in his dying wish, he told them, go make peace with Cecil Rhodes. Go save your family. Go sweetly, go in peace. And when he died, they gave him a traditional Sulu king burial. They took, they wait, were skinning a cow and taking all the bones out of the cow. So the, the hide of the cow becomes the coffin. And they put him inside and they sew it up. And they bury him facing, facing toward the domain of his people. So now, this is 1893, 
the British breathed easily again and said, at last the Zulu has been broken. They have spoken prematurely one more time. There are two more men they've got to deal with. It is a young king, Bambada, and an old king, Sigananda. Now, the Zulus had served as wagon masters and quartermasters during the Boer War. The British promised to remit their taxes. Instead of remitting their taxes, the British increased their taxes. Now, Bambada has been going to British farms, taking horses and cows, under the pretense that you didn't bring no horses here, you brought no cows here, it all belonged to me. And so he goes to the old king, Sigananda, to get help. And so when he goes to Sigananda, he reminds Sigananda of what his father, that my father helped you when you were escaping from the British. This angers the old man, so he spits on the ground and that's close to cursing. It might surprise you that there are no curse words in most non-Western languages. There are gestures, gestures of cursing, but no words. There's no words for goddamn. There are no words for there are no words for condemnation in most of the languages of the world. Western man has words of condemnation. Most of the languages of the world have no such words. They have gestures or actions, but no words. Now, Dambada goes to see Denizulu, the last living son of Ketuwayo. Denizulu said, I've had enough of British jails. I don't want the part of your wall. Then in that double talk that is known to African people the world over, he says, whispers loudly so everybody can hear him, while I want no more of your wall, nothing to do with your wall, if anybody in this wants to assist you, I did not see that farm disappear, nor did I hear that footstep as they departed to assist you. Sinjani, the last of the Zulu war planners, leaves with Bambara to plan the Zulu War 1906, the last of the Zulu War. Bambara, when Bambara gets back to Natal, Sigananda has already started the war. He didn't wait for the young man to come back. He is on the war path. He is against the British. Now, he starts the war, he has 23 rifles. Not even a dozen. Then he discovers that the Zulus and the different soldiers working for the British and the boys have got no uniform. He gets armbands. So he puts some armbands on some non-workers and have them go picking up the British and the boys' uh, ammunition and bring it over to him. And with this strategy, he accumulates enough guns to get the war started. Now, this war lasts nine months. And it was pretty much successful. Then Bambara goes to the grave of Ketchewayo, as it is the custom. When you go make great decisions in Africa, you go to the grave of your, one of your ancestors to ask for spiritual help. <clears throat> and he was supposed to have been cut down on his way, leaving the grave. His later proof he wasn't cut down. His wife did not go into mourning. Now, if you knew African culture, the British knew African culture, that would have been a signal that somebody went someplace and hid. And that was a double that they killed. 
Now, the Denny's and his work on Denny Zulu proved that Dumbada lived until 1923, that after a year or so, his wife sneaked out of Zululand and went and joined him. Because she told the British, my husband is not dead. His spirit will rise and lead the Zulu people. Now, the old man was captured later that day. The British describe him as arrogant. He was spitting on us, calling us vile names, and you would think that we were his prisoners. He was 95 when the war started. He was 96 when they captured him. This old man had lived through the rise and fall of the Zulu Empire. He was body servant to Chaka. He was one of the soldiers that guarded the grave of Chaka's mother. He had went during the period of difficulty with the Zulus, he went into the Congo and fought with another general called Tam Tam Anna. His story is beautifully told in a poorly written book called Chaka Zulu, A.E. Ritter. It is partly told in another book by Morris called The Washing of the Spears. It is partly told again by Anthony Hole in a Hugh Marshall Hole in a book called The Passing of the Black King. Now, there's a whole lot of work on there's no end to good books on the subject. A lot of books written from European point of view, so you gotta watch that. The one book written from an African point of view earlier, the obsolete now, Chaka the Zulu, Thomas Mafalo. But the latest, the most up-to-date, and best written book written from an African point of view, Mazuzi Kamini's work, Emperor Chaka the Zulu. All right, now, there's no shortage of information on the period. After the Zulu War of 1906, the missionary trained Africans began to come to power. The NACP was found in 1909. The, the ANC was found around 1913 on about the same kind of condition, liberal whites support. And any time things are found with the help of liberal whites, it's crippled from the beginning. Because their liberalism puts a damper on radical activity to the extent that it is neither coffee or cream. And while this seemed to be in a, a trait that has some admiration attached to it, down the road, you pay for it. So if you want strong organizations where you make decisions all the way, you have to find them yourself and finance them yourself. All right, now, the ANC is going to get weak later on. And strength is going to come to South Africa through a great labor union found by a young man from Niatalan, Clement Kadele. All right, let us leave South Africa for a while and understand that the second cluster of wars, and the last one that we will deal with, was really... West Africa. Now, once more, you have a different kind of Muslim. You have Islamic resistance to French rule along that coast. Secretary's grandfather, Sumare, that we'll come back to. You have Usman de Torredo against the French. You have in what is now Nigeria, the House of Fulani Wars. And after the House of Fulani Wars, 
the concession that made Nigeria. But the longest series of wars was really in what is now Ghana, the Ashanti or the Asante Wars. All right, the British wanted to take over the coast, to take over the hinterland from the coast. But all they had was the coast. And the one thing that kept them from taking over the coast, over the hinterland, was the Asante people. All right, now, the Asante people always move away from people trying to convert them to religions and politics not of their making, not of their choice. Now, had Nkrumah understood their culture, respected it, and got their cooperation, he would probably still be alive and probably would still be ruling Ghana quite well with their assistance. All right, the Sandy people came out of a particular kind of culture. They are a can people. And they came down from the Niger River to the Volta River in 1076. But it was not until early in the 18th century that they began to reshape their destiny, and they reshaped their destiny under two men, a young king, Osara Tutu, and a priest, a Kumpo and a chief. All right, now, the romantic story is this. The main Akan people, the called Ashanti by the British, whose name is Asante, lived in the middle of Ghana. And there, as the vassals of another group, the Dikaraz and the Doma, they had to have a spear carrier, a vast, uh, 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 almost a vassal prince, in the dominant house. <clears throat> so they sent this young man to the dominant house, Osara Tutu. And there in the dominant house, he violated one of the basic rules of laying court to one of the young ladies of the house, something he wasn't supposed to do. So after a while, when she began to show some weight in some obvious places, a priest told him that you better escape because if this, when this is discovered and it's known that you are the culprit, this means war between your two people. Ultimately, ultimately, the father had to send two or three sons to replace this one. Now, the priest told him and this is part of the sustaining legend of the Santa people. That one day you will be king, and I will bring to you a golden stool that will be the ark of the covenant of the Santa people. Three years after he is king, the priest appeared. The priest is also a magician. So he brings from the sky this golden stool. It's just a wooden stool inlaid with raw gold. And uh, raw gold is not very attractive, incidentally. It don't, don't look like much. I've seen the stool, and so it's a precious ornamental stool. It's the holy grail of the Santa people. So I respect it in that, in that regard. But uh, this was the making of that people. But my main point is that the British wanted to capture it, knowing full well that this would break the spirit of the Asante people. 
And the British longed to move from the coast to capture this too. And 1905, in 1805, after the death of Osiris II, after the death of the great priest, and we can devote a lot of time to him, but that's not really what we're here for. So he's also a forerunner of a gynecologist, a magician, and some of his works are still well known in Ghana. Another king came to power, Osiris Tutu Kawamani. A British governor along the coast said that he would come inland and take the golden stool. And he sent word to the governor, if you came inland, I will send your head back to the coast on a silver platter. So the fool did come in land, and the king kept his promise. This was the beginning of the Sandy Wars that would last a hundred years. And every time the British marched on up force, they would begin another Sandy War. The next major war, 18... 74, they burned the city of Kumase, still didn't win the war. Then they began to instigate to take over the hinterland during the reign of a young king, Krempe. They wanted him to pay so much indemnity and he tried to get through to send his embassies to England to cut it off. And said, well, if you got money to send embassies to England, you could be paying the indemnity. He paid part of the indemnity. Finally, the Sandy people realized that they would either have to give up the golden stool or give up the king. They decided to give up the king. Now, the British and surrendering the king, forced the king to really bow and to force his face down onto the shoes of the British governor to humiliate him along with his mother. And he turns to his people and said, my kinsman, is this necessary? This, of course, the start a war that the Sandy people could not win. Now with Tempe in exile, a great woman came to power, Ye Asante Wa. The British still tried to capture the golden stool to break the spirit of the Asante people. 1905, 1900, the British had sent an expedition into Kumasi. Now, an African Christian had gone to Kumasi and came back and told the British he had found the golden stool. And the British, the Africans had picked a fake golden stool and aged it. But unfortunately, the, gold, the, the thing fell, and the British discovered that that was new wood. Now the British began to search for the real golden stool. Governor Hobson came into Kumasi with a military force with his wife, why I don't know, white woman, white umbrella, black African holding the umbrella, such a sight. This is a book called The Drama of Kumar's Day, and there's a whole lot of books on this subject, you know. So 
But the scene is described best in a book called The Great Drama of Kumase, another one called The Seed of Kumase. He says to Ye Asantewa, the queen, why haven't you used this occasion to bring out the golden stool for me to sit on and send to her sovereign master, Queen Victoria? He had to be a fool because if he knew anything about the culture, not even an assassin king is permitted to sit on the golden stool. And the stool is brought out once a year in solemn ceremony so the people can see it. And the carriers of the stool are so trained that they must be physically behind the stool at all times. And if anyone walks in front of the stool during the ceremony, he is instantaneously tried and probably instantaneously killed. This is the most sacred object of this attitude. See, Christian Western people think there's nothing sacred to anybody except them. This is that Ark of the Covenant. And so, this fool, Yale Sandy was looking at him. Then she walks up and takes the gloves off his wife and decides he don't want them. He throws them back at her. <laughs> Arrogant little woman. <laughs> no. Her soldiers come and beg her to let them kill the governor. He had been, they have insulted our nation the last time. They begged for the right to kill him. And she said, no. Someone asked her later on, say, it is much you're going to kill him. Anyway, why didn't you let him kill him? Her answer was a compliment to women. She says, um, as I observed the scene, the junior spear throwers was closest to the governor, and had I given them the order, they might have missed him. But the senior spear throwers were on the other side of the parade ground. Then I noticed the children jotting out, curious as children would be. And had I given them the order, they might have hit one of the children. So she told everybody to take one. And yet, in the morning, she called her court to order and accused the men of not doing what they had begged her to let them do. In her classic, beautiful speech, hey, ye men of Asante, I never thought that I would see the day when you would beg for the return of your king. But you would take such insult. Do you know who we are? We hark back to the days of Osara Tutu. Osara Tutu Kawamane, the great priest of anarchy. When she mentioned the great people of the Santis, what kind of men are you? He says, I don't know what you men would do. And come to sun on tomorrow, we women will be at war with the British. And if you men are not with us, go milk the cow. <laughs> Bring in the bread. Take care of the children. Take off the trousers. And you will no longer be welcome in our bed. <laughs> to a man, when the war started, Every man was in the battle. <laughs> her psychology had worked. And they stayed with her for nine months throughout. It was not until the entry of the West Indian Regiment that Yale Santiago gave up. She said, our brothers from the West have come to help us at last, and none too soon. She did not know the brothers were under the command of the British, and one arm 
was given command to fire on the English lieutenant did, and another arm on the sergeant board stopped. He said, we, we didn't come here to fire on our own people. Gordon was later tried in Jamaica. His son ran a grocery store in Harlem up until about four years ago. But after that, she gave up. She was sent to Seychelles Island along with her cousin, Pompey. Now, the most important thing here is that the agitation for the return of Yehosantiwa and King Pompey led by a young Ghanaian, Kaysla Hayford, was converted into an agitation for independence. Kaysla Hayford converted, had as his assistant another Ghanaian teacher named Joseph B. Danqua. Joseph B. Danqua was the schoolmaster of Kwame and Kruh. On his deathbed, when, when Casey Hayford was dying, he said, send for J.P. Jo Joseph B. Danqua inherited the mantle of political leadership with the hope to turn it over to Kwame Kruh. But when Kwame Kruh came back, as a secretary to the United Gold Coast Convention, Kwame Nkrumah, instead of waiting for the mantle, seized the mantle, took the young people out of the United Gold Coast Convention, and formed the Convention People's Party. Now, angry, making Don Qua angry. Now, Don Qua joins the opposition. It might have been a political mistake, it might not have been a political mistake. But Don Kwa's idea is that you can join African traditionalism with modern traditionalism, with, with a modern state, and make a combination of states. And that if Africans wanted socialism, they can look back at their own history, which is a form of social living and communalism, and out of that, they can choose an ideological and a political and a spiritual way of life that will be as African as it needs to be and take from the West anything it needs from the West while still being distinctly African at all times, and never being a prisoner to the West. I think this point was missed. I think the point was missed by Nkuma. I think the point was missed by most Africans. I think the point and the significance of the 19th century African, the 19th century thinker in the Caribbean was missed by the African world, and I think this is the main crisis in the African world, that we have missed the significance of these great thinkers of the 19th century. I don't think anybody in the Caribbean island today cares or knows about the writings of Robert Love, J. Albert Thorne, Marichal. These are thinkers that came, some came concurrent with Marcus Garvey, some came before Marcus Garvey, some taught Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey was brilliant. He never took anything from second-rate people. Every time he turned to a thinker, it was a great thinker. In Ghana, great thinkers came at the end of the 19th and the 20th century, and the early 20th century. Many of them we don't even read today. Great fancy nationalists. John Master Saba and his whole scheme of how to use culture as 
the instrument of liberation outlined in his book, Fancy Customary Law, Fancy Law and Constitution. Don Juan, the same way as a can doctrine of God, but another small book was, and an argument I had with him, he not only, he had only had two copies, he gave me one, and I still have it, Obligation on the Can Society, how did Can people arrive at right and wrong before Europe and before they were, were converted to Christianity? I'm saying that if you understand the 19th century, you have to understand the intellectual antecedents of the 19th century all over the world because you have turned to cause something or another, but you have not turned to these great thinkers all over the African world. Men like Case Lehavor in West Africa. Hubert, I mean, thinkers from Nigeria. Zeke, the early writings of Zeke. Zeke Saw Pat J in North, in, 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 in Southern Africa. Boys, we have not even made the best use of in this country. The great black journalist of this country, T. Thomas Fortune, Monroe Prada, we have not made the best use of. The three great Pan Africanists from Trinidad, H. Sylvester Williams, C.L.R. James, George Padmore. We have not made them. They came out. These are the results of the 19th century. These are the men in the 20th century who began to fashion a way of life for African people. And I'm saying that if we're going to chart our way in the last of the 20th century and look toward the 21st century, <laughs> We have to understand that our own thinkers have sat down and tried to show us the way. And they were thinking for us. And that nothing that came from the European mind was meant to do anything but facilitate European control over the world. The European is clear about that. You have confusion about it. He has no confusion about what he wants in the world. He wants the world, all of it. He wants you as servants. And it does not matter whether he's left or right politically. And racism does not stop at the door of communism or socialism. And I say behind that, there's probably no place for the world to go except some form of socialism. But the socialism for you will have to be designed by you for you. And there's certain ingredients that have to go into your socialism that's not in other people's socialism. Your spirituality has to go over into your socialism. Your church has to go into it. Clean it up. If you want to clean up, you, you bring it over, clean it up inside. But you can't discard it. You discard it, you discard the people. Take it false and all. Then correct it within the context false and all. But look again at the totality, not only of the warrior of the 19th century, but of the thinker of the 19th century. And I am reminded of something Willis Huggins of the Harlem History Club that later became the Blyden Society often said to me, if you cannot go all the way into a field, make a map leading into the, in the, into the direction that you want to go 
so that the next person can see where you wanted to go and can pick up your map and follow it. We need clear directions now. We need people giving directions. We need to understand that our enemy had one thing in mind and our enemy has been successful. He meant to break our self-confidence and destroy our historical memory. If you're going to go into the 21st century, you have to remember what you was in order to, to understand where you are, where you still have to go, and what you still must be. As we face the 21st century, there's a possibility that there will be a billion African people on the face of the earth. You've got an economy right there. Make sweaters for a billion people. Make shoes for a billion people. Have goods and services for a billion people. I'm saying that we have to look back at people that we have misjudged. And I'm saying that we have misjudged three main people in the 20th century whose ideas came out of the 19th century. Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Mark of God. Because all three of them were saying the same thing in a different way. Prepare yourself to manage nations. And prepare yourself by managing yourself. Because in the 21st century, we are either going to have to manage ourselves exceptionally well, we are going to have to manage nations, or we are going to be managed. And we have no choice about it, and we do not have as much time to make up our mind as we think we have. This is tomorrow's work. And the time to start tomorrow's work is always today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. John Henry Clark, let's give another round of applause. Like the origin of Africa, and what I mean is the origin of man. And, and I'm speaking in terms of since everything started in Africa, with a black man, Australopithecus, and so forth. I'm trying to figure out how, if, if we were great as I know we were, starting out in Africa as one man, and when you go into this genetic thing about the black the dominant gene, how did we get in the position that we got in in Africa? I can understand what's happened here in America. I understand that. But I don't understand when you're speaking of the white man. I can't understand his origin if we were the original man. Well, he's an offshoot of, of the African and part of the Asian. It's an offshoot. He's, uh... Well, I know that I read somewhere where the continents broke away and so forth. Well, that's the continental drift theory. Right. It has right. really nothing to do with what I'm saying, right. although that is a theory, and it's, right. it, to some degree it's supportable. Okay. And because um, you could take the world and put it uh, aside, and you find out that if you put it down like a jigsaw puzzle and try to put it together, Finally, it fits. Right. Some of it fits. Right. So the chances are, it could have been one landmass that broke apart. Right. So that's the possibility. So we, we, the, the continental drift and what you and I are talking about is having to be two separate things. Right. Well, you said he's an offshoot, but then if he came as the offshoot, how did he get in? 
get into uh, get into power. your yes. uh, get power. Yes. We got the power principally because the African has always manifested a trait that he still got. He's rather naive while other people are concerned. And he was totally unsuspecting. No, but the Western Asian was the first person to really to do harm, to invade Africa, to wreck cities, because the African didn't suspect him. No, but the, the continent of Africa has never been protected. Still not protected. Whole continent. You know, Israel has more protection than the whole continent of Africa put together. Oh. They know they got to have protection, and then they go about it. The African still hasn't been convinced that he needs protection. Now, the last thing I'd like to ask about the religious thing, like I keep reading about uh, uh, the mystery, what you call this thing in Egypt, and uh, the mystery school. The mystery school. Okay. Now, what this is the forerunner. This is the out of the. This is the forerunner of what became Christianity, part of the social thought. What I'm, what I'm asking came out of that. That was the forerunner. Now, what was the one come out of like the five books of uh, Moses and Judaism? Then uh, you had Christianity and uh, Islam. Which way did that? No, um, all the elements that went into the making of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam came out of the basic elements in Africa out of the mystery system and the great laws at Luxor, out of the book of the coming forth by the night and the day, and out of the basic African text. And the Bible is merely a copy, copied, and sometimes put it on. But you must understand this. No one wants to deal with the Hebrew interest. And when what the Hebrews copied from the African. See, but when you go back to the original text, you go back to the copy, you can see it. You, you don't have to be less religious, but you can just look at the, the basic facts. And the most obvious thing is the Tenth Commandment, copied from the negative, what they call the negative confession. The negative confession were never negative. If you say they're negative, that means you haven't read them. They're not negative. There's not one negative, one bad. Now, what, is, what, now, what the Africans, what you call the negative confession, was merely the declaration of faith and cleanliness and faithfulness. You, you stand before, at the given period, at the lodge at Luxor and at the schools of Africa, you stand before your teaching and say that I have not been guilty of bothering my neighbor's wife. I've not been guilty of us. There's nothing negative about that. Now, I must admit that Moses did a very good job of choosing 10 out of the 42. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Clark, for a very inspiring lecture as usual. Mm -hmm. I had to go downstairs and cut the tail end of this out. Mm -hmm. on. But I'm interested in this to a large degree in some of the same things that you just tried to explain to this gentleman. What I'm interested in now, I've heard, I've been to the various lectures over the years and have had been able to attend them like the rest of the program like I should. I buy books and I read quite a bit. But what I'm interested in, I'm basically interested, I'm very curious, what, what is, uh, is there any, where does this, uh, say like today, these, these mysteries, um, I've read uh, quite a bit of uh, this Harry Krishna literature, yogiism, I mean, I'm talking about the theory of yogiism and all this sort of thing. Does the African, uh, mysteries or the African influence or the African cultures you know, in the ancient days, does that have any relevant, any relative bearing on some of the concepts or the revelations or the meditations or what have you that they're bringing down to us today? Well, 
Yes, only the African never called them mysteries. The other people called them mysteries. They were they were they were inquirers. Inquirers into how life operated and how things did. Africans had a very simplified, holistic approach to religion, to the spirit. All of the Africans never called it religion, but spirituality, universal spirituality. Okay, well, at the same time, I know, but what I want to know, in other words now, if I would search back and really get involved, see if I was a younger man, I got involved in to say like the mysteries as they refer to according to African principles. Mm -hmm. uh, I could go as deep into them as uh, some of the volumes through that I ran into about the you know the control of the various influences, the spiritualism, uh, the magnetism, the, the revelations, you know, the inspirations and the, that these people are supposed to be subject to after they involve themselves in these programs. I could do that. You could do it. It, it, it. it will reach a dangerous point. Okay, I understand it. Well, that's why I haven't played with it anymore. It, it, it will reach a dangerous That The mystery school is still in existence. There's certain people who belong to it. In other words, what I'm saying, now, I, I started off years ago, somehow or another, I read quite a bit of road to cruising literature. I really didn't get involved with it, but I did read some of the theory. But the only thing, see, I got a little scared, see, because they were talking about Frank God's right. I can discuss them. I, I, I say, well, man, I don't mm -hmm. want to get tangled up, but I know I'm not supposed to play with my mind foolishly. I mm have -hmm. sense enough to know that. But I really, in other words, well, I do answer the question. No, I, I tend to just, I, I, no, 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 you are. I, I, I tend to distrust the Rosicrucianists. They're Westerners, and they tend to paint everything white. Now, yeah, but. Dr. Clark, uh, you uh, mentioned the uh, great uh, Zulu uh, wars and uh, uh, Zulu resistance against uh, the Europeans. Um, what do you attribute to the present day passiveness of the Zulu entity in South Africa today? And do you think they'll ever uh, come out of that? Well, a good question. Uh, the Zulus led one of the great wars in Southern Africa, and there's quite a few of them are still dynamic, but they, their leadership seems to be rather conservative today. And I don't believe the leadership is speaking for absolutely all of them. I've met some rather dynamic Zulus in my life. And, uh, John S. Mark, Zulu head of radical, died on recently. And one of the most radical Zulus in Southern Africa was Champion, one of the founders of the South African Communist Party, who quit the party on the national, national issue, the issue of nationalism. I think the Zulus will again be a major factor in Southern Africa. Probably not under the leadership of people like both Lazy, but they will again be a, a major factor. The people who got it together culturally. Anytime you can hold your culture together, you can hold certain other things together. That's a great advantage. I don't give up on them. Of course, there are too many of them. Well, that's another thing. They don't tell you the real population, I don't think. Well, they're the, one of the largest groups in Southern Africa, the Zulu, the Zulu people. One of the largest single groups in Southern Africa. <laughs>
philosopher, historian, author, professor emeritus at Hunter College in New York. He has two new books on the press. They are New Dimensions of African History, published by African World Press in Trenton, New Jersey, African People and World History, published by the Black Classic Press in Baltimore, Maryland, and he's just completed a book, The Africans at the Crossroads, Notes for an African Revolution. Dr. Clark has had an interest in African history all his life. He currently lives in Harlem among his people. We, as Warwick Wonders, is going to continue this lecture series. We're having another event in, in March. It will be given at the church. The church is Worldwide Wonders. The address is 2053 West 63rd Street in Chicago, Illinois. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over the years, I have lectured many times on the subject of Malcolm X and his relationship to the black radical ministry throughout the world. I have exhausted any fight I have with anyone over the subject because I've had enough time to think it out well and to reconsider anything I said initially. In other words, I've had time to go over my mental notes on the subject enough to be settled in my mind Malcolm X's relationship to the radical ministry of the African world. I am dealing with the antecedents of Malcolm X, and to deal with the antecedents of Malcolm X, you've got to deal with the antecedents of radicalism in the African world. You have to understand that we are a radical revolutionary people, and that we were not a radical revolutionary people, we would not still be in, be in existence. At another place, I have said, Malcolm X, who had three distinct identifications, Malcolm Little, Malcolm X, and Malcolm El Hajj Shabazz, lived three distinct lives, and yet all of these lives stem from one life. I've also said that no nation could have made Malcolm quite the way he is, he, were, he was, and no nation could have destroyed him with the same ruthless uniqueness that he is a product of American oppression, and that no nation oppressed quite the same way the United States oppressed, and no nation destroys its oppressed quite the same way. That we're dealing with a unique phenomenon in history, and yet, when we address ourselves as Malcolm X, relationship, to radicalism and to radical social thought and radical action among African people, we are dealing with a personality that we have met many times on the roads of our history. So therefore, there is nothing specially new about the spirit of Malcolm X. There's not, nothing especially new about the action of Malcolm X. He is unique for his time and the other radicals were unique for their time. I am not saying that he is 
a duplication. I'm saying he is he was a continuation of radical thinking and radical history, and radical acting that is deep in our history as a people. And one of the reasons we do not know that is because too many times our minds get locked behind what is called the 500-year room by Professor Van Sertima. And I say our mind gets locked in front of a slavery curtain and we act as though slavery was the only thing of consequence that has happened to us. Slavery, in the measurement of time, because we are the oldest people functioning on this earth, we were functioning four million years ago. And when we look at the societies we have produced, 500 years out of that time is one half of the wink of an eye. All right. So you're talking about, you hung up with slavery. You haven't even studied what you did a thousand years before slavery. And what did you do a thousand years before that? And a thousand years before that, I'm saying that we must take a holistic and a global view of black radicalism and show that a Malcolm X fits into that category historically. And he is a continuation of radical activity among African people that started with the beginning of organized societies in the Nile Valley and in, in Southeast Africa. He is a continuation of a people who were on the stage of the world for thousands of years with no script and had to act out and make real a play of history with no precedent. They had to do this because there was nothing for them to follow. There was no previous people. Nobody left any books behind. There wasn't nobody to leave these books behind. They had to start from scratch and build human society. They had to start from scratch and build spirituality. And that all of our action of survival has been radical activity leading ultimately to the radical class of the Malcolm X. I am saying that our social thinking in the ancient world, when we look down the spectrum of our history and take it in full view, we must consider the fact that we built enduring society that lasted for thousands of years, not only without a jail system, but without a word in our language that meant jail. That if we could do this through the family structure and the community structure, it means that we had a radical way of looking at the world, original and an imaginative way of looking at the world that we still need and that the world still needs. And I'm saying that transform the river valleys of Africa into cities and civilization was a radical activity in the world because all of this existed before the first European wore a shoe or lived in a house that had a window. <laughs> all right. And I'm saying, that with the coming of foreigners, a new kind of radical had to come into being. And the main reasons why we have not understood a Malcolm X in relationship to the uniqueness of oppression in the United States and the uniqueness of destruction of oppressors, oppression, oppressors, in the, the oppressed in the United States, that we have not understood the design 
of the nation itself. We have not understood that while we had a humanity that spoke to all human beings, the foreigner had a humanity that was parochial that spoke to his intention of holding power. And that to tell a lie was an easy thing for him to do because in matters pertaining to the recognition of other people's humanity, he didn't mean it in the first place. He didn't mean arguments about democracy in the first place. He didn't mean about Christianity in the first place. Because his method of holding power is both anti-democratic and anti-Christian. Right. In the one disaster that would hit his life, if he dared to practice Christianity or democracy 24 hours, he spent it. <laughs> so the one thing you can depend on the Europeans never to believe and never to practice is democracy and Christianity. Because if he will dismantle his entire society by virtue of this kind of commitment. So from the beginning, you are dealing with a liar who the lie is part of his tradition and part of his history. All right, I have simplistically divided the world into three different categories of people, and it is simplistic to the point where many of my students have said, now, Professor Cloud, you know that all people are alike, and we have to say, do you hear? You're dead wrong. All people are not alike. Oh, yeah. People are shaped by environmental influence, they're shaped by weather, they're shaped by the presence of food, they're shaped by the absence of food. They're shaped by attitudes that bred them into, into their society. Right now, let's deal with this early African for all of the years before he knew that there was anything in the world called a European. Most of our radical activity had to be developed in trying to get this white monkey off of our back. Because <laughs> we got one kind of radicalism in building a new society without precedent. Without precedent, we had to develop another kind of radicalism to deal with the infusion and the coming into our society of people whose word could not be taken, people who did not respect our culture, did not respect our women, did not respect our family structure. So a special kind of radical had to be introduced to deal with this kind of invader. Now, in the United States, a radical had to be special again based on the design of the country, the intention of the country. Because this country was designed for free white Protestant males, middle class and up, those who agreed with the prevailing political status quo and who owned property. Everybody else was out, including white women. Now, you have the illusion that the state started off democratically when it started off not addressing itself to the major issue. Excuse me, what happened to the war? The major issue of facing the country at the time was slavery. And this, this uh, event made it a necessity to create another form of radicalism led by Frederick Douglass in the 19th century. My main point is to hook up Malcolm X with his intellectual and revolutionary antecedents. 
in the main revolutionary antecedents of Malcolm X is the black ministry and the black radical of the 19th century who brought us into the 20th century when radicalism began to be watered down and radicalism began to be compromised. Once again, looking at the radicalism of the United States and looking at how this country preserves itself every time a member of an oppressed group, especially black, showed his people the face of power and what to do about it, he was either murdered, driven into exile, or driven to suicide. There is no exception. So any time any African person shows his people in this country the true face of power and what to do about it, guard him 24 hours a day and have someone watching the guards for fear they may not be on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But sooner or later, one of three things is going to have to happen to him unless you're on guard to prevent it. He's going to be assassinated, or he's going to be driven into exile, or he's going to be driven to suicide. Now, had you known this pattern in American history that goes all the way back while we are concerned, and had you begin to investigate the mysterious death of David Walker after his appeal, the mysterious death of Booker T. Washington after the last four years of his life, he stopped catering to whites and began to raise some principal questions about the whites, even whites who gave him money. Then he was gone. And all the others, Monroe Trotter, supposed to fall off the roof of a house where he lived and where he was born and where he'd been walking, where he, where he walked around as a child and knew every spot on that roof. Now, who in the hell would fall off a roof they knew that well? <laughs> Yeah. Then we understand that Martin Luther King was saved so long as he as he advocated nonviolence. But when he raised some principal questions about power, he was on a collision course with those who murder everyone who raises that question and shows his people the true face of power. My point is that Malcolm X not only relate to this 19th century radicalism, that he related to the 19th century radicalism in the African world and the radicalism in the Caribbean world, and that there was a period when the radicalism of the Caribbean world affected the intellectual wedding between themselves and that and those in the United States and became one. Predating Pan-Africanism about a hundred years before anyone began to use the name Pan-Africanism. But now, going back in history again, looking at the radical factor in our history, I have said that we had three golden ages. Ages of great prosperity. We had two golden ages before we saw the European. We had another one after the rise of Islam, disrupted by the Arab slave trade, but we had it in spite of the Arab slave trade that most of the brothers, or practically all of the brothers, don't even want to talk about. <laughs> That's right. yeah. Now, how is it, and what kind of people are you to have had three golden ages, and you might have a fourth one, when there are people who've lived and died without having one? 
what's so special about you. And what I'm trying to point to is what is special about you is your ability to produce radicals who affect social change and who challenge the status quo to the point where they can bring about social change. And this radicalism started early in our history as a people. Now, we began to challenge the norm. We began to make changes and innovations in society that ultimately would change all society. Now, during the dynastic period in Egypt, the first dynasty, impressive with no more Amina. The second, kind of a holding dynasty, housekeeping dynasty. I mean, they didn't even, they did not move backward or forward. The third dynasty we would produce, not only a great radical, but the world's first multi-genius who would make radical changes in the society itself. M. Hotel, Bill of the Step Pyramid. Doctor, the world's first physician, who lived 2,000 years before the Greek who's called the world's first physician. And if you read the Greek who's called the first world's first physician, he said, I am a child of Imhotep. Mm -hmm. In other words, I am beholden to the African who is the real father of medicine. And yet the Europeans insist on calling him the father of medicine and take an oath in his name when he, in his writing, told you, told them, I am a child of M. Hotel, the Abraham. Now, my point is that M. Hotel, in building the step pyramid, would set in motion massive building and starting the concept of medicine and beginning the first man to have form an operation and gathering intellects around him, setting in motion the Egyptian mysteries and ultimately the great large at Luxor that the Arabs call Luxor, the Greeks call Thebes, the African call Warat. That he began the concept that would lead ultimately thousands of years later to the concept of higher education. And that men began to gather and to talk about social change and social preservation. And they began to prepare leadership so well that the nation was never without a supply of thinkers. And that this was done with so much uniqueness. You would go into the school to study at the age of seven, seven. You would study 40 years. And most of the time, you would never see a book. And when you come out, you was a physician, an architect, you all, almost anything you needed to do in order to maintain a nation. And you was a principal thinker, a great teacher, and an oracle. And it went out to benefit an entire people. I'm saying that this was a radical step forward that got un underway the radical activity that brought into being a nation called Kemet, later to marry, later sites. The Jews called it Mizoram. The Greeks called it Egyptus, that was later abbreviated into Egypt, that the ancient Africans never called their country Egypt. My main point here is that 
without any precedence. African radicalism was set in motion and social change came into being. Of course, they were right. Many books came into being. Finally, someone brought these papyrus of these different books. There was a papyrus plant that, out of which came the words for his paper, but that's another lecture. Um, but when it was all pulled together into a single word, the best of it, it was called the Book of the Coming Forth of Day and Night. And because the Arab slave grave robbers were robbing African tombs for manuscripts and gold, whatever they could get, some Arab took this big manuscript out of a tomb, and the British who wanted to buy it asked him where he got it from, and he pointed to the grave he had robbed. He said, I got no dead people over there. They called it the Book of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> It had nothing to do with the dead. It had to do with life. Now, in this book, you have literally an anthology, but coming together many books dealing with social thought, social change. Out of this book and from these books, in a collective way, came many of the stories that ultimately went into the making of the Bible, a book that would be lately arrived at in human history. People think the Bible has always been here, it's always true, it's God's word. If man is God, then you, you're right. <laughs> man put it together. And man changed it many times to suit himself. Yeah. I'm saying it was a great illustration of truth and with lessons taken from Africa by the Hebrews, we had some personified to give you the illusion that they were a part of the event involved. <laughs> now, we see Africa as the giver, this is something else that the black intellect will not examine, they will not examine with any thoroughness the Hebrew entry for fear of loss of tenure and loss of reputation and loss of limb. <laughs> <laughs> they will not examine in depth the fakery behind and around the faith called Islam. The most unoriginal of all of the forms of religion because it came into being so fast. It had to steal a few saints from here, a few from here, a few things. It had no original poetry and no original social, social thought. And they don't examine that within a degree because they would have to examine the Arabs who faked it into being. They have to make a clear separation between Islam and Arabism, something the brothers are not willing to do. I'm not saying don't be a Muslim, but I'm saying at what point will they turn their eyes away from the Arabs and focus on great black Muslim thinkers who brought the religion into being all radical? You want to relate Malcolm to radicalism within Islam, then you would relate him to a thinker like Akhli Baba, who wrote 47 books, each on a separate subject, two books when he was in exile in Morocco. The last of the great chancellors at the University of St. Cory at Timbuktu. Exile in Morocco, he wrote two books trying to explain his people to those silly backward Arabs, and they never got the point then or not. And yet, you know all of the heroes and you can, the litany of the kings of Europe, and most of the blacks who are Muslim, 
never heard of Acne Bar. <coughs> never heard of the black radical warriors in the South. Muhammad Ahmed, the Mahdi. Muhammad Abdullah Hassan, called the Mad Mule of Somaliland. These are black Muslims who fought to free their country from any form of domination. The great black Muslims of West Africa, Sekou Toure's grandfather, Sumari, and a Muslim who turned, who created a separate form of Islam. Amadou Bella, the Bumbara. He created an Islam that was basically anti-Arab because he thought they were the corruptors of Islam. This kind of radicalism we have not dealt with, and we have not dealt with the radicalism in the creation of the literature of ancient Egypt and how the Africans arrived at what to do. We have not examined with any thoroughness the works of Sheik and Tadil when in his writings on the history of taboos, he, he showed you that many times Africans arrived at civil law based on what not, what to do, based on what not to do. Now, if you look now at the negative confession, although you are only interested in the 10th commandment part of it, which was which Moses took, if he brought them down from the mountain, he had to take them with him because they were in existence two, three thousand years before he was born. <laughs> <laughs> Moses, an African prince, born and raised in Africa, born in a place called Goshen, a radical thinker for his day. Now, when he was wanted by the Pharaoh and had to put some space between him and the Hebrews and, and his country, he took up with the Hebrews. Then he, in the language of the street, palmed off a deal on them. Obey my God, I be your leader. And what did he palm off on them? The concept of monotheism, the concept of the oneness of God as against the multiplicity of God. My point is that he was a radical thinker, but he took his cue from still a radical thinker, more radical than himself. Maybe in religion, the forerunner a radical thinker. Some people said that Akhenaten, who was Amenhotep IV, gave the world monotheism. They're wrong. Some people said that the Hebrews gave the world monotheism. They're still wrong. The Hebrews heard about it, wrote about it, and personified it, and got themselves into the picture. But before their entry into Africa, they had never heard about it. What Akhenaten did is to deal with the corrupt ministry of that day, then restricting the travel of people in the country based on the fact that God had limitations and that your God could only protect you in a given space. And all he did was to give them back what they already had, the fact that God was omnipotent, God was everywhere, God was in everything, and God goes everywhere. My point is that the beginning of African spirituality was a form of radicalism because the Africans gave the world no religion the Africans gave the world a universal spirituality. Foreigners 
the hypocrite took out with the spirituality misunderstanding it, converted it into cults and religions and put one against the other and tried to prove that each one of them were the favorites of God. Therefore, saying that God is love and God is merciful and God is kind, then when they said that they were chosen by God, those that they are God's favorite people, they also saying that God has stepchildren <laughs> and God is a baby. If he favored one over the other. My main point is that in this universality of spirituality, God was in everything. God was in all life. God was in all form. If you wanted to pray, you could pray to the wind because God was in the wind. <clears throat> you could pray to the river because God was in the water. You could pray to the tree because God was in the tree. But if God made man in his image and the early Africans understood this, then God was a part of you. And if you turn inward on yourself and examine yourself, self-meditation and self-examination brought you closer to God. That's right. <laughs> Once the, when the African understood this, he really did not need other people to formulize his spirituality into something called religions and into denomination. It was a radical step forward because no one had ever done that. <coughs> okay, my main point is that this kind of radicalism guided Africa through the first and second golden age. And that Akhenaten came close to the end of the first golden age. And that the recovery of independence and the thousand years of peace and prosperity brought Africa another golden age, and that golden age did not end until foreigners came again. You must remember that Africa existed for thousands of years before any invade, invasion, that the first invasion was 1675 BC. My main point is that radicalism within Africa itself expelled the invader and that the third, the second golden age began to peter out when the foreigners came again, not understanding African religion, not respecting African custom, first the Assyrian, 666 BC, then the Iranian, 550 B.C., called, then called the Persian. And they were so brutal that Africans cried out, Oh God, if you cannot send me a liberator, send me a conqueror who will show some mercy. Yeah. Now you can understand why when the little Greek called Alexander, sometimes referred to as the great. <laughs> when he knocked at the door, he didn't have to knock very hard. He was like any other invader. He was a raper. He was a raider of the granary of Egypt to feed his soldiers. But he realized one thing, that Africa was the home of the religions of the Greeks, that African radical activity had brought into being basic religion. And all of this had happened 
before the entry of foreign, that before the foreigners arrived, Africans had already embarked on a radical course. They had created one of the most intelligent systems known to the world, matrimony. They knew then that if you had a god, you had to have a goddess. While Western man tries to defy nature, African spirituality was to bring man in harmony with nature. And bringing man in harmony with nature, he would bring man in harmony with his relationship to the woman who gave him birth. And because the African had no fear of women, before Alexander arrived, the African had created a system of lineage where the women rode at the head of her army. Women did not come to power just because they were women. They had to wait their turn like anyone else. But when they became head of state, they led their armies in battle other than send them in battle. They engaged in radical activity and social thought and equality. Check out the Duke's little book, The Culture Unity of Black Africa, is very good on this point. In parts of his book, Africa, the Politics of a Federated State, is also good on this point. In his book, Africa, uh, Pre-Colonial Black Africa, is good on this point. But a group of essays he wrote for the Journal of African Civilization, especially his essay, African Contribution to Civilization, The Exact Sciences. This points to African radical activity in the sciences before the European could make a bar of soap. <laughs> What we need to do is to look behind this slavery curtain and see what happened to African people during this period of radical social change. And we need to understand the price Africa paid for internal weakness and how it had to deal with this week, the first invaders coming in 1675 is because an internal weakness developed in Africa, and Africans had to deal with that internal weakness and basically lost some of their independence while making the, the transition. Again, weakness set in and people began to move into Africa again, taking advantage of that weakness. African people have always been the prize to be captured by other people, principally because we are the world's richest people. We have always had and still have things that other people won't, think they can't do without, and don't want to pay for. <laughs> If you understand this, you will understand why the Boers want to hold on to South Africa by any means necessary. Because when they left Europe, they were soiled, religious malcontent, Calvinists. If you understand how the Europeans demean religion, you will understand that the Boers wasn't wanted when they left. And yet, being Calvinists, they belong to a religion that said 
that they are ordained by God to rule over the lesser breed. Mm -hmm. They have declared African lesser breed. This brings me to the 19th century and the examination of radicalism in the 19th century and how this 19th century radicalism relates to the antecedents of the radicalism of Malcolm X. Because his spiritual, intellectual, and religious cousins appeared during this period. People who were ultimately engaged in activities similar to him and that Malcolm X is the continuation of 19th century radicalism more than any other. He's also, he, he is a continuation of historical radicalism, but he, more directly, he is a descendant of 19th century radicalism. Now, how then did 19th century radicalism come into being? In the British Isles, British controlled Isles, the British had brought basic white technicians to do work, to fix the sugar mill, to do the blacksmithery work. This was a lower class Englishman who had no appreciable status in England because in spite of the need of the craftsmen, there was an English aristocratic class that had no great respect for people who had to earn their living with their hands. He was tolerated because he was needed. But in the West Indies, many of these same people, because the white face was at a premium, because he had a social status in a seat of blackness that he never would have had in England. He began to gamble too much, drink too much, and he began now with all the women, mostly black, he began to say yes to temptation, all those temptations. He began to pursue that temptation. And if you're going to pursue all of the female temptation you meet on the earth, you might as well be more successful than try to drink up all the water in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> it's an impossibility. <laughs> you can wish the rest, wish up on the wish for thinking and go on your way because it is impossible to partake of every single one that you meet. Well, some of them were just exhausted, some of them were broke, and some of them went back to England. But my main point here is that the African slave began to do that work, and the British had brought furniture from England, saw wood. There were termites in the West Indies who would eat that saw wood for dessert. <laughs> So they had to reproduce this furniture in the hard mahogany that was plentiful in the West Indies at that time, not plentiful at all now. So now you see the emergence of a craft class in the West Indies. You see the origin of the Caribbean free man. These people free, free with the question mark across began to engage in radical activity agitating against slavery, began to break into being revolt after revolt until they had established a class of revolutionaries that the British could barely deal with. They had brought into being more successful revolution principally because they could maintain something in the Caribbean island that we could not maintain in the United States, and that was a culture continuity. The drone was not outlawed, 
and African religions, while not tolerated, were not stringently outlawed. So they could communicate with each other based on the African religion, based on the drum language that went beyond the tonal language. So you had a guarded island of freedom in the Caribbean Island. Now, in the New England states of the United States, many blacks brought in as slaves because slavery was basically a New England business, and this is another lecture we need to, to give because most people think, oh, it much more. The South had most of the slaves, that slavery was a Southern business. Slavery was not a Southern business. The Northerners sold the slaves to the North, to the South. And when the Northern underwrote the abolitionists, the South, because you a bunch of hypocrites, you sold me the slave, now you send these damn abolitionists down here to take the slave away. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't ever want to be on the side of defending the South. And when they call the Northern a bunch of hypocrites, for selling them a slave and trying to take the same slave away from them, you pretend that they're so goody-goody, that now they were hypocrites, they still are hypocrites. Mm -hmm. on the same issue of the relationship of African Americans to the rest of the country. My main point here is that out of this free class came thinkers, people who could read, people who could write newspapers, came a class of Caribbean <coughs> who affected intellectual wedding with a similar class in the United States. This is the origin of the 19th century radicalism in the Caribbean, in the 19th century radicalism in the United States. The same form of radicalism appeared in Africa in the almost physical radicalism in the anti-colonial war and the verbal radical didn't appear in Africa in any great number until close to the end of the 19th century. And this was the missionary trained radical who began to appeal to the conscience of the European, forget it, that a person who invades your country, rape your women, take your resources, have no conscience in the first place. Now, dealing with this contradiction in Africa, the colonial wall, where they went military to the field, at the end of the 19th century in Africa, in West Africa, they began to produce men like Case the Hayford, great logic, lawyers like John Mansa Sabah, a school of radicals coming out of Sierra Leone and out of the college called Fora Bay, now the University of Sierra Leone. In Nigeria, a series of radical missionary trade radicals who took them for their word. In East Africa, man, uh, John uh, Chalemwe, who uh, began the radicalism in the Asaland. John Chidemwe had gone to Overland. He had studied Christianity. He took up with an African, with a black American, and John Lynch. They would go back to Africa, especially Christopher, in the Asaland, now Malawa. And they would ask the principal question of the missionary. I noticed you living in big houses and we're living in huts. If we're all children of the same God, then our living quarters should be equal. <laughs> now, if you move into the huts, that's all right. Or we move into the big house. So long as we children of God have the same living quarters. <laughs> if God gave you the right to have service, then I'm assuming that I have that right equal to yours. And not getting what he, the answers they wanted, they began to burn churches, 
all the way into the Congo. Near the end of that century, there appeared among them a strange thing that we have not dealt with, a white black nationalist. <laughs> John Booth. John Booth was from a distant dis element of Jehovah's Witness. He told Africans that the white man can't be trusted. <laughs> To his everlasting credit, when the Africans asked him could he be trusted, he said no. Chalemwe <laughs> 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 and John Lynch brought off what is called the Niasaland Uprising. Black radicals fighting against the German after the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 5 was set in motion a series of revolutions. The best known, the Major Major revolt in what they call Tanzania. These Africans who go into battle, dashing themselves with what they call holy water that would deter a bullet. I'm not saying it did deter a bullet, but that's what they said. And they would dash themselves, water, water, major, major. And this is called the major revolt in Tanzania. In Southeast Africa, now Namibia, the Germans wanted to create a bastard race by cohabiting with the Herrera woman. The German did not know that the Herrera woman never cohabits outside of her group, not even with another African. See, while talking about looseness and primitive and promiscuous in Africa, you quite forget that there were places in Africa where adultery could be punished by death. There are People in Africa who have trial marriages, sometimes three children before the actual marriage occurs with the approval of their respective families. There are also groups in Africa where the woman must bring virginity to her wedding bed. When you study the diversity of cultures in Africa, you will find many cultures using many different kinds of methods. But my focal point now is on the radicalness that appeared in Africa during that period. My main point is that at the end of the 19th and early 20th century, in Southern Africa, organizations that ultimately would lead to the finding of the first ANC, that the ANC faltered at first, Stimulated by the visit of Bishop Turner that we'll come to a little later, an African who became a cop out, John L. Dubé. And then he changed, he became such a cop out, being the first African to go to a, a university in Southern Africa, West Water Serac, still in existence, and to impress his wife. Us, he wrote a scholar's book called The Black Man is His Own Worst Enemy. Oh In order to atone for this later on, when someone showed him what a fool he was, <laughs> he went from village to village laying the foundation for the early ANC. The early ANC was no communist. It was a different organization that it had with the infusion of communists who may well be traitors to the ANC and who may well be informers to the South African white government. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You got to walk very carefully when someone else is carrying your coat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, at the end of this century, <coughs> now, Atalandia, 
brought into being a large trade union movement. His name Clement Cadele. This was supreme radicalism to build a movement in Southern Africa with a half a million member. Later on, Isaac Wallace would build a similar movement with a smaller number in Sierra Leone and parts of West Africa. A young radical, Casey Hayford, after the exiling of King Trempe and after the last Asante War led by a radical woman, Ye Asante War, in case the Hayford would start a demand for the return of the royal family and convert that demand into a demand for independence. When he died in 1931, he sent for his leading student trained to take his place, Joseph V. Dunqua, the sin for J.P. And he said, J.P., the mantle is yours. You do not know Africa as a custom of passing the mantle, choosing your successor before you die, and making sure that he's going to carry out the program you have designed and making sure that the people approve of the program and approve of him. All of this had been done before the death of Case the Hayford. But Case the Hayford, being the radical politician that he was, before this had found the Congress for British West Africa, bringing all the English speaking British together, and he had authored a book worth reading today. Ethiopia Unbound, maybe Africa's first nationalist novel. But something else he had written, still worth reading today, is the truth about the West African land question. And he said that land could neither be bought or sold. It was the collective property of all of the people. Now, my main point is just to let you know that that was a universal radical activity in the African world, and that a Malcolm X who would emerge later to be the inheritance of this radical activity had not been born when it started. Now, back in the United States, the radicalism in New England was around the building of free institutions for blacks. Before the appearance of a Frederick Douglass, a young Barbadian, Prince Hall, had come to America on the eve of the American Revolution. And he saw the contradictions in the American Revolution. And he said that all this talk about freedom, what about us? At this time, West Indians or Caribbean people did not separate themselves from African Americans. But they knew what a whole lot of you seem to have forgotten, that the slave, one slave ship stopped in an island called Jamaica and these Africans became Jamaicans. Another slave ship started in the island called Barbados, and these slaves became, these Africans become Barbados. Another slave ship later, 100 years later, stopped in the United States, and these Africans become, became American. That the slave ship did not bring any black Americans, didn't bring any Jamaicans, mm -hmm. didn't bring any AKAs, didn't bring any Delphians, didn't bring any Elks. Is bringing the yo low yellows or high yellows. <laughs> <laughs> All of this came as a result of the struggle to survive and people making compromised decisions in order to survive. 
some they had to make, and some strategically they made for survival reasons. Now the Africa being remade away from home began to relate to a form of radicalism away from home. This first half of the 19th century needs to be looked at because this is the period of the massive slave revolts in the West Indies, the end of the nation of Palmeiras in Bahia and Brazil, where Africans had established an independent state before the American Revolution, the crushing of the Babish revolt in Guyana that started before the American Revolution. <laughs> You must understand all of these rebel activity that started among African people before the American Revolution, then you must look at the three revolutions in history that's best known to you, all phonies, all fakes. Mm -hmm. The French Revolution in its pro proclamation that the rights of man did not change the lot of the French working class one iota. The storming of the Bastille, shown in so many movies and song and tried to, you see Ronald Coleman storming the Bastille, <laughs> early old movies, if you're old enough, and nobody's here old enough to know this but me, the man named John Bowles storming the, Ma the Bastille. Well, the truth about the matter, all the nonsense about taking political prisoners out of the Bastille is pure nonsense. There were no political prisoners in the Bastille. <laughs> Seven people in the Bastille. Two certified insane. <laughs> <laughs> One of the whiskered Irishmen who thought that he was at least Jesus Christ, on some days he condescended to be Julius Caesar. <laughs> two nuts and two nuts two roasters not even worth saying <laughs> but they have romanticized it and Dickens uh, broke tale of two cities kept quite a lot also and Ronald Coleman in jail this better thing, this is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. <laughs> <laughs> All of this movie fakery give you the illusion that a revolution occurs. The rights of man, a beautiful declaration, didn't help any French working class because the fight then was the maintenance of the slave system that helped everybody in France because some of the work filtered down to the lower classes. Building the ships, purification of the sugar, sorting the tobacco. So the slave system had, rec had, had began to reconstruct and rescue the economy of Europe. Now the American Revolution, another fate, mm -hmm. was an argument between two levels of the English, old and new, and slave masters. The founding fathers were all slave masters. Some of the great heroes of the American Revolution were slave masters. And some of the heroes were not genuine heroes. Of course, Paul Revere made the right. He <laughs> might have made it for the reason you think he made it. But he was also a bootlegger warning other bootleggers hide the stuff before the British come up with the tax. He was right for that reason, too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say he didn't serve his nation, <laughs> but he served his fellow bootleggers also. <laughs> a lazy critter, a good craftsman, good tin smith, but he was making more money selling the booze. 
<laughs> Why should he work all day <laughs> making pots and pans? <laughs> he can sell a barrel of liquor <laughs> and run and get away with it. <laughs> now, my main point is that during this period of revolution, you've got to look at the radicalism of Prince Hall. And you look at the Masons of today who have no relationship to Prince Hall, and they should stop calling themselves Prince Hall Masons because they don't have any of the principles installed in this organization by the radical Prince Hall. They told him if you're a preacher, you get respect, he became a preacher. They told him he got no respect. They told him if you own property, you get respect. So he got, he owned property. Nothing changed. <laughs> They finally told him, you've got to have an organization. And he began an organization after the British refused to give him a charter, some Irish and some Scotch, though he with the British gave him an authentic charter. And what did he call this organization? The Masons, the Black Masons? No, he called it the African Lodge. And the first thing he established in relationship with was a community school. Mm. Useful thing. Nineteenth <laughs> century early part of the 19th century, the massive slave revolt, Gabriel Prosser, 1800. Then Mark Beasy, 1822. Nat Turner, 1831. David Walker's appeal, and here we got to look at David Walker, because if you read David Walker's appeal and read Malcolm X's message to the grassroots, you will see a similarity. I'm saying, here you have an authentic forerunner of Malcolm West in David Walker and his famous appeal. You have a man setting in motion at a time when there were other blacks, some ministers, some not ministers, telling the African to compromise, the African in the United States to compromise. They walk with a lift up arm. He called for an armed struggle with the with the, the slaveholder. He called for the colored people of the world to rise up against the slaveholder. He had learned one thing that I personally will learn later on. Once you discover the unworthiness of people to rule you, your freedom began with this discovery. Now, Now, in the midst of this, you have the finest example of a leader to emerge during this half, this first half of the 19th century, Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass was not a perfect human being, and too many times we lack the ability to extract from human beings the good that they can do without expecting them to be perfect in every way. He became too much a trap, trapped by the Republican Party, but we'll talk about this later. The main thing is that a radical class of blacks did emerge in the appearance of <coughs> modern Delaney, <coughs> who went out to Nigeria, place called Abakuda, searching for a place for settlement. The argument over the American Colonization Society had occurred. Douglas was correct in pointing out that this society was ruled over by a bunch of whites who just wanted to get rid of blacks especially the black free man, because Douglas said that maybe the slave would like to trip a little better. 
Why are you sending these black abolitionists back to Africa, these free blacks back to Africa, instead of sending some slaves, freeing some slaves and sending them back to Africa? It was a good question, but the time was a good question for any time. Because that choice of who to go back told you that the, Af that the American colonization was a white scheme to get rid of black. It will prove itself more glaringly to be subversive in black interest during the period of Abraham Lincoln. And we'll just come to that fleetingly later on. But I'm saying that the first half of the 19th century, with the massive slave revolts, with the society, with, with, with that period, we can trace the radical antecedents of a Malcolm X. Using different words, men said different things. When the great minister, Henry Highland Garnett had gone to Jamaica, <clears throat> invited by the Jamaican free men. <clears throat> we had heard that conditions in the United States had not changed. He thanked his Jamaican hosts and told them, told that I am returning to the United States. I'm not returning to ask for integration because I do not want it. I am not returning to ask for justice because I do not expect it. I am returning to the United States to devote the rest of my life in trying to tear that republic down. <laughs> Black men don't speak that way anymore. We had to wait for a Malcolm X to emerge before someone said, Either we be equal in the house, or we don't care if the house stands. Then we have to tear the house down to get justice. Then this is as a consequence of the fight, because we should pursue our freedom by any means necessary. began to tell animal stories, Malcolm X was going back to the African methodology of teaching. When he was talking about the fox and the tiger, when Elijah Muhammad looked at the spectrum of white oppression and said, that man's the devil. Malcolm, Elijah Muhammad understood something which we do not still understand. Whosoever is in charge of the hell in my life is my devil. Oh. Symbol of speech. Now this is the way many Africans talk. So Malcolm X was not only in keeping with African folklore of teaching, he was in keeping with Caribbean folklore of teaching, he was in keeping with the world folklore of teaching. Because Africa illustrated stories by telling animal stories. Now let me tell you one to illustrate the point. It's a Nigerian story, an Igbo, <coughs> I mean, a told by the Evo. A snake was riding down the road on a horse, and he saw a frog who shook his head in pity. He said, Mr. Snake, you don't know how to ride the horse. Let me show you. The snake got down and let him gallop and show him how to ride the horse. And the snake got back on the horse and conceded that the frog could ride better. <laughs> Then he looked arrogantly down at the frog <clears throat> walking on the ground without any means of transportation and said, to know is one thing, to have is another. <laughs> 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 
Because I said the animals talk. Did you understand what I said the animals say? Yeah. <laughs> That's important. Because in Africa, you had talking animals. The African assumed that in as much as God had to make the waves and the ocean and the spring. They had some leaves and some other parts of the wood. He had to turn those brown. Where on the other side of the wood, he had to turn those green. Where on the side of the wood, one side of the wood, he had to start the planting season, and another the raining season. But maybe in his haste, he forgot to give the animals a voice. But the African gave him one. <laughs> so the African walks down the street and sees a crocodile and says, Mr. Crocodile, where are you going? <laughs> and the Africans began to tell stories of what the animals said. These were stories of wisdom. And these were il stories illustrating lessons in the period when there were very few books. Now let me tell you another story that's so hectic and so old, if you don't know but one African story, I'm sure you might know this one. <laughs> How the spider got his small waistline. <laughs> he was a chubby little fella, eating everything in sight. He heard there's going to be two banquets near each other. So he tied a string on his waist on the right and a string on the left to one friend now you wait over here and pull the string with this banquet star, and you pull the string with that banquet star. Now you've guessed the end of the story already because both banquet stars did the same time. <laughs> both friends did exactly what they were told to do and start pulling out the string, and that's how the spider got his small waistline. Now, African housewives tell this story to their children right now. You can eat as much as you want to, but don't be so greedy. You can eat everything. But well, why couldn't you just say it straight away? Then it wouldn't be the beauty of the poetry. Because mm -hmm. Africans would like to illustrate the lesson mm -hmm. before they say the lesson. They like to spell out the lesson. And sometimes I remember my mother, who I love like a dear, to, even today, and she would look at me with her hair on her head and say, mm -hmm. She didn't have to look the second time, because I knew that hand would come down <clears throat> in a place where it wasn't unwanted, and I would feel something. <laughs> and a warning was all I needed. So she had spoken without opening a mouth. But we began to, to speak in simple. Now, my main point, I want to let you know that Malcolm X's story about the fox and the wolves and the snakes in the grass comes out of old African tradition. And there are certain things that come down to us through time and space and everything else. Years ago, I accidentally met Ray Charles here in Chicago. I said, Mr. Charles, I believe the secret in your singing, what makes your singing so distinctive is that there is a protracted cry in your voice. And these are the wailings of the slave ship mm. coming down through the years, through the bloodstream, down through history. I meant exactly what I said. And he said to someone, who is this crazy cat? I wish I could see. <laughs> <laughs> he did not understand that our culture was inherited. There are certain things that come down to us through time and history. And sometimes 
when you don't have an answer, you want to sound important while you're looking for the answer, and you want your listener to think you know the answer, you said this is genetical transference down from the veins. <laughs> now, after that, you got to look for the real answer. <laughs> but the, this answer holds your audience for a while and gives you the time to do some more study. Okay. My main point, again, is to relate Malcolm X and his stories and his teaching method not only to ancient Africa, but to the teachings of the deity known as Jesus Christ. Now, how can I do this? Easy. Because very often, Malcolm X taught based on what was in front of him right then. He taught a lesson based on current reality. Now, to understand in Malcolm X, you have to understand this. Now, I have said in a previous place that in another time and place <coughs> and under other circumstances, a Malcolm X could have been a king and a good one. He could have made a nation and he could have destroyed a nation. That he was the finest example of leadership to emerge from the working class in black America in this century. Mm -hmm. And he was clearer on more issues and came directly to the heart of more issues than any man we have produced in this century. He did not have the time to intellectualize around this issue. That he came from the lower depths out of the Maya, and he learned from every step of the way things that he would apply later on. And what we need to look at is the circumstances in the United States that went into the making of his mind, and the making <coughs> of his action, and his ability to not compromise in a given situation once he had arrived at an explanation. Let's look at the death of his father, these early years, the mangled body of his father, thrown on the porch literally by members of the northern Ku Klux Klan, his mother growing slowly insane, the children being taken away, his early years in school when teachers discouraged him from aspiring to anything higher than that of a carpenter, planning suspicion in his mind about what he could be. Then, his gradual growth, never getting out of his mind, the fact that he grew up in a society that was programming him to be a servant of the society, other than to be a beneficiary of that society. <clears throat> coming to live in Boston, then coming to Harlem, he would become both the servant and the user of that society. He would become a pimp. He would become a user of dope and a seller of dope. He would become a waitress, a waiter, and a hustler. He would become a petty gangster, a big red. Men would, again, one would, would fear him. He would go back to Boston where he would get arrested. 
And now we see, after a while, his making in the isolation of a jail is being introduced to Islam by his relatives, brother, his reading of the literature of Islam, his exercising discipline on himself by refusing to eat pork, his slow learning that became rapid learning, his ability to try to train himself with words, taking a dictionary and starting from A, which tells you a whole lot about misconceptions of education in the United States. His fascination for, the, for Elijah Muhammad before he had even seen him. His final emergence from jail as a Muslim, heading a mosque in Detroit, becoming active in Chicago, marrying, coming to New York. And I would meet him in 1958 after my return from Africa. I was head of an exposition called the, the African Heritage Studies Exposition. The first exposition. from colonialism, from slavery to colonialism. A short journey in African history and a very tragic journey. It did not end slavery, but introduced a more sophisticated form of slavery. There's a need to define what slavery is especially in relationship to African people. And then to look at that period from approximately the end of slavery to the beginning of colonialism, another form of slavery. I maintain that slavery, that slavery and Western dominance over most of the non-Western people from the world did not end, trans was transformed. And this, and this transformation, transformation gave, gave a lot of people the illusion that slavery was over. First, let's look at slavery itself how it began. Those years between the first appearance of the Portuguese along the coast of West Africa in the 1430s, 1438 to 1442 to be exact, were not years when there were extensive engagements in the slave trade. We need to look at those years and look at the time when the monumental change took place 
Europeans were not at first looking for slaves in Africa. They came to Africa principally looking for trade, and some of them were looking for an African emperor named Presta John, who was a Christian. And they wanted to seek his help in their fight against what they called the infidel Arab. Islam and the Arabs and the African armies then dominated the Mediterranean. It had blocked Europe's entry into the Mediterranean for almost 800 years. Now Europe had come out of the period of the Crusades, part of the Middle Ages, the leth lethargy of the Middle Ages, somewhat lessening now. But the African, the Arab, the Berbers had preserved so much that was European culture, or thought to be European culture, at the University of Salamanca in Spain. The Europeans who got this knowledge from the Africans and the Arabs and the Berbers eventually used this knowledge to turn it on the preservers. Now that the European had learned again something he had forgotten, longitude and latitude, now that they began to open schools, chart making, map making, seafaring, Europe was still hit by the results of famine and plague and had lost one third of its population. Europe was basically a hungry continent, searching for an outlet. And the Europeans had lost so much of the sentimental attachment to other people and to themselves. So now, with the sanction of European institutions, the slave trade began. But it did not get underway in, in earnest until after 1492. It was after 1492, in the opening up of the so-called New World, that we find the need for a large labor supply. And because the Indians had been either killed off or died off from diseases. It was suggested that the African be used in this capacity. This was a tragedy, of course, for the African, considering the fact that there were billions of people in the world other than Africa. So the question arises, why the African in this traffic? Why the enslavement of the African as against other people in the world? Why not the Asians? There were more of them. Why not other people? Well, it seemed that the African suffered something then that he suffers now. A kind of political naivete, and he had no knowledge of the strangers visiting his land. He began to invite the strangers to Venice. He began to assume that the strangers had the same human qualities that he had. They came as guests and stayed as conquerors. The wholesale murder and disappearance of the people Christopher Columbus called Indians made it a necessity to recruit a new labor supply 
or the opening up of what is called the new world. So the business got underway, mostly initiated by Spain and Portugal. Then, with the ear of the paper trip, and part with the sanction of the paper trip. This condition continues for almost a hundred years, this Portuguese and Spanish domination of the trade. The Scandinavians entered the trade, had some success, but because the Scandinavian countries were so far away from their base in Africa, they had difficulty being supplied or resupplied. England had a difference of opinion with the Catholic Church and did not enter the trade until that difference of opinion was settled. That difference of opinion was really settled by England adopting Protestantism and creating the embryo of the Church of England that grew into a great institution. Also with its uh, rationale for being in the trade. Now the trade would last in some form for over 300 years, starting in the 1400s, ending early in the 1900s. This trade would drain Africa of its finest manhood and womanhood, of its finest resources, this is described most graphically in the best known book by the late Walter Rodney, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. It was no favor to the Africans at all. They were in one of the cruelest binds of history, a bind where they either had to surrender their neighbor or become a slave themselves. In the east coast of Africa, the Arab slave trade had started. The Arab slave trade started 600 years before the European slave trade. Drain Africa of so much energy and organization that Africa did not have the energy and organization it needed to mount an offense against Europe. Another forgotten age in world history. Now Europe has regained her control of the Mediterranean, lost after the fall of the Roman Empire. Europe is on its way to again be a world power. With again to be a world power at the expense of another people. Europe did not have within itself enough resources to change its economic system, to really change feudalism and create the basis for modern capitalism. All these resources came from outside, came at the expense of the African to a great extent. Entire towns were built in Europe, especially England, to supply not only the slave trade, but to supply textiles and bric-a-brac sent to the colonies, sometime in exchange for slavery. The rum business then began to flourish as never before. Now you see the connection between the Caribbean islands, the rum business, the buying of slaves in Africa for rum and sometimes for 
ammunition. And while England was late in getting into the business, once it got into the business, it was furious and it became a business. It was slave stock on the British uh, exchange. And many of the people that the Africans had protected in Spain, especially the grandees, went to Atworth and found the Dutch East India, the Dutch West India Company. Africa's farmer friends did not come to her assistance. Africans had no friends in all the world. It was African military might that had stabilized the, the, the Arabs in Spain, in the Mediterranean. Now the Arabs was against the Africans. The grandees were now insurance brokers and founders of institutions that will make its profit on the slave trade. So it continued from the 16th century into the, fifth, into the 17th century. Now, at the end of the 18th century, Slavery had reached a saturation point. Had reached a saturation point and had proven to be an unwieldy system of labor. And this system now came under question by the slave traders themselves. They weren't making the profit they had previously made. Now the business would continue another hundred years in spite of their misgivings. But in the 1800s, the middle of the 1800s, the British began to send an expedition out to Africa to look into the possibility of trading in legitimate goods. They wanted to say, we've got something we can offer the Africans, the Africans got something we, they can offer us. Maybe trading in commodities will make us more profit than trading in slaves. But the group that was sent out, the British in Inter-African Exploration Expedition, lost political power in the interim. Mm -hmm. And the old slave traders took over and continued the trade. But 1807, the United States began to challenge her older relatives. They made a ship called the Yankee Clipper. Now America was not buying all of its slaves from the English to Portuguese. America was now going directly to Africa and picking up its slaves. This interference and this jealousy was part of the cause for the War of 1812. Besides, Haiti had already revolted Jamaica had revolted longer than Haiti. And the system itself was in danger. The British abolitionists, Wilberforce, Granville Sharp, later Clarkston, had emerged. They were preaching against the system of slavery of the African but they did not preach against the exploitive system of child labor in England. Nor did they sponsor a single piece of social legislation in England, improving the lot of the British working class. So the, the, the abolitionists were somewhat questionable in their sincerity. All right, now, the Africans had begun to mount resistance against the system at this time. 
the massive slave revolts in the United States had already started. The slave revolts in the West Indies started a hundred years before. Now they had something to deal with. The British outlawed traffic in slaves at sea. 1807, on 1830 or 35 or thereabouts, the British began to eliminate slavery in some of its colonies. The elimination of slavery in the West Indies is highly open to question. Open to question because many of the slaves freed from the plantations now having to take care of themselves, not having to feed and house themselves, eventually returned to the same plantation where they were slaves, knowing no other labor, and hired themselves out for pittance. And the planters got the best of the deal. And so slavery really continued in a transformed way as against a more brutal chattel way because there was no place for a slave to go to seek employment to feed himself. That vine existed both in Africa, Caribbean islands, and in the United States. In about the middle of the 19th century, the uh, Moret Bay concern. In fact, there were several kinds of revolts in different parts of the island, but mostly in Jamaica, where most of the Caribbean revolts occurred. The early revolts in Cuba. Now, these revolts and the disappearance of the British craftsmen had created a Caribbean free man. And the Caribbean free man now made contact with the African American free man in the United States, especially those in New England. The winters in New England were long, and to pay for a slave all the year round just to have his labor for six months wasn't profitable. So the slave began to buy. Is, is his freedom. The industrial slave developed and he became a co ship's caulker of, well, of, of, or an industry at that time who, in wooden ships, masons, carpenters, basic craftsmen entering the embryo of American industry. But the great turning point would take place 1884-1885, when these European nations who had been doing errands for the colonialists began to have colonial aspirations. The King of Belgium had spent considerable money in his extracurricular activities Belgium, not a particularly rich nation, began to look around for something to exploit. At least the king did. All of this brought about the Berlin Conference, 1884. Mm -hmm. Now the Berlin Conference is meeting. The two dissident nations without colonies are now making a claim. Germany and Belgium. Belgium, in this conference, dealing with breaking up the rest of Africa, still not free, Belgium would get the Congo. Mm -hmm now called Zaire. Germany would get four big pieces of Africa, 
part of the Cameroons, Togo, Southwest Africa, and the country we now call Tan 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 Tanzania. Now, <clears throat> with this partial satisfaction, the French had taken over large areas of, French, of what is now what would later be called French Equatorial Africa. And the French would now consolidate the pieces of that empire into one. The British would move around to East Africa ostensibly for the purpose of stopping the Arab slave trade. But what the British did was to establish themselves and to make peace with the other colonialists and introduce colonialism, another form of slavery, mm -hmm. more sophisticated than the form of slavery. Mm -hmm. Now, South Africa is being settled by the Boers, who are the Dutch, who came there in 1452. Now they began to push the British, the British began to push the Zulus, and the Zulus began to push back. Now you've got a war on your hands. You've got several types of wars. The Zulu is trying to consolidate Africans in order to save Africa for itself as against European rule under the leadership of of Chaka. Mm -hmm. As we come down to the end of the 19th century, it, chattel slavery is turning into colonialism. Mm -hmm. Now, no slaves were taken out of South Africa. In South Africa, they would enslave the entire population on the spot. They would take the trees and the mountains and the fields and the cattle. This would start a series of wars at the Cape with the Cochon, Cochon people, or the Cochon speaking people, that the Dutch called Papa and Bushmen. And after this, the Zulu wars of consolidation would last into the 20th century, the last war being 1906. Mm -hmm. But there was wars all over Africa, signaling the end of one form of slavery, called slavery, in the beginning of another form of slavery called colonialism. But colonialism would launch a brutal war against African culture, African ways of life, African gods, anything African that made the African feel proud of himself as a human being. They would change his religion, change his language, change his clothes, change his point of view on the world, and then they would have him in a bind worse than a prison. Yes. Because they would have imprisoned his mind. Yes. And African people at this juncture began to mount some kinds of campaigns that ultimately would lead to independence. Mm -hmm. In the United States, Booker T. Washington had emerged of a whole concept of nation laws, manhood and womanhood dignity would assert itself. Mm -hmm. Not only through the 
Booker T. Washington period, but through the life of W.E.B. Du Bois, radical journalist T. Thomas Fortune, William Monroe Trotter, we were mounting an offense, a world offense among African people against this uh, change of, of system. And then we had less illusions than we have now. Yes. Bishop Turner fought not only the system of the aftermath of slavery, but the betrayal of the Reconstruction when promises were made and not kept. No 40 acres, no mule. We were in a period which Professor Rayford Logan called the Nadir, the darkest period in our history. In the Caribbean, they're beginning to fight for constitutional government. In Africa, the embryo of the fight for independence had already started. And all African people all over the world entered the 20th century fighting the aftermath of slavery and realizing that colonialism was another form of slavery. And they came fighting, bleeding, and hoping, but not surrendering into the 20th century. We have a... Dr. Clark, how many nations were involved in the Berlin Conference that all of Africa. Germany, Belgium, the United States involved. It's about 11 nations uh, who would admit they were involved, but really most of the nations of Europe with territorial ambition were involved. All of the colonial nations, France, Portugal, Spain was directly involved. There were nations indirectly involved, like the United States, who kept pretending that it was not uh, involved. How did it come about? I mean, European nations just decided that they wanted to divide Africa. No, you see, the imperial nations that had cut a bigger piece of the pie than others thought they deserved had to pay attention to these large European nations like Germany and Belgium mm -hmm. now asking for a piece of Africa and France that didn't think it had enough and France ended up with the largest piece mm -hmm. but the Belgians ended up with the richest piece Asking the question at this time. Yeah, that's what so, I mean. so at this particular time, Africa, Africa as a nation was a broken nation. It, it was, was a broken already, nation and nobody was asking Africans permission to do anything in Africa. Mm -hmm. Gold had already been discovered in West Water Strath by the British thief Cecil John Rhodes. Mm -hmm. They'd already uh, driven off or kill off the Africans who objected, especially Logan Gullah, and kill him off to take over the area that was later called Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia. So the African was in a bind, and he got into this bind because he did not understand the nature of Europe's intentions in Africa didn't understand it then, don't understand it now. The states of uh, Mali, uh, Ghana, uh, Sangay, the powerful states of The Africa, old independent states. Were they still, did they put up resistance? Were they still... But, but they were destroyed by an invasion. Now, Ghana was gone by now, by the time of the invasion, and so was Mali. 
but the independent state of Sangay, larger than the territory of the United States, was destroyed by an invasion from Morocco. Arabs. Arabs. Muslim against Muslim. Mm -hmm. Because that state was Muslim when it was destroyed by other Muslims. Mm -hmm. A fact which a whole lot of African scholars are not willing to face to this very day. Mm -hmm. So the Europeans did not participate in that invasion? Yes, they participated as mercenaries. So then it was both Europe and the Arabs. Well, the Arabs had the Europeans. Oh, okay. I see. Because they could handle modern weapons of that day. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about modern weapons, so we're talking about um, the gun. Gun. And later the Gatling Guns gun. Guns in small cannons. Guns in small cannons, which the Africans did not have. Did not have. But the African, the Amasangi had never known defeat. Three or four hundred years. And when they got wind that this group was coming across the Sahara, they sent a sufficient force out to meet it. Mm -hmm. More outnumbered it. But the Africans didn't have any guns. Uh, so the gun was the turning point. The gun was the deciding point in the fall of the empire. Now the Arabs, Berbers, Europeans, whoever else they had in this motley crew of invaders. Mm -hmm. They literally destroyed the great educational institution, the University of St. Corey. Mm -hmm. Four years after they were there, 1594, the invasion occurred in 1591. They exiled the great scholars, mm -hmm. including the great master scholar, Ahmed Baba. So if we're talking about this period, an African um, civilization would have been compared to European, if not greater than European, in terms of its education. The its Western education. Sudan had an educational city in addition to a great university complex at Timbuktu, the University of Senkoli, whose standard, standard was so high. Many times Arabs came down in the Western Sudan seeking jobs as teachers who were not qualified. And Ahmed Baba, who wrote 47 books each on a separate subject, wasn't trained any place except inside of West Africa called the Western Sudan. Mm -hmm. Didn't go to Europe, didn't go to Western Asia, didn't go any place except Africa. And some of his works still survive to this very day. He wrote a book on Arab grammar that's obtainable. Mm -hmm. And he tried to tell these Arabs, we're your co-religionists, we're your, your kin and faith. Let them know, we're Muslims too. Mm -hmm. And just slaughtered them. Pay no attention to him. This not only was a tragic event in the history of Africa, it was a tragic event in the history of Islam. In the half hour, about 12.30, we will open up uh, telephone lines and also uh, basically give those of you a chance in the live audience to pose any questions or uh, comments to Dr. Clark about his discussion today. That discussion, again, uh, from the last chapter of forthcoming book, uh, which is now on pamphlet form, called Can African People Save Themselves? Let us welcome back Dr. John Henry Clark and the talk. <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Parker, you were talking uh, a few moments ago, I guess, when you touched on the issue of knowing our history. Being in this particular month of uh, Black History Month, which of course was initiated by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, I've heard some people from time to time have a criticism about this being one of the shortest months of the year and winding up being that month. But I don't think that, that Dr. Uh, Carter G. Woodson had in mind that we were only going to study our history uh, in one month of the year when he initiated Negro History Week some years ago. Your thoughts about this issue of uh, our history being studied all year round as a part of our natural uh, way of life? Well, I've been an advocate of all the year round, all along. Uh, Dr. Woodson, because Abraham Lincoln's birthday comes in February, and so is Frederick Douglass's, he wanted to have a week, really, embracing those two birthdays. He wasn't precise about when Lincoln was born or Douglass, because they weren't too precise about it themselves. But uh, I think the idea was good, and the idea of the week set the month in motion. I think history is a consistent thing like living, and we should have history at our breakfast tables and have it at, uh, at home in our churches. I would replace history with the Sunday school lessons, and instead of having Sunday school lessons, I'd have little, little printed lessons on history. Uh, all these social organizations and fraternities and sororities, instead of all this stupid initiation and sororities and, and, and fraternities and go through, you get in based on how much you know about history. And if you want to get into, tell me about Queen and Zinga and her battles with the Portuguese. Tell me about a king named Shamba Belongongo in the Congo. After they drove out the Portuguese, he took the Congo to his golden age. He tell me, what is a golden age? Name five books about Shamba for long gone go. I mean, uh, and uh, the rumor is that, and the assumption is that Chaka, the greatest of the Zulu warriors, four white people. Do you know that most people got the information wrong? Chaka fought no white people at all. He fought other white, other blacks in order to consolidate South Africa to save it from the whites. Right. We see we get so many things wrong so easily because we don't read. Now don't want to read Debo, we don't read Abel <laughs> on the subject. We, we, we call this cocktail history. You know, you grad, your undergraduate degree is one cocktail, and your graduate degree is another cocktail. Second cocktail, you graduate, your PhD is the third cocktail, and then you know everything. And you read one book. You're listening to WLIB The Work. We continue with a talking drum with Dr. John Henry Clark in the series again Can African People Save Themselves? I think uh, we're going to save ourselves. We've got to first understand ourselves. We must understand the African freedom explosion in the world, in the Caribbean and in Africa. Remember now, in spite of all the talk about blackness and the black revolution and the need for a black university, there's not a single black state in the Caribbean islands or in Africa. They're all imitation European states. We must bring into being the role model of an African state based on African values and African tradition our enemy fears a people with a value system more than they fear a people with an army. And when a people destroy your value system, they destroy something among you more valuable than your defense system. We have to regain our value system. People must say, I don't do that because we're just not that kind of people. <laughs> and mean it. We have to restore some of the things we had in this country, in Africa, and in the Caribbean Islands. The fact that everybody looked after everybody. If you understand that, it was kind of a community enterprise. He was a little child, he hadn't got his clothes fastened. Everybody's concerned about it. Until he gets to get himself straightened out and somebody wipes his nose and you know, and 
Did he tell his mother's kid was out here unkept? Uh, who was responsible? Whole community zeroing in on a single little item. A little child didn't have the clothes button. That was humanity. Mm -hmm. Now we say, touch my child, I'll kill you. I mean, you should be touched. We have to get back to the point where everybody's concerned with everybody. Now you're fine. And we might have to have a block by block organization. You see a stranger in the block, hey, what you doing here? He might bother somebody, he ain't got no business bothering. If he's seeing a lady in the block, ask the lady, is he straight or not? No. Who is he? Seems like an interview with interference with your privacy, but we got along a little better when people cared enough to interfere sometimes because sometimes your privacy needs to be interfered with. <laughs> to your benefit. So we, to save ourselves, we must get back some of the old community values we used to have. I came from a family of nine children. I was never at home when a child was born. Because on the eve of a birth, one of the neighbors took the children and kept them until the birth was over. Nobody asked them to do it. They just did it. In the neighborhood, if there's a feud between two ladies, if there's a serious illness, the feud is off. And the lady she's been feuding with starts bringing her soup. And once she's well again and on her feet, then the feud starts back again. <laughs> but nobody struck at you when you had serious difficulties. And when the community reprobate, the biggest drunk, liar, womanized in the community died, he got a decent deal. We say, it's out of our hand now. Let God take care of it. That was part of our humanity. I noticed this when my stepmother died. We never, we, as children, we said, she's not going to die anyway. She's going to evil away. <laughs> Why does she evil the way? <laughs> when Dr. Pugh and everybody singing her favorite song that she cannot be replaced, her seat in the female amen corner should never be occupied because she's irreplaceable. I wish somebody would replace her. <laughs> Being rich and tired. <laughs> <laughs> but she's dead now, so nobody, nobody's thinking about it. <laughs> how hard she used to whip me. <laughs> it's all over now. It's forgiven. Then having studied African culture on the spot, and having studied the culture in New Orleans, the backwoods of Alabama, I know that we are beautiful people. And we've got a lot that we can use to save ourselves, but we've thrown so much away. We need to regain. There was no such thing as an invitation to a wedding. It was assumed that the community is invited. <laughs> so the community came. It was assumed you're going to bake a cake. So you bake a cake, there was too much cake. But everybody had plenty of cake and some to take home. And nobody got hurt. And sometimes there's some confusion as to who's going to fix what. Then the, everybody fixing it was too much, and so everybody took some home. But the bride and the groom didn't pay the money. No weddings cost thousands of dollars. It cost nothing. <coughs> that, that was our humanity. We have to get it back again. In this country, in the Caribbean Islands, and now, then we have to stop telling lies about each other in our respective uh, uh, development. The Caribbean Islands, you had a majority. In Africa, you had a majority. There were certain things expected of them that they have not delivered. We in this country could not have delivered the state 
no matter how wise we were, we could not have delivered the state against the odds that we have always had arrayed against us. We expected Africans who had enough number to gain control, control over the state apparatus. And that hasn't been done because too many people have been imitating the concept of government as laid down by their former colonial masters. We have to free ourselves from this period of imitation. We've had a generation of imitation. We have not looked back creatively. This is why we have not successfully looked forward. Had the members of the civil rights movement looked <coughs> back at that 19th century that was 10 times more radical than they were, sure. they could have built the 20th century. That's right. That's right. Yes. They didn't look back to, to their foundation That's right. that right. they could build for the future because they didn't know the past. And ultimately, they come and they end up betraying each other. We have to look both ways, but we cannot ignore history. We cannot ignore that clock that we need to tell our time of day. And people who come came before. We cannot ignore the fact in the 19th century we produced ministers ten times more radical than Martin Luther King. Henry Holland and John Rangel Ward, these men around Douglas, and at the end of the century, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. That's way back. <coughs> because we have a revolutionary heritage among the ministry, as long as, as well as a revolutionary heritage among the people. Slave revolt, 250 slave revolts on record. We had the most successful slave revolts in the Caribbean islands because in the Caribbean islands they could maintain a cultural continuity, an African cultural continuity. They weren't broken up so often. Slave revolt in large lots and they generally kept the lots together. The slave master thought they could work them better that way. They were right. But they forgot one thing. They could revolt better that way. That's right. Because they, they kept their language together. They kept their drum together. They kept their habits and their customs together. This is why the first clear nationalists in the Western world I mean, would, would appear. He would come from Jamaica, but he was sold to a plantation in Haiti. Boatman. He called for a black heaven and said if he found his slave master at the pearly gate, he gonna slay him right in front of the angel gate. <laughs> so we talk about the Haitian Revolution. We give credit to Toussaint, Dessalines, and Christophe, as we should. But that revolution was set in motion by two slaves formerly from Jamaica, Mackendell and Bokman. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> and Jamaica fought longer and harder than Haiti and did not become free <clears throat> because the British could destabilize the revolt in between. And it takes 10, sometimes 20 years to mount the momentum for a revolt. Haiti's revolt unfolded over a 20-year period. And each time one leader fell, another one was right there to take his place. Beautiful. And it worked out that way. It had nothing to do with who was braver. Haiti was fighting that old silly, neurotic, uh, fascist Napoleon. <laughs> England had freed some of her soldiers from fighting the Spanish. Plus the fact England had an internal army in Jamaica, and the descendants of that internal army is still in Jamaica and still causes some trouble that a whole lot of people won't talk about because they're a little bit ashamed of it. That is the Jamaica mulatto 
who has made up his mind where he belongs. He can't be English. He don't want to be Jamaican. He's contemptuous of being African. And he stands in between. But these are some things we whisper about and dare not discuss openly. But in a true fight for our existence, we have to tell all the fractions and the halves and the almost whites, come in the house and stay, or go out and stay. We haven't got that nerve yet. We cannot fight a true revolution with people with split loyalties. Mm. Mm. We either have to be for our cause or against it. If you're against it, you have to suffer the consequences. Go ahead, go ahead. That's it. We might have to start dealing with the so-called black conservative. Yeah. Here, we have to deal with the bastardized mind as against the physical bastard. We must deal with the mental bastard. We must deal with who, or who are black and loyal to whites to the extent that they will betray us. Dr. Clark, could you, um, for a moment, take us into, into Brazil? It, it is an area in terms of South America that not many people really are clear about in terms of the Palmares and the Quilombo and that whole situation. No, Brazil was the great human laboratory during the period of slavery and after it because, see, when the Pope said to Spain and Portugal, you take the East and you take the West and you do, you too. Catholic nations stop fighting among yourself. Spain got more than its share. Then when Portugal approached the Pope, the Treaty of Tartacellas, 1493, gave Portugal, Brazil. Brazil was so big, the Portuguese couldn't manage it. Then there were two Portuguese slave trade, one supplying Brazil, one supplying the general Portuguese slave trade. Portuguese was so, I mean, Brazil was so big, many Africans in Brazil bypassed the auction block and went straight to the forests and the hills, were never slaves. See, and here they found two distinct African cities, Palmares and Bahia. Palmeiras lasted about 110 years. And another thing, <coughs> the Portuguese scraped the human barrel. We took the poor Portuguese, the wretched of Portugal, the wretched of the whites. And when they got there and announced to these wretched people who hadn't been treated too well in Portugal, all of this is for the mother country. They said, the hell with the mother country, this is for me. <laughs> <laughs> so they began to separate Brazil from Portugal. And when there was a shortage of white women, the Portuguese petitioned the Catholic Church for the right to marry the black woman. And marry the black woman she wouldn't marry them unless she was free. So you have a, the beginning of a free black woman, then she not only, she connived to free certain members of her family, then convince the Portuguese that you, you're going into the hinterland, you got labor. The only way you can control them, you gotta free them. So you see, the beginning of the Portuguese, the free man in Brazil, who would feed the revolts in Palmeiras and in, uh, in Bahia. Bahia. And out of these relationship between the Portuguese man and an African woman, two other rulers of Portuguese 
of, of uh, Brazil emerged. Pedro one, Pedro two. There's a book by a man named Ramos called The Negroes in Brazil. Worth reading. The best known work on Brazil is by their greatest living writer. He must be 90 now, but he's still alive. Gilberto Fryer. The masters and the slaves and the shanties and the mention. He's really the greatest documentary on Portuguese um, history. There's a work by Price, uh, Richard, uh, Richard Price, called Maroon Societies in the Americas, dealing with runaway slaves who farm <coughs> secret arms, including in, in the United States. So it's assumed that Maroon Societies existed only in Jamaica. They existed all over the Americas. They're best known for their existence in Jamaica. But Brazil, one of the largest countries, a country with a majority black population, but they managed to convince the black population that they have no problem. And that is their problem. <laughs> Being convinced that they have no problem. No one has explained why they're on the bottom. If they have no problem, well, everybody else got more than they've got. Mm -hmm. But they're stirring now. They've got people in the Senate now, and one of them is quite a friend of mine, a great artist, Du Nestamento, Abdus Du Nestamento. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he's doing some great things. He's a good writer. The one uh, item that might not, you might not approve of it, is that he's married to milk instead of chocolate. <laughs> 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 we'll let that one go for a moment. <laughs> Dr. Dragon and Clark are going live at the World Famous Apollo Theater. I think we just got a we will just for a moment, we'll come back to the studio of Dr. Clark's pocket, also the chance for you to talk with him directly at our center stage microphone, of course, on our telephone line. Before mm -hmm. we come up at the GDB at the Apollo on top radio of the night, he's definitely going to have you. Our quick note, we'd like to actually uh, acknowledge the presence of the students from the Liberty Partnerships Program at Orange County Community College, Newburgh Extension. Uh, we are pleased to have them here today. Let's give them a big round of applause to the students for serving here, especially during this past time period as well. Also, an announcement, the uh, Grand Council of Gardens is presenting a gift of white blood drive. It's going to be happening on March 9th between 10 and 4 p.m. in the press room at One Police Plaza on the second floor. Uh, due to the demand of rare blood traits that are found uniquely in the African-American community, uh, the Greater New York Blood Bank has made an urgent appeal to the Grand Council of Guardians to solicit donors from the membership. Again, all uniform and civilian members, family members also to give blood, blood and will receive high, half price entry to the NYCPD Guardians Association Oldies with Goodies Night over at the Mark Ballroom. Uh, there will be more details to follow, but again, keep it in mind, March 9th, 10 to 4, uh, the press room, one police plaza, a gift of life, blood drive. We continue with our talking drum during African History Month. Our guest today, Dr. John Henry Clark, who concludes in the last few moments before we begin to take your telephone calls and talk with you directly on his lecture, Can African People Save Themselves? Dr. John Henry Clark. Thank you very much. We, of course, need to look at Brazil because it is the largest African country outside of Africa. It is the one country in South America where an African can become head of state legitimately without a coup. I mean, if they all voted, they could just vote him in because they got the numbers. It's just a matter of a political awakening. But we also need to look at the rest of South America. Guyana is a part of South America. Look at its background and its revolts. Look at the so-called Bush Negro revolts in Suriname. All these things were well written about, well documented. 
Because I read so many books being self-educated. See, self-educated means, mean, formerly educated people read what the professors tell them to read. I read all of that in, in the book the professors tell them not to read. <laughs> because they're dangerous. All the more reason why I would read them. So uh, a good self-directed education is far better than some form of education. Now, I'm not telling anybody not to go to school by all means. If you can get two PhDs, get it. It's, it's just an academic it, it passport. It's, it's a work passport. And it makes things better for you. And you don't have to have any sense, but you, you <laughs> <do it. laughs> But if you throw up a certificate up that's a PhD, you got the job. In some cases. So I'm not knocking it, but I'm telling you it's not essential to having great information. Because the people who set in motion this inquiry into our history were people with the minimum of formal education. J. Rogers didn't finish high school, and he did more work on the black personality and human history than any man who ever lived. Okay. Mm -hmm. Charles C. Cypher, another one, <laughs> from Antigua. Oh, Jamaica, a lot of Jamaicans don't know that J. Rogers was Jamaica. Mm. Yeah. Cyber, who did a lot of work and didn't get published, including a extensive work on the African contribution to the Brotherhood of Man. A lot of Caribbean scholars and South American scholars have done a Excellent work. We need to study. We need to study Walter Rodney, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, and his PhD thesis, Slavery on the Upper Guinea Coast. We need to look at Raphael Powell, another forgotten Jamaica, his work on the human side of a people in their right name, because he was the first person to repudiate and debunk this word Negro. It shows they had no, it had no meaning what we are concerned. We need to read Richard Moore and a new book on him by his um, daughter and son-in-law, Richard Moore Harlem Militant. We need to read his little work, uh, The Name Negro, Its Origin and Evil Use. Mm -hmm. Well, we can put down some of these papers that slander and insult us and long to read some of the things that will uh, make us feel a sense of pride in our in ourselves. Then we we'll need to read some of the monumental work written on our cause by some neglected white writers. Joe Massey, six volume work, Egypt Light of the World, Book of Genesis, Book of uh, the Beginning, Natural Genesis. Long before Bunnell's work called Black Athena, there were pioneer black writers doing the same thing. Nobody paid the slightest bit of attention to it. Now that a white man writes a book on the subject, everybody's doing cartwheels. <laughs> <laughs> He takes a lot of his information from Dr. Ben. You read his work, but you don't read Dr. Ben, who he took the work from. If you think I'm scolding you, you're right. Yeah, that's, that's good you need to be scolding. You really need to read our writers. We are all good writers. But you start with, start with our writers. They have to eat too. They pay rent. Tom Edison don't make no exceptions. He's a writer. I'm going to let him use his lights free of charge. No such thing. <laughs> but take a little time and pay a little attention to what I'm doing. And uh, all this talk about Malcolm X, and if you forgive the modesty, I did a halfway decent anthology 20 years ago, and now I've been reissued. The situation has been changed. I didn't feel called on to change a word of it. Because what I said then is still true. Would appreciate it if you read that. 
I got old beat up brownstone, but I still pay uh, mortgages and <laughs> water. <laughs> Well, appreciate your patience. <laughs> Dr. Clark, what's the schedule for, for the book that you mentioned, which is coming out again? Well, the, um, he said May or June. It's the African World Press. He's also bringing out a book of uh, the lectures that Dr. Ben and I delivered in London, uh, New Dimensions of African World History. We've added material to it over and above the lecture. And that's supposed to be ready in February. Now he said March. And of all things, a lot of people don't you know. I used to be a poet too. So uh, thanks to a lady from Barbados who lent me $360, I had a book of poetry published in 1948. It's now going to be reissued. Mm. The early poetry of John Henry Clark. That's supposed to be out in March also. So I'm going to have a lot of books in the, my three books on Harlem um, in, uh, in the process of being ready to come out again. Harlem Voices from the Soul of Black America, Harlem USA, and Harlem a Community in Transition. So uh, when you see them and if your pocketbook is disposed to give me a hearing, I appreciate it. We have some people who have been holding on the telephone uh, for quite a while now. We'll take those calls and then move into our live audience. If you have questions or comments for Dr. Clark, uh, you can line up at our center stage or your microphone or whatever comments you'd like to share with him today. We'll start first with our telephone call zone right now, 692-9542 and 1-800-332-1023. You're listening to Talk Radio at the night, WIV. I'm going to talk to Gary Rivers. This is the GDE Live at the Apollo. Good afternoon. Hello? Yes, good afternoon. Yes, uh, Dr. Clark, I'm going to talk to you about the Apollo. Fine, fine. Uh, I appreciate you uh, naming those books on, um, about what to get, what to read, and uh, to keep it up. And also, I'd like to ask, uh, Mark, ask, are you, did you say, I, I don't know if you were about to be, one of y'all said that there were people before Adam and Eve, and if it, if it were, you know what I'm saying, about it, what book could I get for that information? Well, I didn't, I didn't say it, but it's true. Uh, what, uh, book, uh, what can I find that information? Any book on the origin of man will trace that you can get Dr. Leakin's work and Dr. Leakin's uh, son's work called Origins, Robert Leakin. Right. And every time, I, every time I mention that, it's hard, it's hard for people that I say it to. Uh, it's hard. And then what I want to be able to do is to pinpoint that information. Well, you can pinpoint it in these books. Uh, Dr. Deacon is the African evolution of man, and, and in his John Jackson's introduction to African civilization, the, his uh, chapter on the origin of, uh, of man. Now, if the Adam and Eve story is true, mankind is about 6,000 years old. Now, what are we going to do with the information that proves that in Ethiopia alone, Functioning mankind is about five million years old. Thank you, Dr. Yes, good afternoon. Hello, you're here. Yes, good afternoon. Good morning, Dr. And then Dr. Clark. And it's one thing that I very rarely, if ever here, you know, I hear stories talk about, and that is the amount the numbers of estimated Africans are uh, being uh, eliminated from the planet and the, and the amount of uh, Europeans that have been killed among themselves. I heard it once said that there was an estimated 100 million uh, Europeans killed among themselves since they've been keeping records. And uh, an estimated 300 million of us. I'd like Dr. Clark, you know, to speak to that. And one other thing, what we would we do when the, the Europeans, in mass, invade Africa. 
for their natural mineral resources. And what are we to do? And what and what and what is our people in the Western world going to do about loyalty then? And where would that loyalty lie then? You're speaking from a military perspective. That's right. I understand. All right. Thank you. Now, there have been several holocausts in the world, and remember, no one has a monopoly on the word holocaust. The holocaust of the slave trade, if we're going to believe Dr. Du Bois his work, the suppression of the African slave trade to the United States, his estimation is from 60 to 100 million. There have been new ex estimations since then using more scientific data, especially by young Nigerian historian in Kora, and he said that it could have been 200 million. And he's gone through the ship's logs and, and then how many was taken out and how many was delivered, and so his estimation is close to right. Between World War One and World War Two, close to two million Europeans were killed at the hands of Europeans. Now, since colonialism, after so-called slavery, I maintain that slavery is still with us. That was transformed, but not eliminated. Now, in the Congo alone, they must have killed 25 million or, or more. And that at least 50 million Africans died in the colonial system not including those who died from starvation and deprivation. I maintain that Europe's impact on the world has been an act of protracted mud, and it still is. Thank you for the call. The second question, of course, goes to the issue of uh, European invasion of, of Africa. We might want to call it part two or something like that, but he's posing what happens in the modern age if we ultimately see a military invasion of the sort occurring right now in Iraq and Kuwait, occurring in Africa at this time, what happens to the loyalty of African Americans here? I, I anticipate it. Mm. I anticipate before they give up the great middle wealth of Africa, especially Southern Africa, they will invade Africa using black troops. And I maintain that meant some of these black troops will be reluctant and some of them will kill Africans. And I say that this is an internal tragedy within our community. We better start dealing with it. We better start dealing with it soon. Who is loyal to who? Because if African, this country turns on an African, in Africa, we should not let him ever walk to earth in peace. Amen to that. Dr. Um, just an explanation point on that. In relationship to uh, the initial conference that occurred, I think, around 1884, where, where, where the colonial forces actually got together, had a meeting, and decided on how to carve up Africa. It's not a well acknowledged piece of history in the educational system. But can you just briefly? That's what. what Barry is talking about is the petition of Africa, the so-called scramble for Africa, when a degenerate king, Leopold, needed some money to support the various houses of prostitution that he frequented, and his insatiable taste for women in finery needed more money than the state could punish him call the conference and see what part of Africa he could get. He was helped by Stanley, or the so-called Stanley Livingstone fame. Now, if you believe the whole story about Stanley looking for Livingstone, then uh, don't be my guest, because Livingstone was lost. And when Stanley found Livingstone, Livingstone told, told Stanley to get lost. He went up in that Africa and hooked up with some lush and plush African lady. He was happy. <laughs> <laughs> he found a black paradise. <laughs> <laughs> um, the main thing is that 
all those nations in Europe with enough muscle, who didn't have enough of Africa, decided to make a claim. Portugal got more, France got larger peace, but Belgium got the Congo, the Germans got four big pieces, Tanganyika, that's what they call it, Southwest Africa, now Namibia, the Cameroons and Togo. Well, they, they literally split up, uh, up Africa to themselves and they had no part of Africa was left free. Liberia has always been an American colony and still is. Ethiopia was so under the persuasion of the West that you could not successfully call Ethiopia independent at that time. Not thoroughly independent now. But the idea was to keep the wealth of Africa under Western control. And that little drama in the sand right now is to keep that area of the world under Western control. And the confusion is that the people of that area, because of their oil and their riches, got associate membership in the white club. They think they're full members in the club. <laughs> and they were slave traders too. For a thousand years before the Europeans came and started that slave trade. The African slave trade lasted a thousand years. But the brothers who are Muslim don't study Islam. They study Arabism. And they're not Muslim, they're Arabists. But they won't deal with this. We're live the World Famous Apollo Peter. We've got the judge in the front. We're here to go. We're going to come with you inside the live audience and your questions and comments right after this in the GBE from Talk Radio WLIV. Well, from there, by the way. I have a question. I'd like just a clarification. Uh, now, from what I, I've heard, I'm trying to understand the best way for us to move forward as a people is to adopt some of the habits and the uh, traditional interactions as a people. And based on that answer, I just have one other question. So is, am I understanding you correctly, Dr. Clark? We go back to some of the traditional things that held us together before our life was interfered with by foreigners. Hmm. I'm not necessarily saying get another religion because we had very good spirituality before the coming of farmers. Okay, now based on that answer, now obviously the state that we are in today, something at some point along our history had to have gone, I mean, drastically wrong. So we obviously can't adopt that whole concept to bring it back today, but what would we have to change so we will not see ourselves in, in the situation that we are internationally? What major thing do you think we have to adjust? We have to face the world as a unified African people and stop breaking ourselves up in little segments of black Americans, North Carolinians, Trinidadians, Jamaicans. We are not responsible for those slave ships put us down. Because the slave ship didn't bring in the Jamaicans, didn't bring in the Trinidadians, didn't bring in the black Americans, didn't bring in the high yellows or low yellows. We <laughs> brought African people. We have to learn how to be an African people again. We have to learn how to communicate with the people in Africa again. And the Africans, the Africans especially the European educated Africans or the missionary educated Africans have to start being African again and not an imitation of Europe created by missionaries. And that would bring us to the greatness that we, we once, once held. That would introduce again the possibility that we cannot reconstitute any society in total, but we can reclaim the spirit of it. Now, just one move next, from that point. One other brief question. Now, do we have enough time? Because, I mean, the bombs that we have in existence, will man destroy himself before we regain that? And that's my last question. Time. Take the time. Stop making excuses. <laughs> <laughs>
Good to have you here. 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 Good to have you Black people shouldn't be afraid of death because they syndicated death all over the world. Everybody can die. They syndicated funeral parlors, graveyards. They, anybody can die. But our point is that we don't want to fail to realize that we don't want to tell the truth about the crook. The crook is the truth about the crook. The European was the crook. I mean, you know, I told them before the other day, the crook do not wear sneakers. <laughs> Remember that, the crook don't wear sneakers. He smoke a fat cigar, he got a PhD, and he got a big office building with a pretty car and a chauffeur and somebody doing his work for him. So once we realize that the crook is what he is, and we get our mind together, I, I find out one thing about us. When you, when a person starts to lecture to people, first thing you got to be done, is you got to ask people that want to be free in the mind to stand up, they want to be free in the mind. Forget your body, first you got to free that mind, and everything comes through that mind. Once you free that mind, and then there's no problem about the, the brothers in Barbados, the brothers in New York, the brothers in South Carolina, the word won't spread that everybody want to free that mind. Let me jump in, Dr. Clark, a response to that one? Well, I have a problem with looking at people who use power to take more than their share as crooks. But I have some difficulty with people who make heroes out of crooks <laughs> and will not use their own strength to remove the effectiveness of, of the crook. We will not do the best by themselves and their children. I think we waste too much time with sheer nonsense. Mm -hmm. Time that can be more productive. We waste enough energy on the dance floor to build 10 cities. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to that one and move on. Right ahead. Your question will come to Dr. Pike. Very quickly, please tell us one. I have said that uh, a Chinese that has a PhD would be no thing about Chinese history or culture or language. He would not be considered educated. An English American that has a PhD would be no thing about England or English culture. He would not be considered educated. But an American black man that has a PhD knows nothing about his history, language, law, or culture. Not even about Charlie Parker. What do you think about that? Well, that's true, because we're the only people who can be educated with no knowledge about ourselves. In fact, many times we are educated in order to escape from ourselves. We have to reverse the picture. I don't think you're truly educated unless you know your people's philosophy, people's folklore, know their history before slavery, and know their history as a consequence of slavery. And if you got that kind of education, <coughs> the PhD is not essential to your education. Mm -hmm. We're young men, we're um, What can we do now? We can unite right now, and we can stop telling lies on each other, we can stop fighting each other, and we can realize that we're up against the most evil monster the world has ever known. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we're in our final few seconds. We have a telephone call standing by. We'll take that before we wrap up. Go ahead and please share any of Dr. John Henry Clark. Yes, good afternoon, Brother Gary. Good afternoon. And good afternoon to my hero. Dr. Clark, I want you to join me in a prayer, and I don't usually pray. I want you to pray with me that Israel bomb Mecca, and therefore bring everybody together in the final war so Africa can have its freedom. I want you to comment. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Praise God. Well, brother, this is a historical thing that I think let's stay out of it. If it happens, let's not accept any responsibility for it at all. Dr. Clark, you, you shared something with me. Uh, you, shared, you shared something with me years ago, and I'm not going to be telling this. There was something you were talking about history, and on certain dimensions of history, you have to be careful looking for the good guy and the bad guy. Yes, because uh, Hollywood has trained us to look for the good guy and the bad guy. And there are human dramas in the world, especially the war in the East right now, where there's nothing but bad guys. There ain't no good guys there on, on no side. 
when you think it's a good guy who's formed a slave trader, I would not be, be surprised in as much as now Russia has joined the whites, joined the uh, Americans. I said this to Kenneth Clark a few weeks, almost a few years ago, and he went off, he was so liquid with rage. I said, I would not be surprised to eventually see the Jews and the Arabs join in an alliance against the blacks. Then when he calmed down, I said that great historians do the same thing as great lawyers. They cite precedents. After the Africans and the Jews lost Spain, the Jews some Jews went to Holland, joined the Dutch East India Company, became administrators of the slave trade. Many of the Arabs went back to Africa to reinforce the Arab slave trade. That's my precedent. It has already happened. Dr. John Henry Clark, let us thank you for joining us. We're talking yesterday to the world famous Apollo Theater. Brothers and sisters, don't forget to join us tomorrow. Dr. Betty Shabazz will be with us as we pay tribute to our Ohio's Billy Shabazz Malcolm. Thanks for joining us. My big deal from the church. What you learn to experience it, the end of experience is the best teacher. I'm going to tell you, Gary don't forget, Dr. Riley this afternoon's special guest, Miss Billy Simon Sidney from the stage play, Let Me Live, actor Robert Jason from the Office of Public Affairs, Resources and Administration, and Deputy Commissioner Martin Franklin, who is really up to stop the violence. And also, your representatives from the group of East Ten Advisory Council, so stay tuned. It's just to take a few, I don't know how much time we have until our interview begins with, I think the Purnell family is in the back. Reverend Sharpton will be with us on the telephone. I think we might have a few minutes before that to speak on whatever's on your mind. If uh, the microphones are here, are they up yet? Not, yes. Is there one yes? Yes. All right. This is the day of Malcolm's anniversary of Malcolm's murder. Um, it is also the first day of, of the rest of our lives. Anything you would like to speak of, my African family. Please come right in. Good morning, Sister. Ray. Good morning. I'd like to say to Malcolm a, a poem that I wrote. Mm -hmm. He was so beautiful and so much more than just black. The sun was not reflected in his blackness. His skin was somewhat fair. White ancestry whispered through his features and sought for recognition in his hair. And yet, he was so beautiful and so much more than just black. Thank you. That's a great point. Our blackness is a, is a difficult part of us. I mean, it, it has to do with our spirit, but we are more than just that. We are much more than that. Um, and that is, I'm glad that's a bit of creativity, and she put it on to someone who has brought us uh, guidance and inspiration. Uh, I remember the first, not the first time, but I, when I first heard of Malcolm, I was kind of scared what he was saying. I really was. I said, I was in show business. I said, mm. But in that fear, there was something else because he caught me. You know, he made me stop and think. Uh, and the more I listened, the more I said, aha, uh -huh. the more he made me slow down and listen and begin to think. And whenever I'd see him on television, it was a passion, you know. At that time, we had our people speaking so much truth. We pushed lies out. You know, we upset this system just by speaking truth. Can you imagine? And then when they wanted us to change, they, they, they sort of seduced us into giving us jobs, giving us things, giving, now you have it, now cool out, relax. And as I said, we started to relax. Relaxed our minds, we relaxed our hair, Relaxed everything. Okay? We relaxed so so much we just went backwards. You know? Then suddenly in the 80s we were saying, What happened? What happened? You cannot relax. The, uh, uh, justice and truth does not just come easily. It's something you have to constantly work at because it is something that uh, a lot of people grow fat when there is no justice. A lot of people grow rich when there is no justice or injustice. 
And we as the oldest people who created value systems have to hold those value systems because that is what will keep us alive. You see what's happening with all these great folks around the world, destroying the world. Good morning, Brother Man. How Good morning, Emil. How are you? Fine. Good morning, fine. Um, this morning, I was walking down the street, mm -hmm. and I look at the headlines of the post that I don't read, and it was very disturbing. They had that the, the um, GIs, they were in fear of dying. Mm -hmm. Yes, one over there. And that really disturbed me very much, you know? Mm -hmm. And I have a cousin over there, and really, it's very sad. And I think that we should come out today at 3 o'clock and support the, um, you know, the GIs, and they stay up from today at 3 o'clock and arrive. Support the GIs? Yes. Not the war. Not the war. No. And that's a paradox in a way. Yes. We support their coming home. Right, that's correct. We support their stopping this, this war. Right. Um, Thank you and for that. And I understand that feeling, that right. sorrow that you have. Because, uh, because the best of our men is, will, be dead, will be dead over there. Are the best of the men, they're like educated ones. Yeah. And it's a shame, yeah. really. It is. But we have to create an alternate. See, those, those brothers ran in, in, into the service because they had thought that they had nothing, no, no place else to go. Right. And where are our institutions? which give them guidance. I'm, I, it hurts me walking down the street, see all the brothers, young brothers, right. standing on the street. It does. If we were organized, we would have some place where they would, could go. They would want to go. They need to be trained and giving something to the community. That that should inspire us to creativity. Well, I think churches should get more involved. The churches should get more involved. And you have you know, young brothers and sisters out there, you know? Yes. It should. Right. What can you do today to help what I'm trying, what I did yes. a lot today, and informing people to come out, the young people who come to the that yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. But we have to start some kind of organization. Structure is right. what we need. Structure. Thank you very much Thank for you. that, brother. Thank you. Any other comments? I know things are on your mind sitting here, sitting back. Good morning. Good, good morning, morning, brother Ozzy. I wanted to say something to I heard the brother just now make the reference of getting out there. Yes. It's so funny that. We allow other ethnic groups to do things to us, and we're so crisis oriented. Mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't be that we have to get on a microphone. I was so proud and honored when I seen the Haitians. Mm -hmm. This one phone call, and they blocked that street up across the bridge. Mm -hmm. All we have to do is do the same thing. Shops and closes, shops and closes. Let's get out there. I think yes. the next call should be March 18th or 19th. I don't know by Monday. Albany, New York, because as you just mentioned, there's no place for our youth to go. Yeah. The governor has cut out every single thing for the black community. Yes. And we should get up there at least just to show our presence, let them know that we as blacks know what he's trying to do. And I have made my commitment that I'm going to have as many off duty black police officers to come out and be the marshals and talk to those police so they don't Great. look like those people. Great. Great. We need to see you. That's very inspirational, the off-duty police, black police officers. We need to see more of them. We hear too much about those who are cooperating with this system of oppression. Uh, you know, this is the time for us to put on our marching boots. You know that. And keep them on. Go to bed with your boots on. You understand? Because there's so much happening. We have gotten out of the, 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 the habit of moving. Some of us have, now, some people here I see at different places at rallies, at meetings, at organizations, they're organizing and doing things. And, and I don't want it to, to come in our minds right now and press us that we have, are not a people who have done this before. Throughout the years, we have been in the streets by the millions. This is nothing that we haven't done before. We just have to start it again. Start it again, but come out with plan, with organization, with strategy. And also, um, as I think Brother Maddox said the other day, with our leadership in one place, creating the plan and the strategy and the soldiers doing what soldiers do. The generals do what they do, the soldiers do what they do. Together, there's victory. Uh, and we must begin to organize some more in that way. If you'd like to call in this morning, we would like to hear your thoughts also. The numbers here, are six nine two nine five four two six nine two nine five four two or one 
These are times when we need to love each other like never before. You know, if you love somebody, you take action. You know, love your people. Do you love, do we love our people really? It's hard after everything that's happened to us for us to really get out there and really put that into action. But this is what we have to do, it's action time, people. Action time, organize, strategize, and action time. Correct action, just as they had in the, in the old virtues. Brother Malcolm taught us a lot, who here uh, I guess I think everybody is old enough to have seen Malcolm. Let me see. Did you all meet Malcolm? Did you all see Malcolm? Let me see the hands. Did you? Where did you? Come up, brother, to the microphone. Tell us when you saw him. Would you like to come to the microphone, brother man? No. Sister, would you like to come and tell us about when you saw Malcolm? Anyone here? Yes, brother. Come right on. Up. It's important. When you first saw him, that was that feeling that you got that he gave you. Yeah, um, I saw Malcolm when he actually started, came to New York about 1956. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather was the uh, manager of what we used to call the Wayside Casino, yes. which was the, the Garvey Club before that. And today it's the Mosque, 116th Street. And uh, That's where the Garvey Club used to be? Right. <clears throat> yeah, I know the history of that because my grandfather was a manager. Also, I saw him, uh, Malcolm, Many times when I'd shop on 125th Street uh, in front of the Hotel Teresa, he started with a, a Sears and Roebuck lap, and he would just stand up there and, or, you know, just speak. He was a street speaker. Street speaker. Yes. And then uh, about two years later, the crowd started to form. He took over that whole corner, and then he built him a wooden platform. Mm -hmm. See? And uh, on that wooden platform, as we all know, Dr. Ben used to sit there in the back and just listen to uh, Malcolm. Dr. Ben did? Dr. Ben did. You can see that on some uh, old um, film of Malcolm speaking. You yeah. can see. I know, I see Farrakhan sitting there. And Dr. Ben also. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw him in those days. We used to shop at, uh, buy our shirts at AJ Lester's, you know, stores of that nature, because I'm a, a Harlem native myself. And that's good to know that a lot of people here are not born in Harlem, so, so they don't know that particular history. Right. And when you saw him, what was your response to it? Well, uh, we, you stand there and you listen. First, uh, originally people would just walk by, and then one, one or two people would stand, then three or four, mm -hmm. and that attracts a crowd. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go outside right now, just look up in the sky. Uh, other people look up, look up in the sky also to find out what are you looking at. Well, looking at Malcolm was like looking up in the sky. It, it was. It made you look up. Yeah. It made you grow. And I grew up on 18th Street between Madison and Park Avenue. And what happened was, when we didn't know exactly when Malcolm would be on the corner, so somebody else would be uh, shopping, let's say 125th Street, and come in the block and tell us, and we'd come out the block in group, walk through Mark Morris Park, mm -hmm. and get there to the corner to get the knowledge of what Malcolm was teaching. Yeah. Um, the man was um, phenomenal. You know, they used to describe him as the most dangerous man in America mm -hmm. when, they, when he was coming on right. television. And then the, the white announcer would sit there sort of quaking. <laughs> Malcolm would sit there very composed right. and just destroy all of the lies, all of the myths. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a, a tremendous man. I never met him in person. I never saw him in person. I only saw him on television. Right. But I felt him, and I was moved by what he said, and taught by what his spirit. Uh, it's nothing like having a strong man. Thank you very much for saying that. Right. He came, one, one other thing. He came to New York City in 1956, uh -huh. and he needed some office space, and it was rented to him at the Wayside Casino. And then now the rest is history because the Muslims took over that building nice. as of today, and that building is a historical building in Harlem. Check it out. Thank you. Thank you very much for that Harlem history. Uh, there is nothing, and I'm saying this as a woman, there's nothing like being in the presence of a man who knows who he is, and you get the feeling that if something happens, 
I met when those people, when women who fall down, oh, save me. <laughs> but that feeling that you know that this man is there, he can, he would stand up for you. He would protect you. That's a fantastic thing. And women, African women, needed to feel that more. So brother men out there, think about that. When they're in trouble, if they call, be there. That will change this world. That will give the women much more power, much more strength, and you too. So have that in, in your mind. We're going to take a break in a minute, but and when we come back, we're going to uh, Reverend Al, Al, Al Sharpton will join us by telephone, along with the Philip Purnell family, live here at the Apollo Theater. Um, they will come and be seated here, and the brother will be on telephone. Reverend Sharpton, I think, is on the line right now, so we're going to go directly to him. Good morning, Hotep Reverend Sharpton. Hotep. Hello? Yes, Brother Sharpton, we're Hello. here. Good morning. Good morning. African man. Yes, ma'am. How are you, African woman? <laughs> I'm fine. It's good to talk with you as usual. Good to talk to you. Uh huh. The Parnell family, I believe, is here in the back of the uh, the theater. Are they I, us. They're going to be joining us in a minute? Yes. Okay. Reverend Shopton, please tell us what's on your mind. What is happening? Well, I'm here in uh, San Francisco, California. Because today at Berkeley, both of the uh, the Omegas and the Alphas, both black sororities, have brought uh, us in to deal with the Persian Gulf situation. And for the first time, they're going to march together through the streets to deal with this question of how our people are being used as gunfire in the Persian Gulf. We will be announcing here at Berkeley, as Dr. King and others did in the 60s, that we are giving the president a deadline to bring the troops home, or uh, we will begin mass civil disobedience in 10 cities around the country. Okay. And uh, we want people back home to know that we're going to be dealing with this. New York, of course, will be one of them. We're also going to be telling people to not use the yellow rivers, but we're going to start wearing black rivers all over this country to stand up for the amount of Africans that are being used in the first assault. So uh, that, that's the first thing on my mind. Secondly, we'll be coming home on Saturday because Sunday night there will be a huge rally in uh, Inglewood, New Jersey to deal with the Pennell case. We must not leave our work unfinished. The uh, murderer of Philip Pennell, Officer Spam, goes to court next Tuesday. And uh, many of us marched and were dealing with the case, but sometimes we start and stop. We cannot stop. So we want everyone to meet the Pennell family. We've got all of the leadership of New Jersey will be there to speak. And uh, Mr. Pennell and others can give the details on where. But I'll be coming back in to join them Sunday night so we're ready to deal with the murderer of Philip Pennell there in uh, Bergen County, New Jersey on Sunday night. It is foolish to me for our people to be fighting uh, people that have done nothing to us and then people that shoot our children in the back, we can't show up and fight them, but we can pack our bags and go miles around the world to fight for our masters and can't even fight for our children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're on point as usual, Reverend Charlton. Uh, we will be speaking with Purnell's family here, but it's interesting to me you said the Alpha and Omega. Yeah, this is the first time. Together. Yeah, both times, uh, both groups have come together for the first time, and uh, uh, it is shaking up a lot of the so-called white leftists out here who've been meeting and talking with us because we told them our position is different than theirs. We are not just for peace in some uh, peripheral way. We want our children home because there's nothing in this war that has to do with African people. These oil companies are, are racist. They trade with South Africa. They exploit us in the United States. So it's time for us to stop this. If they want to have a war, have it without us, but bring our children home. And if white folks want to have a war, they can have a war. But we have nothing to do with it. And we're going to hang black women all over America. The rich get rich and the poor get poor. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Reverend Chopin, thank you so much. The All right, family yeah. is here, and we're going to speak with them. And uh, we, we need to see you soon. I'll be here uh, Sunday to be at Inglewood. I hope everyone comes out and support the Purnell. 
Thank you. All right. We're going to take a break for news. We'll be back in just a minute. Buenos dias. Oh, it's always good. And I see we have been joined by the third graders from PS92, the Safety City Program. Let us welcome them to the sound stage. Welcome, young people. Good to see you. Good to see you here. Come to hear part of our story. Let me read to you some words from Langston Hughes. What happened to a dream deferred? What happened? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Does the justice dream explode? We have here the Parnell family. They have been victims of this injustice, a deferred dream. Let us please, uh, family, welcome them to the stage. We have Thelma Purnell. Good morning, sister. Good morning. The father, Philip Purnell, senior. When we have the daughter, Natasha Parnell. Good morning, sister. And with them is Mr. William Alston, David L. of the African Council. Good morning, all of you. Welcome here. Reverend Sharpton um, spoke of an event that's going to be taking place in New Jersey. And if you could tell us about that and tell us also how are you doing? We know this has to be a terrible strain on you over this long period of time. Um, what has been happening in your lives? Well, uh, like April 10th of last year, that uh, my son was slight bully, murdered by the people that we paid to protect us. He was chased out of the park. He just ran up against the fence. The officer chased him out of the park, ran him up against the fence. He had his hands in the air. And that's surely a sign of surrender when you have your hands in the air. He was calling for his mother and telling the officer, please don't shoot. The officer turned around, planted himself, and blew his back apart. 16 years old, didn't have a chance to live. And from April 10th until now, it's been Hard times for my wife, my daughter, a lot of sleepless nights, and there's no reason for it. I mean, if the kids can't go to the park and play, where can they go? And this is a terrible thing. And this rain is on all people of color. And I, ex I just walk a lot, I just cry because I see on the highways that our brothers and sisters being spread eagle on the highways for no reason at all. And you ask the officer, like, why did you stop me? He said, sir, you crossed the line or your life was out or like, and then he'll bluntly tell you like, you know, where you going? You're going the wrong way, you know? It's just, what it is is a harassment yes. on our people of color. And this has got to stop. 400 years ago, they brought us over here in the hull of a slave ship with yokes and chain. And I hurt for that. But we feel say we free. We're still not free. No, All people of color, we still in just as much slavery when they brought us over in the hull of the slave ship. It's up to all people that we gotta unite, we gotta get together and we gotta put an end to this nonsense. With one voice. That was very, very, very moving what you said, brother. Uh, Mrs. Parnell, being the mother of 
the dead me. Well, being the mother, I go over and over the day before this happened. If I could have did something, or if I could have went down Phoenix Road, or if I could just turn back some of that time, but it's impossible. I know God don't make mistakes, so there's a reason for this. And it's not that it's because my son was slain, it's to put no inflection on the black young youth. It's because the way that this cop killed him, I'm sure that God put him in a line too to stop these police from, from hurting and harassing our young teenagers. And it's up to these parents to listen to the young teenagers because the way this world is now, they don't know which way to go and if they can't turn to their parents, where, who, who are they gonna turn to? Because many, many times, I was open for my son to talk to. But all the time, you can't get next to the heart. You don't know sometimes where, where the mind and heart is. But you have to take time to listen to these young kids out here. Because believe me, they have a lot to say. And I understand that. I really do. And they might be gone to the next moment. I suppose these deaths, these murders, we have to be jarred into action. And so his life was not taken in vain. Uh, we must make it right. We must use that to give us courage and direction to get up and move. And stand up and speak as a people. When people hear you respect yourself, then they begin to respect you. And this is what we must do. And, and we thank this young brother for being that, if you will, sacrifice. Um, now, you're, Natasha, you're his younger sister. Yeah. How did this affect you? What, and you and your, your your friends, what do how do they respond to this? What, my friends? You and, and, oh. and your friends. Would you come just a little closer to oh. the microphone? I um, think back on all of the times when I used to talk to him and like play around with him and the memory is with me and I can't and I and then I think to myself that I can't play with him or talk to him anymore or hang with him or anything like that. And it's just, it's a hurting feeling. And I just, I, we have a room at home that we put all my brother's stuff in and sometimes, and all his pictures, and sometimes I just go in the room and just close the door and just look at his pictures and just sit and just cry. Yeah. I can understand that. Mr. William Austin from the African Council. Your group came together around this issue. Yes, um, Philip and I have been friends for 20 years or so. Excuse I me, you're gonna have to turn the mic around to you. Yes, that's right. I live across the street from the family. And being raised under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm and a lot of brothers and Minister Barco. We as a black people, when things happen to our family, we have a tendency to, um, you know, avoid the issue by not coming out and supporting each other until it happened to one of us. Well, it hit, it hit home when it hit Philip because my son is 21. And um, when I sent him off to school, uh, he was having the same problem. So we, we called for him and told him to come back home. Um, when this death occurred, it, it, it was just like it was my son, and that's the way that's that's the way it should feel to every black or uh, Afro American uh, uh, in this this country it could because be. yes, it's it's a matter of time, and the African American man in America is an endangered species. Um, why did they have to shoot Philip in the back? These are the questions we ask, and until black people as a whole stand up and say never again, because the Holocaust was nothing compared to the blacks that died here in America. And this this country is our country. Um, we have more rights than anyone because we put the time in. And until we stand up as, as a whole and say, we are one voice, one people, and never again, and they will back off. That's all we have to do. But all the different organizations that are around this country must come together, the NACP, the Rainbow Coalition, and join hands with Brother like Brother uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, because in tru truly he's a good brother. Because when the African Council was in, in the stages, they came to us and said, Brother, um, we support you. And we led uh, 30 some marches on Teaneck, 
We led a march 77 miles to Trenton. And we just, we, we're not gonna back off. We're not fair, we're pe our people. We are not gonna back off by no means because um, like Malcolm said, the price of freedom is death. If yes. we're not willing to sacrifice, then we're not ready to be free. That's right. What kind of life do you live uh, if you're on your knees all the time? Um, it is about family. Family. If we could only, only begin to come together in love with one another. Um, when one of us is hurt, we are all hurt. We must stop that. The only way some people understand is that, yeah, Malcolm said you have to speak in their language. If we have to first come together with that love that binds us and then speak with a strong voice, we are going to take a break for the news. We'll be back in just a minute with the prayer of the family. sharing with one another some of our strengths and our pain. And, uh, we've come to, uh, you've been invited to join in prayer for justice. The Philip, Philip Parnell family needs your support in prayer. Now we are here, we have with us the guest of Parnell family. The family of Philip, 16 year old youth, I believe, who last year was shot in the back by a policeman as he had his hand raised, asking not to be shot, and again, asking for his mother. He knew the danger that he was in. And so what shall we as a people do about this? He was our son, he was our brother, our older brother, our younger brother. What are we gonna do? It's about taking action. And we have the family here with us, they have shared some of their pain, some of their views, and the history with us. Um, what are we going to do? That's the question. We cannot not do anything. We cannot not support them. Um, William Austin David L. is a uh, member of the African Council. And since this happening, he has begun to, begun to organize with other people around this tragedy. Tell us more about what's going to happen, please, on Sunday, February the 21st. Sunday, um, February the 24th, at Shallow A&E -E -E Church in Inglewood on 129 William Street, we're going to have a prayer uh, rally, uh, prayer for justice for Mr. and Mrs. Bernal and Natasha, and to bring the, the family out and say, you know, we need you. We need your support because we know that this trial is going to be about a year. And right now, Gary Spaff, the PVA, and other uh, uh, associations are taking care of this officer. Mr. and Mrs. Bunnell, the family are going through a, a tremendous bur a burden when it comes to taking care of themselves. Financial uh, burden. Financial burden, yes. yes. And we, we don't look and, and say, look, brother, you know, uh, you know, it's not necessary for him to ask for something. Yes. We should be willing to give. Uh, uh, take care of our family, whether it's in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, South Carolina, Mississippi, wherever. Uh, we have been abused all over this earth. And I, I think it's time that we, we take a stand and, and, uh, and, go, and, and go about business as, as usual and do what we're supposed to do. Uh, Shallow uh, Church, the uh, clergymen in Inglewood are supporting us. Uh, Urban Lead, NACP, uh, Reverend, uh, Reverend Sharpton, his movement and some local officials. But at first, they thought we was a bunch of crazy radicals, that's what they call us. And uh, well, a lot of, the, lot of the people in the community call us radicals, but we, we, we say, okay, now we see that in John 4, so we, we sometimes have to forgive and say, okay, brother, sure. we're radicals, somebody has to be a radical. Uh, there were statements going around that, uh, you know, we don't like Reverend Adam Sharpton. I said, well, if you don't really like Reverend Sharpton, then if you would stand up and be a man, then we would need brothers like Reverend Sharpton. And, and, and those are the things that we went through as an African council in Teaneck because um, it was it was very difficult. You know, uh, Reverend Sharpton was considered to be an outsider 
Well, we had actually come to America. You know what I mean? We were we're outside. We were, we we're not outside. We were drug here on our, against our will. And now that we're here, we must make the best out of a bad situation. And I think that uh, with Philip's death, it shows us that when a family is divided, God sometimes come and take Jesus. one from you to teach you a lesson. Right. Um, Molly said, how long shall we let them kill our prophet or the book must be fulfilled? Well, we have written a mighty large book and I think it's time in 1991 to, to do what we have to do. Uh, people don't know how hard it is on the family. And I sometimes, uh, you know, can't even imagine, you know, the things that they're going through for this rough, you know, and it's not gonna get any better because going into this trial, this guy is gonna try to get off. Uh, he said he's not guilty. They came back with an indictment of uh, reckless manslaughter. If you can give us reckless manslaughter, why didn't you could, could him murder. convict him on murder? Uh, the Mary Mitchell, the Eleanor Bumpers, the Michael Stewart, the, uh, I mean, there's cases. I mean, and, and not only that, there's a lot of things that we are doing to ourselves that we first must respect ourselves. You know what I mean? Um, we know that the man is uh, the devil. We know it's, na it's nature. And now that we know that, let's get about, uh, take care of our business. You know, I, I look into all different types of fields. We're working with a lot of college students at Valley Dickinson and um, King College and Rutgers and stuff like that. And we, we're gonna take care of our business in, in the state of New Jersey and throughout the Northeast, you know, with the help of Reverend Sharp and other brothers. Oh, that's all right. We have to, as a people, if we respect ourselves, we have to do this. Nobody else is going to take care of us. Why should they? We have to take care of ourselves. That's our that's our responsibility. That's our job. And we have to, because of our experience here, many of us walk with fear. Fear of white people. Fear of their disfavor. Fear of what they might think. Fear that they might not smile at us. Fear that they might take our jobs. We create our own jobs, we won't have that fear. And we have to get past that fear of white folk. There's nothing to be feared there if we are together. And if it's known, really, that they are afraid of us. That's one reason why they behave the way they behave. But they behave that way because they're afraid of people of color. They're afraid of the lies that they've been telling about us for all these years. So we have to overcome that fear. Our fear. You know, they have to overcome their fear, but we have to overcome our fear so that we, we come, it, well, as soon as we hear something happens, we're right there. You know, just as now we wait until somebody dies and then we come and we bring some cake for the, for the wait and we come and we sit. That's not it. These people, we all need to give support to one another. When we eat, they should eat. When they, we pay our rent, they should pay their rent and their bills. That's the way family works. And we have to get together to do that again. That's why at the beginning I said, turn to the one next to you and hug. And some of us couldn't do it, you understand? We have to throw up in our arms and hug one another. Who cares? There was a, a, a statement some years ago, I think that Ozzie Davis wrote it in one of the plays, that it's fun being black when nobody's watching or something of that sort. It has to be fun, don't care who's watching. You know, more fun when they watch. Um, so this family needs our support. It's we who need our support. And it's going to happen on Sunday at the Shiloh AME Zion Church, 129th and William Street in Inglewood, New Jersey. The time is 8 o'clock. Let us go. Let us put something aside, whatever we're going to do, and be there to be with our family on Sunday. And there's a thing that we have now, sometimes we hear about praying. People say we got to pray, and people say, we just enough praying, let us get away, we need some action. Prayer is action, you see. We don't understand what prayer really is because it's been made something else over here. During the Middle Ages and, and other times, as soon as Europeans found out what was happening in Africa, they formed things called monasteries. You've heard of those monasteries? Where these supposedly religious people go and they pray all day, all day. And there are many of them all throughout Europe and South America. What do you think they pray? They didn't pray until they learned it from us. Why do you think they're doing it? 
because they know the power of the word. They know the power that it inspires you to action and that there are other things that happen when you pray. And when we pray in song, go back to the civil rights movement. You see people, what are they singing about? Singing in, in word is power. Those people faced down the devil when they were singing. You know what look at Look at his eyes on the prize. Remember those times? That wasn't long ago. When we faced down those people who were beating us with sticks and we got a measure of success out of it. Now we have to continue with that success, but we cannot put down that power. When you get together and you begin to pray, you create movement, movement. And you inspire one another to go out and you can go through anything. And so when the brother said, come and pray with us, go and pray because you're creating power when you do that and singing together and saying words and saying your thoughts together. That's why I'm always saying we must tell our story because there's power in telling your story. So be there on Sunday with these, with our family here to, to help give them that power and help give you power and then to move, help you to think. Think of new ideas, new approaches, because we can't go along the way we, we've been going along all this time, doing the same thing, because they learned it. From the 60s, they learned what we could do a little bit, and they checkmated us. Be an African spirit, we have to go back into our creativity and come up with something else. We've always done it. Let's do it again now, because this is uh, the one more river we have to cross until we get home, until we get where we, we are supposed to be as a people. And we do it through family, through values, through principles. And these, this, this tragedy is giving us an opportunity to grow, to grow to where we're supposed to be, to stand up. Look at yourself in the mirror when you go home, brothers and sisters. I want you to see a new face when you get there. I want you to see power when you get there and love in your people. And I want you to see that African manhood and that African womanhood that is there and family. And then with that, nothing can stop us. Nothing can stop us from helping this family and, and preventing this from happening again. When people see that African spirit, all they can do is drop back. They, it causes confusion because you have the power. We have that power. Let us do it. Brother Man, you have something else to, to tell us. What I like to say, like I say, I was, the, the place is, again, 129 uh, William Street is at Shallow AME Zion Church in Inglewood, New Jersey. The telephone number is area code 201-568-5560 or area code 201-569-6905. If you need information or direction to get there, I think there, was, there might be a bus. I, we talked to Rev about having a bus here at the power coming over to Jersey if you need transportation. But um, it's, it's very simple. If you want to go to the GW Bridge, you can take the 178 bus and get right up on William Street and walk right down the block. It, it runs right there from the uh, uh, GW Bridge. Find it, people. Find it. Okay. Um, it's, it's necessary that we we uh, we do that and support this family because, like I say, we we know that this is not the end. The police department in this city, uh, throughout New York, um, they feel like uh, Mary Mitchell was going to do them some harm and we can't see that you know we're not going to let that happen and black men i, I say to you um we know why we were put in a situation uh, with no jobs unemployment and no choice but to go to a war that's not ours like Reverend Sharpton said before we're not going to benefit we can't burn oil in the summer we're not going to burn oil we don't own, own oil companies but yet and still we can control football, baseball, and basketball, but we do not have yeah. black management who control the athletes that play for white establishment. Yeah. We can close America down tomorrow if we decided yeah. to. But if, are we going to stand up and do that? That's the point. I guess it's just a so like to you know, tell the people like uh, what happened, that my son was no doubt at murder. The bullet ricocheted off his fifth rib his lungs exploded. It went up off the fifth rib and cut the main artery in his heart. So he was no doubt he dead on the spot. And this man said he didn't do nothing wrong. This was cold blood murder. It took us two grand juries, 10 months of hardship. And this just started. On Tuesday the 26th, we we're going back to court once again. But this perpetrator, 
that he's no doubt that in his mind he knows that he's a murderer. But the system won't even let him say it. And this is a system that our young people got to come up through. Mm -hmm. I go by the courthouses, you see the, the lady up there, the skills of justice. You notice there's a tip on it. It means just us and the people of color don't apply to that. I just want to say I need uh, your support in going back to court on Tuesday the 26th once again to try to put this perpetrator where he should be. The last time that we went, when he was arraigned like two months ago, they had him in and out of there like in two minutes. If it hadn't been us, we wouldn't have been going out. We would have been going in. Yeah. They sneaked him out of there in a van. Yeah. To take him back home and like 20 minutes later, he's got two kids of his own. It was He made a statement in the paper that the, him and his kids was laying on the floor playing. And my son, with his back blown, blown away, we can't play. My wife and my daughter, we can't play with him no more. So, to make the statement, what I'm trying to say, that all people of color, we got to protect our own. We got to get together and we got to protect our own. Because there's no justice in this white man system for our people of color. And they shall have no peace. Let us thank our, 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 our family for coming and, and, and sharing with us this tragic story, their pain, and their inspiration. Because they, they, their being here has inspired us. I'm seeing tears in your eyes, and they've certainly been in mine. Uh, it's because we do love them. It's because they are our family. So let us thank them and be there on Sunday, the 24th, Englewood, New Jersey, Shiloh AME Zion Church at 8 p.m. Put all else aside and be with your family and bring support because that's what they need. You know, when we're in trouble, sometimes they fire us from our jobs. Then all kinds of expenses come. We're going to take a break and we will be back in just more. Let us thank our family. right now, Carl Ferguson, WLIB News. Well, Iraqi President Saddam Hussein has been addressing his nation for just about 30 minutes now. He starts at 10 o'clock our time. It is still dead. We want to, I misidentified some young people here a little earlier. And I want to correct that. <coughs> We want to welcome the students from PS 123 and PS 154 here with us this afternoon. They're part of the Community District 5 and Apollo program. We cooperate every Thursday. Our young people come here and perform or talk and explain uh, what is going on. And I want to recognize uh, Ms. their teachers, Mrs. Harwell, Mrs. Uh, Bernard, and Ms. Box. Please, thank you for bringing them. Thank you for coming with them. Good to see you. And we have as our guests on the stage here, those who are implementing a program that has to do with safety in the schools. Uh, they're kind of dangerous places sometimes, or getting to them, or coming from them in the dangerous. So I'd like to introduce you to um, our guest, it's Teresa Tompkins, Assistant Director of the Injury Prevention Program at Harlem Hospital. Let us welcome her. And I'm not sure if I have this right, but um, Sheriff R. Whitaker, A. Thompson, that's the brother, that's you? Ronald Whitaker. Ronald Whitaker. Ronald Whitaker. Uh, thank you for coming. It's good to see you. All right. And I am not sure where our other guest name, what is your name, brother? Andrew Sharp. Andrew Sharp. Welcome. To the Apollo, to the um, <coughs> Community District 5 program. 
safety in the schools. What is that about? Why are school are our schools unsafe or getting there and coming from? Well, in fact, getting to and from school is uh, quite a problem and quite dangerous for some of our children. Um, in fact, it is the leading motor vehicles are the leading cause of preventable death to children ages five to fourteen. That's citywide. It's uh, more than fire and falls, which we hear about so often. So uh, we're here at uh, Safety City is trying to do something about that problem. I see. Excellent, Mr. Whitaker. What is your your role? In this? Well, I work with the Safety City program through the Department of Transportation and Board of Education. We have set up this program at PS92, mm -hmm. and I instruct the children on a day-to-day -day basis on ways they can make it to and from schools in a safe fashion. Right. You, you work in the schools? I work in the school system, yes, throughout District 5. And you travel from one school to another? Well, we have a program set up at PS92, which Mr. Sharp can give a little more information about. Mm -hmm. uh, Safety City is a, a comprehensive traffic safety program for the third grade children of District 5. It's located at PS92, but we serve all uh, 14 elementary schools in the district. And our mission is to um, get children to be responsible for their own safety, to make choices uh, which protect their own safety. Um, and we do that in a hands-on education way. They come to Safety City, uh, we have an indoor learning center where they uh, participate in activities with Mr. Whitaker. And then they go outside uh, where we've set up a simulated street. It's protected. It's been built on the play yard of PS92. And it's a simulated street where a team of instructors, uh, local police officers, uh, traffic agents from the Department of Transportation, and crossing guards who volunteer their time, teach the children and instruct them how uh, they can make safer choices when they're getting around the city, riding in cars, driving their bicycles, uh, or to protect their own safety if they're faced with uh, an adult who has been drinking um, and then decides to drive. Um, so it's, it's all about taking responsibility for your own safety. What kind of uh, safety prevention things do you, what do you teach them to do, <coughs> Mr. Wick, in your program? Okay, at Safety City, children uh, learn about decision-making processes. Uh, children do not memorize absolute rules, so we teach them concepts and try to help them identify tools that they can use when they're in the streets, mm -hmm. uh, tools that will help them to cross the street, so tools yes. that will help them to move around in the street. Uh, I would like to touch on that a little later when I bring some of my students up because they're, they're our best up? example and best symbol of what actually goes on at Safety City. Okay. So I'll hold that information for a little while if you don't mind. All right. <laughs> now, after something has happened, I imagine that we come to um, um, Teresa Tompkins at the hospital. Yes, well, um, the injury prevention program comes out of the pediatric trauma unit. And what happened, we saw how many of our children were coming in from motor vehicle accidents. Our program was designed to help improve the um, park. But we found that the children were being hit because the parks wasn't good. We started fixing up the parks, but then you had to reteach children to come into the park and not into playing into the streets. So um, we got together with the DLT because they were looking for a, a site to put Safety City. And we worked with them with our injury data and with theirs to develop this. And then we will now um, do evaluations. Each time a child is hit by a car, we have a questionnaire. We ask them if they've been to Safety City, you know, so that we can see whether children going to Safety City are still getting hit by cars. And so far, we have not had a child who's been to Safety City come in that was hit by a car. So the program is working. We see it as working. Who participates in the, in the Safety City program? And it's just young people, just elementary school? Correct. The, the students are third graders yeah. um, because they, are, they fall into the highest risk category, mm -hmm. um, and yet they're developmentally most ready to learn about um, decision making. And um, they're also out there on the streets. Um, they are crossing and at times moving around the streets by themselves. Uh, so they are the ones who participate in the program. What are some of the concepts that you teach them that, that, that guide the Safety City curriculum? Uh, well, as I mentioned before, um, our main 
concept is taking responsibility for yourself, that every child has decisions to make which uh, impact his or her safety. So that uh, when children come to Safety City, we ask them, um, is that the safer choice? Um, you have a decision to make. I know the children here have heard those phrases over and over again. Um, and in order to get the children to uh, make a safer choice, we try and design activities which build up their confidence in their decision-making power and build up their self-esteem um, in their decision-making power. And those that self-esteem building and confidence building has impact in other health areas as well, nutrition, uh, for example, choosing healthier foods. Choosing um, a safer way to school is all about protecting yourself and, and um, loving yourself enough to want to live a long and healthy life. Um, so that's what we're striving for and that's what guides our activities. Um, in addition, we urge children to um, take responsibility and help others to share their safety information with parents, um, with their schoolmates, and we have some uh, audio tape that we'll play a little later of follow-up activities that the children have done uh, with their schools. Um, and finally, we, we try and teach about environmental awareness, opening your senses to the world, opening your eyes and your ears. Because when you open, open yourself up to those signals, then you can make safer choices and, um, and be healthy. Uh, just before we go to our break, just a are parents involved in this? Um, yes, they are. Um, as I said before, we um, give information to the children that they can share with their parents. Um, and we're working on activities which will involve the parents, bring them to Safety City, um, working with the PS92 Parents Association. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a break. This is Camille Yarbo sitting in for Impotet Gary Bird. We'll be back right after this. Break. District 5 concerning safety school program. And I want to turn everything over to Brother Ronald Whitaker right at this point, who's community coordinator. Ronald. At Safety City, students learn about safety as decision making processes. Children do not memorize absolute rules, rather, they identify tools and gain knowledge and skills which help them to be safer if they choose to use them. They learn to evaluate situations and choose a course of action, ideally, the safer course of action. Every behavior has its consequence. The more accurate the children's information is, the more power they have to adapt their behavior and to achieve the results they want. At Safety City, the philosophy is, think before you act. Students will develop their ability to make safer decisions and avoid undesirable consequences by gaining knowledge about their environment and about themselves. The sights and sounds of the city provide a wealth of information. When children open their senses, seeing, hearing, touching, and smelling, they become safety sensitive. This is one of our main objectives at Safety City. Today, I'm honored to have a few of my past students with us. I have Ms. Carrie Thompson, Karan Nixon, Michael Bumpers, and Crystal Randolph today with me. They're from PS123 and PS154. And it's my belief that these children can show us even more valid information about what the program actually does by talking with them about what we've learned and what we've shared at Safety City. First question I'd like, and I'd like to pose it to Mr. Michael Bumpers, and I'd like to say to him, what do you always have to make before you cross the street? What do you always a decision. Make? Always make a decision, that's excellent. And Crystal, um, let me ask you, what type of decision do you want to make before you cross the street? A safer decision. You want to make a safer decision, okay, that helps us out a lot. We mentioned something about safety tools. Can you tell me something about safety tools, Carrie? Your eyes, your ears, your mouth, these are all safety tools that the children use every day to cross the street. Sometimes they don't think about the fact that they use them, but once they've attended Safety City, they become to they come to understand and realize the importance of using these safety tools. Are there other safety tools that we use when we're in the streets, things that are already there in the street that help us? Can you tell me some of those, Karan? Crosswalks, islands, traffic signals, and... 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ron. Those are some of the things that are already in the street, and we have a street furniture at our location at PS92. We have created a street environment, which includes all those wonderful things the children have just mentioned. And it's wonderful for me because it's been six months since I've been with these children, and they still seem to remember all the concepts and the ideas that we try to get across to them. One of the most important parts of our program is the follow-up to the activities that we do in the classroom. We have the children for two visits, and a very important part of the program is the follow-up. The teachers are asked to do follow-up activities with the children. This morning we have a tape of one of the follow-up activities that was done by a class from PS123. They created a song in reference to traffic safety, and I'd like you to take a quick second to listen to the song that was created by Ms. Barnard's class at PS123. Okay, let's hear it. We skip on our way to school, he said. We never like to be late. Whenever we reach our plastic flat, we know the signal to wait. The free light is over, the lamp is stop, the yellow light in between. We look to the left and look to the right, look left and cross at the green. Yeah, Children got their own rhythm, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Ronald uh, and then Andrew, uh, any closing words, uh, please, for the adults uh, as well who need direction as well as the children. I'd like to send a quick thank you to PS200, Ms. Smith's class, who also contributed a follow-up activity, and also to Ms. Harwell's class, who invented a safety wrap, which unfortunately time does not allow us to listen to today. Well, but they both back. participated very much in the follow-up activity. Okay, we'll come back. I think that's very important. Andrew? Sure. Um, if there are any uh, people who are listening who would like more information about Safety City or about safety education activities in general, both Ron and I are members of the safety education unit of the Department of Transportation. Uh, you can get more information. We have a, a wealth of services available for free. Um, and you can tap into that by calling 212-566-1890. Uh, that, repeat that again, Andrew? Sure. 212-566-1890. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll be happy to help you. Or you can write to us. Uh, it's New York City Department of Transportation, Safety Education, 51 Chambers Street, Room 1404, New York, New York, 1007. Okay, repeat the address one more time. Sure. So we get that. 51 Chambers Street, Room 1404, New York, New York, 10007. Okay. Uh, Ronald Whitaker, thank you. Andrew Chuck. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name. That's correct. Thank you. And to the young brothers and sisters, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, after this break, we'll be back with Numbers and You, and I have my very special guest, Brother Stephen Omar. <laughs> Thank you very much. And it's incredible that it was 26 years ago today uh, that he was assassinated in the afternoon at the Audubon Ballroom in the village of Harlem. Okay. You know, they always like to ask, where were you when uh, President Kennedy was assassinated? For the brothers and sisters, where were you when Malcolm X was assassinated? I knew exactly where I was, exactly what was happening. And it's, it's very interesting. But anyway, I'd like to introduce my very special guest. His name is Brother Stephen Omar. And he's opened up an art gallery. The man is a, a psychic. He is a handwriting analysis. In fact, uh, we're going to analyze two handwriting uh, signatures that were given to us this morning. But uh, before we even get into that, 
Uh, good morning to you, Stephen Omar Hall. Good morning, Lloyd, and it's good to be back. I haven't seen you in a while. You opened the gallery. I mean, finally, you, you're kind of like a renaissance man, huh? Where's well, the gallery? Actually, we finally got it together, Lloyd. Uh, it